Harper Audio presents The Registry by Shannon Stoker Performed by Kate Rinders Pretty, beautiful, stunning Words she'd heard all her life echoed in Mia's mind as she stared into the mirror, brushing her long, pale hair. Turning her head this way and that, she admired the sheen the overhead light cast and smiled, trying to see herself as a potential husband might. Since she'd been old enough to understand her duty and her role, Mia had known she would marry a very wealthy man. Because if her parents were correct, upon her 18th birthday, the day all American girls had the great honor of entering the registry, she would be marked at a price that only the richest man could afford. Her father often bragged, to anyone who'd listen, that his Mia would be given the highest value in the entire history of the registry. From her mother's contented smile, for she was a very beautiful woman herself, Mia knew it would be a happy life. She would have her own household and wear the most elegant dresses. She twirled and danced in front of the many mirrors placed throughout her room, imagining rich folds of fabric swirling around her. Thunder rumbled in the distance just as the front door banged open downstairs. Her parents. She raced to the hall and stood at the top of the stairs, giddy at the prospect of hearing all about their night. She couldn't wait until she too could attend parties and weddings. Soon. Mia pulled up short. It wasn't her father standing at the bottom of the stairs. It was her sister, soaking wet from the rain. Confusion and delight rushed in. Mia hadn't seen Karina in almost a year, not since her wedding. Karina! Mia rushed toward her sister. What are you doing here? Where's William? It's only two months until I enter the registry. Father is certain I'll get picked up in the first month, and then I can be an old married woman like... Karina? Mia's babbling cut off as she noticed the blood and bruises on her sister's once lovely face. Karina's hair was greasy and stuck to her head. She looked skinnier than Mia had ever seen her. Karina, are you okay? Where are mother and father? They're out, a wedding. What's wrong? Karina, always funny and clever, always the first one with something to say, looked like words had deserted her. Karina, what's going on? I escaped, she whispered. Escaped where? Did William rescue you? Did hooligans get you? Mia had heard stories of women being kidnapped and attacked by unmarried men. Karina knew better than to go anywhere alone, though. No. Karina lifted her head. I escaped William. The stunned look on Mia's face must have said enough. It's not like what they tell you. I needed to warn you, to show you something. Karina pushed Mia aside and started up the stairs. Mia caught a glimpse of her eyes. They were glassed over and emotionless. Her sister was broken, a shell of her former self. Did you do something? Were you a bad wife? Mia asked, still confused. William did this to me, after my son was born. He said I was a bad investment. The muffled sounds of her parents walking toward the door stopped Mia from asking any more questions. Husbands didn't hurt their wives. Husbands protected their wives. The door opened to show a surprise David and Laura Morrissey. Mia, go to your room, her father ordered when he saw Karina, his eyes darkening. Mia always listened to him, but she wanted to hear more from Karina. She thought her parents must be furious at the condition Karina was in. Now, Mia. She turned and ran upstairs, but hid by the top of the steps. She needed to listen but her sister didn't make a sound. I'll call William, Mia's mother said. Please, Karina sounded so weak. I can't go back there. He hurts me. Well, give him a daughter and then he won't anymore, 
Laura intoned. Mia could hear her mother walking down the hall. You shouldn't have come here. You have your own family now. You need to be an adult, David told his daughter. There are no returns on a marriage. What family? He made me throw away my child and he beats me. Mia had never heard her sister speak to their father with such animosity. The creak of the stairs resumed. Karina was continuing the climb. What you need is to be with your husband. Mia heard her mother walking back to them. He thought she'd come this way and was already driving here. Apparently, she stole his car this morning. Lucky for her, he didn't involve the authorities. He'll be here any minute. This comment brought a cry of anguish from Karina. I won't go. I won't go back with him. It is your duty, David responded. Mia couldn't believe her father was acting so cruelly. She'd always thought he and Karina were close. A knock at the door made Mia jump. She leaned around the corner and watched her sister's husband walk in. We are so sorry about this, her parents said. It's not your fault. It's what I get for teaching her how to drive. I thought it would be fun. Never knew it would come back to bite me. Come on, darling, let's go home. Karina turned and tried to run up the stairs. Mia peered out. She wanted to help her sister, but she froze. William ran up after her and grabbed Karina's ankle, and she fell. The two sisters were face to face, just for a moment. Karina reached out and grabbed Mia's hand. My closet. Look. I thought it was a joke, but it's all true, Karina whispered to Mia. Mia held on to her sister's hand for as long as she could, but Karina didn't put up a fight as William dragged her, stumbling down the stairs and out the front door. Chapter One The greatest accomplishment a female can achieve is becoming a wife. Through marriage, she will serve her country and ensure her own happiness. The Registry Guide for Girls the appraiser never smiled. Mia wanted to ask him why he was so angry, but she knew better than to speak. Arms out? Mia lifted her arms to the sides while the appraiser ran his tape measure across her shoulders. She closed her eyes in an empty attempt to hide her disgust. She had been preparing for this day her whole life. Her mother had spent countless hours telling her how to behave and what to expect but it didn't make the process any easier. She tried hard to stare straight ahead and not look down on his shiny bald head as he continued with her measurements. He was in his late fifties, just older than her father. Turn around, he said without looking up. Mia was quick to comply. Now that he couldn't see her face, she let herself rest for a moment. The feeling of his tape measure on the back of her legs was humiliating. The skin-tight black bodysuit didn't make her feel any more secure. Her mother had told her it was the mandatory outfit, but that didn't help her relax. It was only a slight step above being naked. Keep your chin up, arms down, heels together, back straight. She closed her eyes as she pulled in her extremities. Her body was still shaking. He probably assumed it was from nerves. She should have been nervous and excited. Most girls were, but not Mia. Not anymore. That's good for now. Sit. The appraiser walked over to his black carpet bag and dropped the tape measure inside. She watched him rifle through his bag. No doubt he was getting ready for the next part of her evaluation. Mia's mind wandered to Karina. Mia was the youngest of the four Morrissey daughters. Each of her elder sisters had gone to finishing school, but Mia's parents thought she was pretty enough that it would have been a waste of money. She remembered the excitement she'd felt when her sisters were home for breaks. Then she remembered the admiration she'd felt for them on their wedding days, the last days she saw any of them, except for Karina. Her sister's nighttime visit had started crumbling Mia's world. The appraiser produced a digital camera 
snapping Mia back to reality. Over there, he pointed toward the closed door. A gray backdrop already covered the wood. Mia darted toward the door. She briefly considered opening it and running away from this mess, but instead turned to face the little man. Her body shuddered as he ran his hands through her hair, slicking back any loose strands that had fallen from her bun. Next, he pulled out a napkin and spat on it. He ran the cloth over her cheek. Mia tried her best to show no emotion, but the spot on her face felt like fire. He examined the napkin and seemed pleased. Arms at your sides, chin up, look straight into the lens. A bright flash went off. Mia used the excuse to let her eyes water. Now turn to the right, then the left. The appraiser walked toward her and grabbed her hands. He took pictures of each of them individually, then together. Next it was her feet. More flashes. With each snap, the camera stole more of her dignity. Turn around. Mia focused on her breathing as he took more photos. She wanted to wipe her cheek, but didn't dare do anything without being told. That's good for now. Sit. He went back to his bag. Mia waited for what would come next, wishing this terrible day would end. Still, as awful and mortifying as this was, why had she always thought it would be otherwise? It paled next to that horrible night a couple months ago. After Karina's visit, Mia had convinced herself her sister must have done something to deserve William's punishment. Or, if not, that Karina was just unlucky, and Mia would get a more understanding husband. That rationalization soon faded away. Not even a week later, a postcard came in the mail. It was from William, offering his condolences on Karina's passing. Her parents thought it was kind of him to let them know she had died. Mia didn't see either of them cry. She was the only one who mourned her sister. Supposedly, Karina had gotten sick from traveling in the rain. Mia knew, and was the only one who cared, that William had murdered her sister. After that news, Mia stopped taking so much pleasure in staring in the mirror. She saw Karina's emaciated face looking back at her. Karina's death hadn't just curbed Mia's vanity. She had followed up on her sister's last words and searched Karina's old closet. It didn't take long to find the loose floorboard. Mia had gone numb after her discovery. But now these images of her past were pushed away by her present. The appraiser took a seat on the chair across from her. He had a clipboard and a pen. The interview portion. Mia breathed deeply in anticipation of the first question. I am sure that your mother trained you in how to act and what to say, he said. But trust me when I tell you to forget all that. Honesty will get you a significantly higher listing. Mia knew he wouldn't like her honest responses. She felt a rush of hatred toward the man and his suggestions, and could sense the rage shining in her face before quickly bottling it up again. Fortunately, the appraiser seemed too busy adjusting his tape recorder to pay attention. This is the interview of Amelia Morrissey of the Midwest area, he said. The words Midwest area rang through Mia's mind. She wondered if the other fractions of the country lived the same way she did, if their girls were prepared for their appraisals the same way. After she was married, Karina had lived in the Northwest area. Mia's eyes stung with tears as she imagined her sister's body buried in a strange place. Amelia Morrissey, can you cook? Yes, Mia quickly responded. My specialties are... That won't be necessary. The appraiser gave Mia a disapproving look. Only answer what you've been asked. The momentary thrill she had felt at discussing her culinary skills vanished. Mia reminded herself she would find no relief this afternoon. Can you clean? Yes. Can you sing? Not well. Can you sew? Yes. Can you draw? Yes. 
Care for a baby? No, I mean, yes. Mia wasn't sure how to answer that one. The appraiser didn't seem interested in her struggle. Can you drive? No. Can you perform any maintenance on a vehicle? No. Can you read? Yes. Can you write? Yes. The appraiser stopped the recording and scribbled his last notes. That meant only one step of her evaluation was left. A lump grew in her throat. You have one hour to answer as many questions as you can. He threw a packet in front of Mia. You may start whenever you wish. The appraiser glanced at his watch before walking back over to his bag. He rifled through it again. Mia tried to focus on the test. She ripped open the packet and pulled out the booklet. She flipped to the first question. One. What is 80% of $20? Math? Mia had never studied math, so she had no clue how to answer this. She thought about how she had teased Karina for going to finishing school. She had never even asked her what they learned there. She wondered if it was math. She flipped to the last question. 50. What element does the symbol O represent? She looked up at the appraiser. He was going through the photos and didn't seem interested in her test at all. Her mother always told her excess knowledge was unnecessary for a female. The test might as well have been in another language. Not wanting to admit defeat, Mia put her pencil to the paper and tried to work the first problem. The appraiser still paid her no attention. She rubbed her face where his spit had been and fantasized about using the pencil to stab him through his cheek. When he called time on the test, Mia wasn't finished with problem 10. But he didn't seem interested in her progress, dropping the packet in his bag without checking. Apparently, that was it. Her appraisal was over. She focused on the man's small carpet bag. Everything in there would determine her worth as a person. It would bring her one step closer to Karina's fate. Mia let her mind wander back to her discovery. Under her sister's floorboards had been a piece of glossy paper showing a mix of pictures and words. In small print at the top of the page were the words, Unique Girl, UK Edition, Volume 47, Fall Issue. The photograph was of a man in a tuxedo, with a woman lying at his feet in a big white dress. In big print below it read, Modern Day Slavery, American Brides. Mia felt a sharp prick on her arm. She swatted at it. Quick blood sample. The appraiser grabbed her hand. We have to make sure you are disease-free and compatible with your husband. Now we are finished. The appraiser picked up his satchel and walked toward the door, letting himself out of the house. Now that she was alone, she let the tears stream down her cheeks. Sweetie, Mia's mother stuck her head in the room. I heard the door close. Is the appraiser gone? Yes, Mia said. Mia's mother walked over and hugged her. She was a beautiful woman, with the same long, dirty blonde hair as Mia. Don't cry. I'm sure you did great. Looks matter the most anyway. That's not it. Mia pulled away and wiped her eyes. I don't think I want a husband. It's okay that you're nervous, but this is a happy day. I was thrilled during my appraisal, and your sisters were too, even Karina. Now it's over, and you just have to wait a little longer. Her mother seemed sincere. All marriages have their ups and downs, and it is our duty to please our husbands. Did you even care about her? Mia asked, persisting. Of course I did, but it's part of life. She needed to be independent of us and start her own family, just like you will soon. Any struggle or hardship you go through will be worth it once you have a baby girl. Mia knew she was lying. She didn't care about Karina. And in a short time, she wouldn't care about Mia either. I don't want to get married, Mia repeated. Without hesitation, 
Her mother raised her hand and slapped her. Mia put her hand to her throbbing cheek. Immediately, her mother pulled her back into a tight hug. I am tired of this. Marriage is your most patriotic duty. There will be no more of this conversation. She rocked back and forth. And don't let your father hear talk like that. You are a woman now. Be happy. You'll be the head of your own household soon. Mia nodded, but she did not agree. She knew this was not the life for her and wondered why nobody else saw that. Focusing on her swollen face, Mia made a promise to herself. She would not be a part of this vicious cycle. She knew what Karina was trying to tell her. She was going to escape. Chapter 2 Girls must hone their skills, such as cleaning, cooking, and sewing. These are traits that every man will find admirable and help ensure placement into a strong marriage. The Registry Guide for Girls I knew you were going to appraise high. I just didn't think that high, Whitney said. I hate polishing day, Mia said as she scrubbed her father's trophies and awards with a toothbrush, ignoring her friend. I mean, five hundred thousand dollars? I'm only valued at five thousand. You are literally worth one hundred of me. Whitney shook her head as she reached for another 4-H plaque to shine. I'm priced so low no man will ever bother to look at my page. You're going to end up married to some rich man, and I'm going to end up a government servant. Truthfully, Mia was surprised she had appraised that high, particularly after having bombed the test portion. She wanted to drop the subject. Whitney went on. Your father must be thrilled. He'll make $375,000 from your wedding, and the government will be pleased with their cut, $125,000. How do you figure out the percentages so fast? Or at all? Mia was impressed. Whitney shrugged. Now she wanted to drop the subject. It was strange how much the girls stood in contrast with one another. Mia was blonde and lanky, with a dimpled smile and delicate features. Whitney, on the other hand, was dark and sturdy, with a gruff persona. But Whitney was the only other girl on the property, so they were friends. Neither had gone to finishing school, and they had both studied under Mia's mother. Yet Whitney always seemed to have excess knowledge. Mia was growing tired of Whitney's obsession with her appraisal amount. She didn't feel glamorous or special just because of some piece of paper. The whole thing made her nauseous. She decided that now was a good time to change the subject. You used to live farther north, right? Yeah, but still in the Midwest area. We left when I was six, after my mother died. Whitney continued polishing. I don't remember much. Mia felt a pang of guilt. She knew Whitney hated bringing up her mother. It was not Mia's intention to upset her friend. She did have a reason for her questions. Did your father ever take you into Canada? Mia tried to ask in a casual manner. Why? Whitney stopped polishing. No reason, I was just curious about a foreign husband. Mia lied. I heard there is a chance a non-American can get access to the registry. I wonder what it's like in Canada. Mia hadn't known other countries were so close to America until last month. She'd thought of them as on the other side of the world, where the soldiers went nobly to battle. Every day Mia felt her belief in the American way slipping. Finally, she had asked Whitney about other countries and found out about their two bordering neighbors, Mexico and Canada. It was then that the idea to leave had taken hold. Mia started polishing faster, but Whitney didn't appear to buy her explanation. Mia should have known Whitney would figure her out. She was too smart and too observant to fool. Are you thinking about running? Whitney nearly shouted. Mia leaped to put her hand over Whitney's lips. No, of course not. Good. That would be stupid. 
you'd get yourself killed or worse. I was just curious about Canadian husbands. Women aren't allowed to travel alone. You'd get picked up right away and who knows what the hooligan who found you would do. Maybe you'd be lucky enough for a rag agent to recover you. But then your father would kill you. The government would reappraise you and mark you as a runaway, and no husband would want you. It would be me and you as government servants right off the bat, working in some factory or cleaning up buildings. Maybe even the government wouldn't want you. I'm not running to Canada. Just drop it, Mia shook her head. She thought of Karina. Her husband had done more damage to her than any hooligan would. And rag agents didn't scare Mia not since she'd seen Karina's article. Young women are trained to think their captors are protectors, and the pseudonym for the government agency that hunts them, Recovery of Abducted Girls, tricks the people into thinking agents are heroes when they are nothing but registry gophers. I wouldn't try Canada either. Whitney started polishing again. They deport all girls right back home. How do you know that? My father's not as strict as yours. He didn't have to worry about wasting an investment, so he taught me some practical things, Whitney said. Sometimes I think he wants me to run. Mia looked away. Whitney was always so negative about herself. After her mother died, her father had moved them here. He clearly had no plans to make any money off of her. Mia thought he was the reason for Whitney's intelligence. She was pretty, but had never really learned how to present herself. She would have been a prime candidate for finishing school, but her father wouldn't hear of it. Still, Mia was surprised Whitney had appraised so low. It didn't seem right. Mia's thoughts returned to her escape, and she felt her world crushing down on her. Canada seemed like the safest option. There was no registry up there. She could feel tears welling up in her eyes. Now, Mexico, that's a possibility, Whitney said, not looking up from her work. Of course, the trip is longer and more dangerous. Mia whipped her head back. How long? I don't know. I might have more knowledge about the world than you, but I'm not exactly worldly. Mia took a long, deep breath and tried to think about how she could make it to Mexico. She knew she needed help. Come with me. Sure, but your mother will be mad if we don't finish in here first, Whitney said. Your father's won too many farming awards. I didn't even know they had this many. No. Mia reached out and grabbed Whitney's arm. Come with me to Mexico. Whitney burst out laughing, but started to slow down when she realized Mia was not joining her. The two girls stared at each other in awkward silence till Mia spoke. I can't live this life. I don't want to marry a stranger. I've seen it with my sisters. The last time I saw or heard from any of them was the day they got married. Mia's parents had sworn her to secrecy. It killed her that she couldn't share Karina's fate with Whitney. But Mia wasn't sure she could even convey the poor shape Karina had been in let alone show Whitney the anti-American words hidden in her room. Well, when they got married, they became the property of their husbands, and it's not like you were close with your sisters before they wed. What about you and me? We're close. I don't want to lose you. Maybe you'll get a nicer husband who will let you keep in contact. I'm not anyone's property, Mia said. You realize that my getting married means we will never see each other again either. You're my best friend. Please, I need to get away from this, and I need your help to do it. No, no way. We've always known we would part once you got married. I don't think there's anything wrong with your world. We'll disguise ourselves as boys. Nobody will notice, Mia said. And if we get caught, it's not like anything will have changed for you. I've heard you say a thousand times you think you're destined for a life as government property. What if there is some sweet boy down in Mexico waiting to meet you? If you leave with me, you can have the life you want. Mia knew this was a good argument. But Whitney's pensive expression went flat. And then she shook her head. You know what the registry guide says. The success rate of rag agents? 
It's over 99%. I think that's why most girls aren't stupid enough to run away. The success rate is so high because nobody tries, Mia said. Girls are programmed so young that none of them attempt to escape. They think they are living the only life possible. She had more faith in that one piece of paper from Unique Girl than the whole registry guide. Please, I can't do this alone. I'm not clever or smart enough. I need you. Waves of emotion crossed Whitney's face. Mia reached out and grabbed her hand. What's gotten into you? Whitney asked. A few months ago, you would have been bragging nonstop about your price tag. And now you want to run from a dream life? Mia just stared at Whitney, refusing to answer. The dream no longer existed. After several minutes of silence, Whitney let out a sigh and nodded her head. Mia leaned over and hugged her friend. I'm not doing this for you. I think you're crazy and making a mistake. But I've been in the registry for over six months now. In six more months, I'll be married to the government. I haven't had a single prospect. And I want to get married. If we are going to do this, we need a plan. We need to do this right. Whitney sounded stern. When would we leave? All I know is what you know, Mia said. We need to plan. We need a map and a method of transportation. We need to start storing food, figure out the distance, and get ready to pose as men. Whitney was taking charge. Use every chance you can to learn about travel and Mexico. The more information we have, the better we can do. That means trying to get access to a computer, or at least a newspaper or a book. But that will draw my parents' attention, and I've never touched the computer in my life, Mia said. I know you're scared of your parents, but they will spit fire when you cost them half a million dollars. So suck it up and ask for a book or computer privileges. Mia had never had any interest in computers. She thought they held too much information and were only necessary for men. But since Karina's visit, she had tried desperately to get hold of one. Unfortunately, her father kept his in a locked desk drawer in his locked office. She didn't want to disappoint Whitney, so she nodded her head, promising herself she would find a way. Mia started to dream about a free life. She tuned Whitney out as she continued to babble more instructions. Mia could feel her plan growing. Now, there were two. Chapter 3 There is nothing wrong with a girl admiring her own beauty. It is a pleasant and acceptable way to pass the time. Focusing on positive attributes increases her ability to highlight them. The Registry Guide for Girls Can I please see my page? Mia's father, David, looked up from his papers and over at his daughter. It was rare for her to come into his office uninvited. Now? It's the middle of the day. I still have to get some orders out. It's been up for over a week now, and I haven't seen it yet, Mia said. The plump old man gave his daughter a disapproving look. His gray hair went in all directions. He ran his hand over his wiry mustache before continuing. All right, you win. He began typing at his screen while Mia rushed behind him, hoping to learn something about the computer. She glanced at the keyboard and was surprised the letters weren't placed alphabetically. She was trying to study their order when her father drew her attention to the screen. Mia was shocked by what he pulled up. Her picture took up most of the page. It was from the day of her appraisal. No makeup, hair slicked back tight, and that black bodysuit. No smile or emotion displayed on her face at all. She thought she'd never looked worse. What's wrong? he asked. Mia made a disgusted face. Truthfully, she was relieved at how unattractive she looked, thinking it would deter a husband. That is a hideous picture of me. Who in their right mind would want that as a wife? Her father chuckled and clicked a button. Other pictures of Mia popped up. These displayed her made up like a doll or wearing next to nothing. 
She found these even more disturbing, especially because she had taken those months ago, long before Karina's visit. Mia was repulsed by her former self. All the girls in the registry have the same picture, said her father. That's because men started complaining about parents using false photos. This way, the men can see their natural beauty. Your natural beauty. Can I see someone else's profile? Mia just wanted to watch how her father operated the machine. Sorry, all I have access to is your page. It is expensive to use the registry. That way, only men who are serious about finding a wife can log in. Mia tried to focus on the computer, to see if there was any way she could use it. But she knew it was a lost cause. It was unlikely she could even figure out how to turn it on. She shook her head and walked toward the door. Don't you want to know if anyone has offered for you? Her father raised his eyebrows. Hear about any of your possibilities. Mia paused and turned back toward him. I figure you will let me know what I need to about who and when. Well, I was going to wait for your mother to tell you, but I am meeting with a prospective husband this week. He smiled ear to ear. Mia knew he expected her to jump for joy at this bit of information, but all she cared about was the timing of this potential match. Isn't that too soon? Don't worry about that. It's for me to take care of. I'm sure you are ready and will charm this gentleman and land yourself a nice life and comfort for your mother and me. Yes, comfort indeed, Mia nearly snorted. With four attractive daughters, her parents were already wealthier than most. Growing up, she had always thought her parents loved her, and she had loved them in return, wanting nothing more than to make them proud. And the best way to do that was to land an expensive price tag. After she saw them return her older sister, she knew it wasn't love that motivated them. It was greed. She forced a smile and excused herself. Mia walked into the kitchen and slid open the glass back door. She started to make her way toward Whitney's apartment, her head spinning. Breaking into a run, Mia turned a corner, picking up speed, and barreled straight into a wall, smacking her forehead and landing on her rear. Dazed, Mia watched the wall move, only to realize it was a person. Mia's heart jumped as she sat up. Andrew her father's head farmhand, towered over her. The long cords of his neck stood out as he clenched his jaw, and thick, wavy black hair fell in front of his piercing brown eyes. Mia's mouth hung open slightly. She had never been so close to one of the male workers before. She knew she was staring, but couldn't look away. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Her voice was meek. Andrew instinctively reached out to her to help her up, his eyes never leaving hers. Mia leaned forward and offered her hand, but he suddenly jerked back as if burned, as if he'd only then realized who she was, that she was a girl, as if he was scared. Of her? His attention quickly turned to the reason for his carelessness. Close to the barn, a group of five teenage farmhands were picking on a littler one. The victim looked just about 13. He was on the ground crying. Mia couldn't make out what the other boys were saying, but they were taunting him. She watched as Andrew made his way toward the group, shoving one of the bullies to the ground and punching another in the face. He hoisted the young boy up. His voice was loud and clear. This is not how we do things here, Andrew said. If you have problems with someone, come to me. If you think that it's play, that it's fun to beat up little kids, leave this farm today. If any of you ever lays a finger on him or anyone else, I will see to it myself that you lose that finger. Andrew put his arm around the kid's shoulders and walked him away. The mob disbanded. All the young men apparently took Andrew at his word. Mia was impressed. She was forbidden to associate with any of the farmhands, 
but she knew they were a rough group. She was fascinated by the way Andrew had stood up for the victim and the respect he commanded from his peers. She pulled herself up, continued toward Whitney, and hoped her friend had some good advice. Chapter 4 Your country comes first, you come second, for without your country, you would not be. The Boy's Guide to Service Are you sure you're all right? Andrew asked the new kid. I'll be fine, he wiped his eyes. You're fresh out of school? Probably released two months ago? This is your first job? Andrew didn't know why he asked these questions. He knew the answers were yes. Mr. Morrissey is a good employer. I traveled for about two years before I ended up here, and there are worse places to be. The young charge just nodded his head. Stay here till your service date, if you can. Stand up for yourself, though, or the other guys will feed on your weakness. Again, the new farmhand just nodded his head. Andrew signaled for him to take off, and he gladly ran toward the barn the young men called home. Andrew assumed he needed to check on his belongings and make sure none of his tormentors had touched them. Andrew knew they wouldn't, not after he'd told them to stay clear. His shoulder was sore, and he put his hand up to rub it, remembering his run-in with Mr. Morrissey's daughter. She was probably going to see the other girl, the manager's daughter. But why was she in such a rush? He usually tried to avoid both the girls at all costs. He knew the dangers of being seen with an unmarried girl, had heard stories about unserved boys who were stupid enough to get caught up in a pretty face someone they didn't deserve to have. He wasn't stupid, and he wasn't taking any chances. It was almost his time to serve, and once he was discharged, he would be ready for, and deserving of, female companionship. For now, the only love in his life was for his country. Andrew knew that his time in service would be hard. It was his initiation into manhood, he would face any enemy knowing he might not leave with his life, and it was up to him to survive whatever war he faced. But he was not scared. His country would prepare him, make him the best soldier, impossible to take down. He was lucky he lived in the greatest country in the world, and honored that it was his duty to serve. Still, he let his mind wander to his post-service life. Would he finally own property, have a roof over his head, a place where he could stay by himself? He thought about taking some time to relax, buying a little cabin in the woods or a cottage on a lake, and just living alone for a few years. He envisioned a small self-sustaining life with no reason to leave his home. He felt the corners of his lips turning up at the thought of the word home, a concept he wasn't familiar with. He forced the smile down and the idea out of his head. In his mind, he may have been free and able to smile, but others would see it as a weakness. He never knew who was watching, and it was necessary to maintain his hard demeanor, or else his position would be challenged with physical violence, something Andrew saw as an evil necessity to be avoided at all costs. Andrew sighed. Another reason he couldn't wait to have a home. He would finally be able to relax and not worry about maintaining his persona. He imagined that after several years of solitude, he would sign up with the registry and get himself a wife, and after a little longer, a family. Andrew felt his lips curl down at this word. Family was another foreign concept, one he wasn't so eager to learn about. The only family he knew of was the Morrisseys, and while they seemed happy for the most part, he wasn't sure they were the model he wanted to achieve. He tried his hardest to ignore the Morrissey daughters, but he still knew how beautiful they were. It was impossible not to notice. Their father was so proud of their beauty, always bragging about how rich they had made him. But Andrew didn't see that as a compliment. He hoped that when he had a daughter, he would know more about her than her physical appearance. 
He laughed a little at this thought. He would never have to worry about that predicament. There was no way he could ever afford a girl as beautiful as those sisters, and he took some comfort in that fact. His life would be simple, and he would be happy one day. His time for fantasizing was over. He needed to focus his energy on situations he could control, and right now his only concern was preparing for service. He headed toward the barn. It was time to start the second shift in the fields. Chapter 5 The threat of illness has decreased significantly since the introduction of the registry. Diseases that once plagued the country have been phased out. Approved marriages ensure healthy, stable, and long lives. The Registry Guide for Girls You are so lucky, Whitney sat down with a thud at her small kitchen table. Are you sure your father's not here? Mia asked. He's off getting the latest corn shipment ready. He said it's a big one and not to wait up. What are we going to do? Mia could feel her breathing deepen. Marry him. Go live a dream life and forget this idea. Mia shot Whitney a dirty look. Whitney smirked in response. Just drive him away. Be nasty. Be someone he won't want to marry. This had never occurred to Mia. But Whitney's solution was obvious. Mia felt a rush of gratitude that her friend had agreed to run away with her. It was becoming clear she wouldn't be able to do it on her own. Then we will both choose our husbands when we get out of the country, Whitney said, smiling at her idea. Mia scowled at the thought. She had no intention of ever getting married. Starting a romantic relationship was non-existent on her priorities list. Her concern was only their freedom. You have a red mark on your head. Were you trying to make yourself less attractive? The run-in with Andrew had already left Mia's mind. She reached up and touched the spot. I was scared. I ran out here from the house and bumped into Andrew. Which one is he? Farmhands were always coming and going. It was rare to learn one of their names. Andrew had been here too long for Whitney not to have noticed him. She stood up and walked over to the window. Her parents' large house loomed to the east. It was a beautiful, traditional farmhouse. Whitney and her father lived above the barn that had been converted into a garage. A second barn to the west had been converted into a dormitory. There the young farmhands slept and did as they pleased in their free time. Whitney had a perfect view. Do you ever watch them? Mia asked. No action was visible, but Mia was sure they were in there, laughing and enjoying their freedom. She wondered if Andrew was still consoling the small worker. No, Whitney said. They're too young for us. I want a real man. Sometimes I hear them. They're loud and obnoxious. They lack any sophistication. It wasn't fair that conversations between the sexes were forbidden unless the man paid the registry fee to court a wife. Mia thought she'd enjoy their company. She wanted to know why speaking to them was wrong. Why does the registry exist? Mia asked, still at the window. Before the introduction of the registry, disease was rampant and the population faced extinction. No, I have the guide memorized too. There must be a reason for the disease. Karina's article was just a page with only a few paragraphs. The rest of the story was cut off. Mia needed to know more. Whitney looked confused. I never thought you cared about this stuff before. I do now, Mia said. Whitney took a deep breath before answering. One night I was upset. I had no prospects. It became clear I probably wouldn't be getting married. My father tried to cheer me up. He told me that a long time ago, the government feared a rebellion. They wanted to make sure the people weren't smarter than them. It was important that smart people didn't breed with other smart people. The registry was created to keep people unintelligent. It's a population control. The government still doesn't want people getting too smart or having too many smart children, Whitney said. 
I am one of those people, according to my father. My offspring might overthrow them one day, so that's why they priced me so low, so no husband would desire me. I don't know if I believe it or not, but it helps me sleep at night. Mia thought of Whitney's impressive math skills and her cheap price tag. The explanation did make sense. Still, Mia wasn't entirely convinced either. But she did know that the system was wrong, regardless of the rationale. She sat down and took Whitney's hand. You'll still have those genius children, and maybe someday they will come back and overthrow the government. What's gotten into you? Whitney asked. Running away? Inquiring about history? Giving me a real pep talk? I know you. A few months ago, you would have been dancing with joy over getting married. People change. I guess I just opened my eyes, Mia said. I know that. Trust me, I'm not complaining about the change, Whitney said. But people don't just change that drastically for no reason. Something happened. Tell me. Mia couldn't bring herself to explain the situation to Whitney. She wasn't ready, and she wasn't sure Whitney was ready to hear it. But she did need to give some reason. I just don't want to end up in an unhappy marriage. I would rather be free and not risk it. What makes you think you would be unhappy? Your parents have a nice life. With no education and no professional options, American females are helpless and unaware of their plight. The words rang in Mia's mind. She had always thought her parents' marriage was ideal. Her mother was so happy to serve her father's every whim. But now, everything looked different. Her mother did everything her father asked. She had no personality of her own and no care for anyone but him, not even for her own offspring. I want to stay me for a while longer. Mia doubted Whitney bought her explanation, but Whitney knew her well enough not to pry. She smiled and squeezed Mia's hand. The two of them would make it away with ease. Chapter 6 When courting potential matches, no man wants a talkative lady. It is best for females to avoid speaking unless asked a question, and then they should respond only in short form. If the courting leads to marriage, then natural conversation will come easily to the newlyweds. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia looked straight at the mirror and was surprised by the person looking back at her. She had so much makeup on that her skin looked flawless. Her mother had attached fake lashes, which made it difficult to open her pale blue eyes, but accentuated them. Her hair was stick straight, teased a mile high and clipped in the back, not a single strand out of place. Mia reminded herself over and over to ignore how beautiful she felt and focus on the article's words. Girls grow up thinking beauty is the only thing that matters. They are dressed up and auctioned off to the highest bidder. Here's your dress. Her mother hung a long gown outside the closet. Mia's eyes lit up, and her mother smiled with delight. I've been working on it for months. It's the most important dress you'll ever wear. Mia's stomach churned. She scolded herself for getting excited about the dress, but she couldn't help herself. It was stunning. The dress was jet black, the skirt straight, with a slit so high it would hit Mia's waist, and a belt of black diamonds adorned the hips. From there the top was two strips, leaving Mia's navel exposed, but still covering her small bust. The strips were long enough to wrap around her neck and still hang some fabric down her otherwise fully exposed back. Well, what do you think? Her mother asked, wide-eyed and smiling. Mia didn't want to get so dolled up for anyone, let alone for a man she'd never met before. But she felt herself smile. Speechless, just like I thought, her mother said pulling the dress off the hanger and handing it to her daughter. Mia felt elegant slipping into the garment. 
Perfect. You look just perfect, her mother said, and turned Mia around to the mirror. What man could say no to you? Mia's mind went to the article she'd found. The picture showed a woman in a white dress, but Mia's was black. She started to think the article was a lie. There was no way such a beautiful gown could be the basis for something so evil. She snapped her mind back to reality and scowled. The words were more important than the picture, and she had proof it wasn't a lie. Karina had lost her life to make sure Mia knew that. I know you're nervous, but he is going to love you, her mother sat on the bed and smiled at Mia. She was obviously mistaking her daughter's unhappiness for anxiety. He is quite a catch, too. You couldn't ask for a better husband. After this meet and greet, there was no way Mr. Grant Marsden, whoever he was, would be interested in marrying Mia. He made it clear he will pay your full price if he decides to marry you. She pulled a pair of six-inch black diamond-encrusted heels out for Mia to wear. You are lucky. Almost nobody gets their full appraisal amount. You'll go for more than all your sisters combined. Mia hated it when her mother brought up her sisters. She knew her mother cared little for them and didn't think she had the right to call herself a parent. Karina had been so hurt over giving up her child. Mia wondered if her mother related at all. Did you ever have a boy? Mia asked. Her mother looked shocked and uneasy at the question. Mia didn't want to draw more unwanted attention from her. I mean, what if this man is actually my brother? No, I was lucky. All beautiful girls, especially you. Laura walked around Mia. Besides, you know that's why they do the blood test. If there was a relative out there, he wouldn't even get access to your page. Mia believed her mother. But even if she did have a son, it was doubtful she had cared about him. Particularly after the way she reacted to Karina's death. You look so beautiful. But remember the rules. Sit up straight, and if he tries to touch you, scream. There is no touching of any kind prior to the wedding. Don't even let him hold your hand. It is going to be hard for him with you looking like this. You don't have to worry, Mia shuddered. Good girl. You'll have a nice time tonight, her mother promised. We set up the dining room for a romantic meal for two. Your father even got one of the boys to serve as a waiter. It will be so elegant. Who knows? By the end of the night, you might be engaged. Just then, the doorbell rang through the house. Her mother squealed with delight, while Mia continued to stare at the strange girl in the mirror. Mia pressed herself against the wall, scared to look down at the bottom of the staircase. Her parents were greeting Mr. Marsden, and she could hear them laughing as if they were old friends. Mia was supposed to wait for them to call her, and then make a glamorous entrance down the staircase. She decided to take a quick peek and see what she was up against. Grant Marsden was an attractive man. His brown hair hung over his brow. He had prominent cheekbones and a boyish face. Mia guessed he was about a decade older than she. Mia heard her father call her name, but couldn't make herself move. She didn't know whether her paralysis stemmed from actual fear or she was simply starting to sabotage the night already. Taking a breath, she started the descent. Her leg stuck out of the high slit and her heel accentuated the length of her leg. The sound of her shoes hitting the stairs amused her. She held in her laughter, thinking the whole night was a joke. All of a sudden, she knew what to do. A devilish smile crossed Mia's face. She realized this meeting might be fun. Breaking the rules and crushing this man's interest would be simple. Sorry, just finishing up. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, Mia walked straight to her proposed mate. I'm Mia. It's nice to meet you. I hear your name is Grant.
After several moments of dirty looks from her parents, Mia and Grant were set up in the dining room. Her mother had set out the fine china and dimmed the lights for a more intimate atmosphere. Grant pulled out Mia's chair as she sat down. He gave an awkward smile and a shallow laugh. Mia wondered if he felt as strange as she did. Before one of them could break the silence, Andrew entered the room. Mia had never seen him look so nice, sophisticated even. His dark hair was slicked back away from his eyes, and he was dressed in all black. Mia found herself staring at him, while he did not attempt to make eye contact with her. Grant coughed. So, tell me about yourself, Mia said before Grant had the opportunity to speak. Grant looked down and shook his head. He looked up with a pressed smile. It is inappropriate for you to ask me questions. His voice was filled with annoyance. It is inappropriate for you to speak at all without my addressing you first. But I suppose you already know that. Just like you know you're not supposed to use my first name unless I give you permission. Well, maybe I'm not a fan of the rules. Mia raised an eyebrow. I'd like some wine, please, and once I get it, I would like you to leave the room, Grant said to Andrew. We deserve our privacy. Andrew nodded with a blank look and left. I am a fan of the rules, Grant stared down at Mia. So, why don't you tell me about yourself? I just turned 18. I hate dressing up. I especially hate this dress. I am a terrible cook, and I find housework boring. Mia set her elbow on the table and cradled her head in her hand. Well, happy belated birthday. Grant didn't seem thrown by Mia's antics, so she decided to keep going. I also think you are too old for me. Grant sat in silence for a moment, looking into Mia's eyes, debating what to say next. You're fun. A spoiled brat, but a fun one. Mia went on, desperate to make sure this engagement didn't happen and to end this night as soon as possible. I don't think you are good looking enough for me either. I am much prettier than you are. Well now, let me answer your question. Grant rose from his chair and walked toward Mia. With each word he spoke, his voice grew louder. I was raised in an orphanage and worked odd jobs till service, not unlike that waiter you've been staring at, I'm guessing. I made a name for myself during my tenure in the Marines, and after I got out, I developed some important machinery for the men. I made a hefty profit from my inventions, and now I'd like to find a wife. I built a life on my own. I am a friend of this country, and I've earned respect. Mia looked down, hoping he wouldn't get any closer. But he reached toward her and grabbed her chin in his hand, tilting her head upward. She wanted to call out for her mother. He was touching her, and that was against the rules. She had a feeling this wasn't the type of touch her mother had warned her against. Mia's voice caught in her throat. She seemed unable to make a sound. His eyes glittered coldly. As for your rude comments, we both know they are lies. I am aware of my features, and I am also aware I am much younger than the average groom. I am sure you are sensitive to these facts, too. I am driven smart, resourceful, and a bit of a perfectionist. But notice nowhere in there did I say I am nice. So I recommend you watch your mouth. With that word, the door swung open, and Andrew entered with the wine. Grant dropped his hand from Mia's face and returned to his chair. Mia glanced up at Andrew. For a moment, he looked angry, like he was readying to pounce on Grant. But then his gaze shifted, and the blank expression returned. He set down the bottle and walked out of the room. Mia rubbed her jaw where Grant's hand had been. Now then, let's start over, shall we? Grant poured himself a glass while Mia nodded her head. My name is Mr. Marsden, but you may call me Grant if you like.
Chapter 7 Respect and honor your elders who have served their time. They are great men who fought bravely. Someday you will be in their position. The Boy's Guide to Service Andrew struggled against a wave of anger that took him completely by surprise. He focused on his breathing to calm himself down, and told himself his fury was because the man was using unfair force against someone smaller and defenseless. It had nothing to do with this girl in particular, or the fact that he'd seen her spark fade when Mr. Marsden grabbed her. For a moment, he considered telling Mr. Morrissey, but he doubted his employer would do anything. Andrew had to remind himself he owed Mr. Marsden a large amount of respect. He had served his time in the military, while Andrew was still unserved. But Mia looked so scared, like pure terror was pulsing through her veins. He told himself that she was obviously breaking the rules when she told the man about her flaws and spoke first. He had never known she was so rebellious. Actually, he didn't know anything about her. He breathed deeply again, forcing himself to calm down. He couldn't help her and she didn't need his help. This was what girls went through. All he could do was remember when it was his turn to find a mate to treat her fairly. He smiled at the thought of how beautiful she looked, almost statuesque. But something seemed off about her. He thought she had looked better when he ran into her the other day, more natural. He ran his hands through his mop of hair. He was sure his outfit made him look just as awkward as Mia. The two of them would make quite the pair tonight. His smile dropped. They would never be a pair, and he'd never want that anyway. Andrew felt his rage slip away and congratulated himself on keeping his cool in the dining room. He remembered his place in the world, and he always did a good job of maintaining his common sense. Still. He couldn't wait to enter service, and then he would prove himself worthy to stand up to men like Mr. Marsden and talk with force to someone like Mr. Morrissey. Of course, he hoped his after-service position wouldn't entail waiting tables. He imagined all the possibilities that awaited him. Maybe he could be a professional pilot, if he made Air Force, of course, or take what he learned from Mr. Morrissey and start his own farm. He already knew how to operate the equipment. There was always the idea of going into business, too. Maybe Andrew would surprise himself on the placement exams and end up being a whiz in financial activities. The possibilities were endless. Again, he scolded himself for fantasizing. His future didn't belong to him yet. He needed to spend more time thinking about serving his great country and less time worrying about himself. Besides, right now, all he should worry about was Mr. Marsden's next course. He wouldn't let any negative treatment of Mia affect him. She was not, and would never be, his concern. Chapter 8 The marriage ceremony is the joining of two individuals as one, and it is a time to be celebrated. While the groom chooses the style of the ceremony, it is always the bride who is the center of attention. The Registry Guide for Girls The heavy smell of ammonia nauseated Mia as she dipped her mop into the bucket. This morning, she and Whitney had been charged with washing the floors of the entire house. It made Mia wish they had carpeting. Starting in the basement and working their way upstairs, the two girls would require several hours to finish the job. He sounds like a jerk, Whitney said, but at least you'll never have to see him again. After the incident, I spent the rest of dinner just giving him two-word answers. I don't think he left happy. My mother must have decided to make today floor washing day to punish me. I still think you're crazy for this idea. Mia was sick of this argument. Why do you want to get married so badly? Because I want children. I think I'll be a good mother. And what if you marry someone and only produce sons? Would you be able to toss them out? Whitney looked down and ignored Mia's questions. She had a feeling Whitney was starting to get on board with the escape plan for her own reasons. 
Have you thought any more about our plans? Mia asked. I have some ideas. I think we need to run quickly. If we take a straight shot south, we'll go into Mexico. So let's just do that. Sounds simple enough. I also think we need to steal one of your father's cars. That way we can get a bigger head start. Are you crazy? He'll kill us. Um, rethink that statement. For starters, he can't kill us if he never sees us again. Next, he is already going to kill us for trying to run. It didn't take long for Mia to process this argument. You're right. Can you drive? I can figure it out. I have some time to teach myself. Amelia? The bellow came from upstairs. Her father barreled down the steps and grabbed Mia's hand, yanking her up to her feet and starting to drag her up the steps. Mia looked back at Whitney, who was confused, but Mia was not alarmed. She was certain it was her father's turn to punish her for driving Grant away. But, to her dismay, when she exited the basement, there stood none other than her displaced suitor. Grant stood cool and confident, wearing a deep blue suit. He looked as formal as he had last night. Whereas Mia was wearing sweatpants and an old t-shirt, her hair tucked in a messy bun. Forgive my daughter's appearance. We weren't expecting guests. A woman should always look her best. You never know who is going to pop in. Grant responded with a suave smile. I'm sure many of her habits will change soon. What are you doing here? Mia asked. Mia felt a slight smack on the back of her head. She turned to see her father glaring at her. That's no way to speak to your future husband. I raised you better than that. David, it is quite all right, Grant said. Mia hadn't realized that her father and Grant were on a first-name basis already. I love a good challenge, and I'm sure in a short while Amelia will follow all the rules of my household. It's part of the reason I picked her. It felt like the oxygen had been sucked out of the room. Mia was sure this was a nightmare and she would wake up any second. She turned to see Whitney standing behind her at the basement door, looking solemn. Unable to offer any assistance, her friend retreated down the stairs. The two men continued to talk, but Mia couldn't focus on what they were saying. All of a sudden, it dawned on her that they were expecting her to speak. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the question was. I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. Mia tried to catch her breath. Overwhelmed with happiness, David said. Her happiness is not my concern, Grant said. I'm buying her to make me happy. Both men laughed at this, though Mia thought she saw some concern on her father's face. I was hoping we could just have a small ceremony, maybe at the end of the week, as soon as the money clears and the paperwork is taken care of. That way I can get Amelia to her new home, and I won't have to worry about flying back and forth. New home? Flying? Mia was confused. I thought there was a waiting period. Darling, as I mentioned during dinner, I have friends in high places. I could get our union approved and paid for this evening if I wanted. Grant examined his fingernails while he spoke. And you didn't think I lived here, did you? My home, your new home, is in the northeast area, about 1,500 miles from here. A map of the country and its five fractions flashed into Mia's head. There was the Midwest area, her home, the Northwest area, the Northeast area, the Southeast area, and the Southwest area. Mia didn't want to move to the Northeast. She didn't know anything about that section of the country. She pushed the thought out of her head. She wasn't moving anywhere with this monster. I know her mother wanted to throw a party, but I'm sure we can get something together soon, her father said. This is her last wedding to plan, so I can't deny her the fun. This could not be happening. Mia wrapped her arms around herself. She pinched her arms to keep her mind focused. She tuned the two men out as they discussed their plans for her. Her stomach began to ache and heave. 
May I be excused? Mia said. I want to go share the news with Whitney. Of course. Her father kissed her head. Soon you're not going to have to ask me for permission. You'll have to ask Mr. Marsden. Chapter 9 All fathers love their daughters. A daughter returns that love by obtaining a high marriage fee. Not only is a high appraisal price a point of pride, it is also repayment for the money and time spent raising her. The Registry Guide for Girls No way, I am out. Whitney shook her head. Your husband is handsome. I'd love to have your life, and you want to run away from it. This doesn't change anything, Mia said. We just need to push up the time. It will be simple. She took Whitney by the shoulders, forcing her friend to look into her eyes. Do you want to spend your life doing whatever they tell you, or do you want to make a life of your own? I can't. It's suicide. Whitney wasn't budging. There just isn't enough time. I'm sorry, but we don't know what we are doing, and it's not worth the risk. We have no clue what's out there. If we try to do this unprepared, we'll get killed. Time is the issue? Mia wasn't giving up. What if I tried to talk to my father? Get the wedding delayed? I'll get it pushed back at least a month. Don't hold your breath. Your father might love you on some level, but not as much as he loves money. That's harsh, Mia said. It's realistic, and you know it too, or else you wouldn't contemplate hurting him like this. You know once you leave, you are robbing him of all that money he has invested in raising you. Think about that before you decide to take off to the middle of nowhere and abandon your duties. Whitney's comment wasn't worth responding to. Refusing to admit defeat, Mia charged up the stairs. Each obstacle strengthened her will to get away. Mia paced outside the door to her father's office. All she needed was some more time. She pondered the idea of making the trip alone, but knew she wouldn't get far without Whitney. She also knew it would be impossible to leave Whitney. Nobody would come to help her. The article twisted Mia's stomach. Other nations are too afraid to step in and help these poor women because, article continued on page 112, the quote ran through her head. She wished Karina had kept the other pages. Come in, her father said. Mia entered the room. She had expected to see Grant, too, but he must have left. Instead, her mother was with her father. They both smiled, their faces filled with admiration and happiness for their daughter. We were just looking at some things we'll need for the party on Friday, her mother said. Planning a menu and a quick guest list. What do you want to wear? I don't think we have enough time to have something made for you. Maybe you could rummage through my closet? That was what I was hoping to talk to you about, Mia's voice shook. I don't want to get married on Friday. It's not enough time. I want to have my dress made and pick out the decorations. You already had your pretty dress night last night, her mother said without looking up from the desk. It's simple for the ceremony. Her father didn't even respond. He just continued to flip through the mound of papers. Mia gulped loudly, knowing she had to push forward. It's not fair. It's my big day and I should have the one I want. Hush. He wasn't interested. You're an adult now, and you'll have to deal with changes as they come along. Your husband wants to marry you right away, and you will oblige his wishes. Did he pay you extra to speed up the process? Mia felt anger in her voice. After all, that's all I am to you, a piece of property to sell to the highest bidder. You're happy. You can't wait to get rid of me and collect your prize. Mia knew she had crossed the line and was expecting punishment. She closed her eyes and prepared for a blow, but neither parent rose or tried to defend themselves. Her father let out a loud sigh. Yes, he did give us some extra payment to speed things up. I care for your happiness, but now you are going to answer to someone else, and how he chooses to treat and address you will be his business. Honey, is this about Karina? Her mother stood. 
It's okay that you're nervous, but you got yourself quite a catch. You will have a fabulous life. You two don't care that you'll never see me again? Mia asked. What if I'm beaten? Will you just send me back to die? You'll have your own family soon, and they will matter more than us, her mother said. Her parents' calm demeanor frustrated Mia more than ever. You're getting married on Friday. End of discussion, said her father. Technically, I gave you the money, because without me, he wouldn't be offering anything. Irritation grew deep inside Mia. He is paying me for my permission. You have no say. Her father started to get agitated. This conversation is over. Mia tried to speak again, but she wasn't sure arguing would help. Her parents returned to their smiley, happy selves, looking at more wedding ideas. Mia was always so obedient toward her father. She wasn't used to his yelling, and her instincts made her back down. She didn't know what else to do. As she closed the door to her father's office, she was shocked to see Andrew waiting his turn to speak with them. He looked stunned. It was obvious he'd heard the whole conversation. Mia wasn't sure if she was imagining it, but she thought he looked like he wanted to console her. Hi. Mia had spent her whole life around young men, but never spoken to any of them. He stared right into her eyes. They were fiery and tortured. For a second, it looked like he might respond, and she was eager to hear his voice. But he turned away, said nothing, and behaved as if she didn't exist. Andrew walked around her and knocked on the door. He entered the office and was greeted by her parents. He showed no interest in her. Mia's own stupidity washed over her as she leaned back against the wall and slid to the floor. If she couldn't even get a boy to say hello to her, there was no way she could survive the trip. She brought her knees up and rested her head on them. That's a shame. I wish you would reconsider. Her father's voice carried through the door. You are a great worker and a fabulous leader. How much time do you have? Mia's eyes widened as she realized Andrew was leaving. It wasn't fair that he could take off on a whim and she was forever trapped. She kept her ear to the door and listened to the rest of their discussion. A little less than a month, Andrew said. I want to take some time to just travel around. Get my head clear before I report for duty. But where will you go? Her mother asked. I hear it is awful out there. Will you be safe? I mean no disrespect, Mrs. Morrissey, Andrew said. But it is not as bad as you think. I've learned a lot from you, sir, and I appreciate all your help these past years. But I need some time alone before I serve my country. Please call me Laura. You are like a son to us. It will be hard to see you leave. Mia almost laughed out loud at her mother's comment. Being likened to one of her parents' children was hardly a compliment. If he was their son, they probably would have pushed him out without a second thought. Still, Mia felt frustration over how supportive her parents were of Andrew. She didn't warrant the same amount of consideration from them. I understand. Don't worry about your time in service. Fastest four years of your life, her father said. Do you have a branch you're hoping to serve in? Air Force, sir. That is quite impressive. Hardest branch to get into, and it comes with the most prestige. Good luck. I was an army man, so I can't offer any tips. I've been interested in flying for as long as I can remember, Andrew said. That's part of the reason I want to leave, to see if I can find a place to brush up. Why tonight, though? asked her mother. Shouldn't you wait till the morning? I'm sure I can get a care package ready for you. Maybe some food or extra clothes? Thank you, but no. It is better to travel at night. I'm hoping to make it to the highway and then try to hitch a ride in the morning, Andrew said. Besides, I'm afraid that if I stay, I'll change my mind and end up here till enlistment time. Mia stood and made her way toward her room. She had heard enough. Tonight was the night she'd make a run for it. 
She was going to have something better than months of planning or Whitney's common sense. She was going to have a personal guide. Chapter 10 A wife never inquires into her husband's background. She need only know that he has served his country nobly and faced many hardships in doing so. In due time, he will reveal all he chooses to. The Registry Guide for Girls The clock was fast approaching midnight. Mia waited until she was certain everyone was asleep. Dressed in baggy sweatpants and an oversized white t-shirt, she tiptoed downstairs. She stopped in the kitchen and loaded her pack with some bottled water and whatever food would fit, paying little attention to what she was grabbing, and then slid out the back door. As she made her way inside the garage, Mia felt a stab of guilt. Whitney was right above her, sleeping, not knowing that she was getting ready to enter a life filled with loneliness and pain. The stairs that led up to Whitney's apartment were outside at the rear of the garage. Mia knew she needed to offer Whitney one last chance to join her. She was about to step out when she heard the side door swing open. The idea of getting caught before she even left the property was too much for Mia. She dropped to the floor and hid in the darkness. She felt around till she found a large metal rod and grabbed it. She was more than prepared to use the device on anyone who tried to stop her. As her eyes adjusted to the dark, Mia was able to see the outline of the other person's feet under the car. They were wearing a pair of fluffy slippers. Mia, Whitney said, I know it's you. I saw you sneak out of the house. Groaning, Mia rose to her feet. You scared me. I'm leaving, tonight, now. I'll see you in the morning, Whitney turned around. I'm serious, and I have a guide, a real one. Who? Andrew. Liar. It's the truth. I'm supposed to pick him up. He's walking toward the highway. He wanted to travel before his enlistment date, and he'll see me to the border. If you want to come, you still can. But it's now or never. You're full of it. I'm going back to bed. I am dead serious. Mia spotted a pair of scissors lying on a workbench. She grabbed them and with one quick snip, chopped off her entire ponytail, cementing her boy disguise. Your mother is going to freak out, Whitney said. Don't stay. Please come with me. We can do this together. You can have a better life somewhere else. A life of your choosing, Mia pleaded. She felt tears welling up at the thought of Whitney working as a servant for the government, or as a bride with no free will, blindly serving her mate. She decided not to wait for Whitney's response. She needed to show her the escape was happening. Mia opened the door to one of her father's cars and sat down. She pulled down the visor and a set of keys fell into her lap. She felt around for the ignition, hoping not to lose her edge with Whitney. You are serious, Whitney's eyes widened. I am going to sit right here for ten minutes. Then I am going to start this thing up and leave, with or without you. Mia stared straight ahead. As soon as Whitney left the garage, Mia calmed herself and placed the key in the ignition. Her hand was shaking. She reached into her bag and pulled out the article, studying the picture. She closed her eyes and with a quick rip shredded the paper, knowing it was too dangerous to hold on to, and partly for her own relief. Mia knew she would continue to obsess over the article and not focus on her getaway if it wasn't destroyed. She didn't need it anymore. She looked at the tiny shreds and wondered if she had made a mistake, if this all was a mistake. But she couldn't look back now. The article's remains would be scattered along the road. Mia thought it was a fitting goodbye to her former life. Her mind went back to the car. She hadn't been in one for a long time. It was rare that her parents took her off the property. The last time had been over a year ago. Mia had cut herself chopping vegetables, and her father needed to take her to the doctor right away. He wanted to make sure there was no scar. She could remember only the pain in her finger, 
not how he operated the car. The vehicle didn't seem that complicated, though. She'd watched plenty of her father's farmhands start up and drive tractors. It was always from a distance, but the machine seemed similar. She was sure she could figure it out. Looking in the rearview mirror, Mia examined her hair. She felt no regret for having chopped off her locks, but still needed some touch-ups to make her look manlier. She laughed at this thought, because not trying was what made a haircut masculine. The noise of the main garage door opening startled Mia. Just as she had hoped, Whitney appeared and slid into the passenger seat. Mia was shocked at Whitney's sudden transformation. Her clothes and new haircut made it difficult to tell she wasn't a boy. But then Whitney opened her mouth and all illusions vanished. For the record, I am doing this for me. I think you are insane and making a huge mistake. I doubt anyone will even notice or care I am gone. Okay, Mia said. Thank you. Don't. How did you get ready so fast? I told you I'm a planner. One of the first things I did was pick out my boy gear, something you obviously didn't do. With that, Whitney reached into her bag and pulled out a hat, placing it on Mia's head. Just try to stay out of anyone's sight. Never ceasing to amaze, Whitney also pulled out a map. She unfolded it to show the layout of the area. Mia didn't understand any of it. Whitney pointed her finger to a place labeled Iowa. This is the best I could find. It's very old and has the old names on it, but I think it's still good. Now, where are we meeting Andrew? He's just walking toward the highway. I'm going to guess and say this big, thick road is the highway. Whitney pointed again. We are here, so head down the driveway and then make a right. Mia flipped the key and the car growled to a start. She looked at all the handles and the buttons, but wasn't sure which one to push. What are you doing? Drive before someone hears us. In a moment of panic, Mia began pushing everything she could. The windshield wipers ran and the lights flashed on and off. She tapped the floor pedals and the engine revved. She moved one of the levers and the car flew forward out of the open garage. Mia gave Whitney a guilty smile. She hit the road and turned right. Mia thought she would feel anxious and scared, but instead, she felt peace drift over her. She was on her way out of this world. The ride was awkward and bumpy, and Whitney wasn't doing much but criticizing. After about an hour grinding down the road and into the night, they were nearing the highway. Keep your eyes open. He should be walking along the road now. Mia slowed the car to a crawl. How in the world did you get him to agree to help? Whitney asked. He never seemed like much of a rule breaker. I always got the impression he liked your father. Well, it wasn't difficult. Mia shrugged. He apologized for running into me the other day and we got to talking. But he does have some weird rules. Like when we pick him up, don't talk to him, don't look at him, and don't say a word. I've never spoken to him before. Why should now be any different? Whitney said. I think I see someone. Recognizing the figure as Andrew, Mia jerked the car over to the side of the road. Butterflies flew into her stomach as he opened the back door. Are you heading south? He asked. Mia kept her head straight forward and nodded. Andrew climbed into the back seat and closed the door. I thought I wouldn't find a ride till morning. Not many travelers come through here except cargo trucks. Approaching the entrance to the highway, Mia followed the sign leading south. The three of them continued on in silence. Whitney appeared confused by Andrew's demeanor. Mia knew it was just a matter of moments until Whitney realized that she had lied. Sir, I don't mean any disrespect, but you know the speed limit is 65 out here, Andrew said from the back seat. It feels like you're not going much over 20. Mia looked down at the speedometer and realized that was what he was referring to. She pressed down hard on the pedal, and the car flung into high gear. Mia was glad that the hum of the engine overtook the awkward silence. Glancing in the rearview mirror, Mia got a glimpse of Andrew. 
He was staring out the window as the cornstalks flew by. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught Whitney giving her the stare down, having figured out Mia's deceit. Mia was just relieved that Whitney wasn't saying anything to blow their cover. Chapter 11 Joy is abundant in all marriages. Even previously mundane tasks are imbued with a new spark, and the happier the husband becomes, the larger the spark. The Registry Guide for Girls No one spoke a word for the next few hours. Mia felt as if the silence was choking her. On occasion, she glanced over at Whitney, whose angry expression had been replaced by a sleepy one. Mia had no clue where they were. She hoped Mexico wasn't too far. A loud ping started coming from the dashboard. Mia looked and saw a little icon flashing, but wasn't sure what it meant. You're almost out of gas, Andrew said. Pull over. Do you have a can in the trunk? Mia had thought he was asleep. The sound of his voice made the hairs on the back of her neck stand up. She steered the car toward the side of the road, but continued to coast, wanting to move as far as possible. Stop the car, Andrew said with a chill in his voice. You don't know what you're doing, do you? Mia shrugged, still not wanting to speak. She hit the brakes hard, and the car jolted to a stop. Whitney was sprung from her sleep and smacked her head on the windshield. Pulling her hand over her face, she let out a yelp of pain. Are you okay? Andrew asked from the back seat. Whitney continued to moan and clutch her face. Mia was frozen, looking straight out into the pitch blackness of night. She was going to accidentally kill her best friend before they made it to safety. Mia wanted to comfort Whitney and make sure she was all right. But before she could move, Andrew jumped out of the car and opened the passenger side door. Let me take a look, he said almost gently, pulling Whitney's hand down to examine her eye. Mia glanced over at them and noticed Whitney's tears were subsiding while Andrew finished checking her out. His tall, lanky frame didn't look intimidating when he crouched down but even in the dark, his eyes were still a powerful force. He caught Mia staring, and they grew cold and hard. I'm sorry, Guy, but what were you thinking? Andrew asked. Is this your first night behind the wheel? Mia gripped the steering wheel and shook her head. It looks like your friend is fine. He'll just end up with a shiner. But you need to drive more carefully. Yeah, be more careful. Whitney said through short sobs. You should have been wearing your seatbelt, so it's not all his fault, Andrew said before rising to his full height. He walked over toward the driver's side and leaned against Mia's window. You're out of gas. The sign back there said the nearest station is 15 miles away, and I don't think anyone is going to give you a ride. Andrew continued walking toward the back and reached in to grab his satchel. Throwing the strap over his shoulder, he began walking away. Thanks for the lift. Panic struck Mia. She looked over at Whitney, who was still clutching her face. That hurt. What's a shiner? Whitney asked. Mia mouthed the word, sorry, swung open the driver's side door, and called out, Wait! She was already running toward him as she spoke. Once they met, she tried her best to deepen her voice. Can't you help us? We're not from around here. Well, your car has local plates. Andrew's voice started to trail off as he walked back toward the car. I recognize this car. It's one of Mr. Morrissey's. Andrew shoved Mia to the side and got a better look at the vehicle. He began examining the inside and looked at Whitney, who was still wiping away tears. He sent us to come give you a ride, wherever you want, Mia said. We're new hires, first night on the job. Take off your hat. Mia made no attempt to move. Andrew lunged forward and ripped the cap off her head. You, he said accusingly. Let me guess, the crying baby is the manager's daughter. What are you two doing? 
running away to Mexico. Mia took a risk and came clean. I was hoping you would help us at least get to the border. Help you? I'll help you, by making sure you're escorted safely back to your father's house. I'm not going back. I'm never going back. I would rather die than marry that man. With your help, I can avoid that fate. Andrew scoffed, walked toward her, and grabbed her arm. He began pulling her toward Whitney. Mia squirmed. Andrew was more than double her size, but she managed to swing her foot in front of him and trip him. She curled herself around to force them both to land on their backs. Mia stood up, but it was clear Andrew'd had the wind knocked out of him. Don't you dare touch me like that ever again, Mia said. Her mind was raging. She watched him collect himself and was a little surprised when he refused to make eye contact with her. She thought of him defending the young boy. He seemed more of a protector than an assailant. She was about to plead her case again when he rose and started walking north. Where are you going? She asked as she chased after him. If I can't take you home, I'm at least going there and telling your father, giving him some sort of information about where you are. Panic flooded Mia. She had to do something to make him stay. If you do, I'll tell everyone you abducted us, Mia said defiantly, desperately. Nobody will believe you. Andrew shook his head and kept walking. Your father knows I would never do anything like that. You're wrong. They will pin it all on you. My father, my fiancé. I'm sure rag agents will have been called in by the time you get there. I bet they'll be thrilled to have someone to blame. Mia felt like she was starting to get through to him. You're not stupid. Have you ever heard of a girl just running away? There is always an abductor. Your picture will be all over the paper. You'll go to jail or have life in service. Your reputation means nothing to anyone. Your life is not as valuable as mine. Andrew stopped walking and turned back toward Mia. She could almost feel the synapses firing in his brain. She kept still and confident and hoped he wouldn't call her bluff. After staring at her for a minute, a look of defeat crossed his face. What do you want from me? Andrew asked. We need you to help us get to Mexico, Mia said shakily. And what is your plan for accomplishing this? You? Andrew looked stunned. You don't even have a plan. What made you think I knew how to get to Mexico? Well, Mia felt her power slipping. You know how boys act. You know how to travel. Just get us to the border and make people think we are boys traveling together. I'll take care of it from there. He shook his head in disbelief. It was difficult for Mia to read any emotion from him. They stood awkwardly, Andrew avoiding her glance the entire time. After what felt like hours, he spoke again. Fine. You have to do what I say when I say. I am in charge. I get it. It's dangerous for me to take you back. But if I get caught helping you, it's just as dangerous. How much money do you have? None. Mia gave him a strange look. Why would we have money? To pay for things, like food, shelter, clothes. Neither of us ever had any access to money. We have the car, though, and food. It should take us a few hours to get to Mexico, right? Blood rushed to Andrew's face, and he began pacing back and forth. It was easy for her to read his emotions now. Mia knew she'd lost any credibility she'd had with him. A few hours? Car? He gritted his teeth. I was so happy we spotted you. I was scared someone else was going to pick you up. I wish anyone else would have picked me up. Even a homicidal maniac. Anyone. Andrew stared her down with a crinkled brow. We need to ditch the car. Now. But then how will we get to Mexico? No questions. You just do what I say when I say. Andrew began walking toward the car, taking large strides to leave Mia behind. She ran with quick little steps, trying to keep up, but he was paying little attention to her. As he approached the vehicle, he barked at Whitney to get out of the car. 
Tears were streaming down her face as she hurried out of her seat. Mia was sure she'd heard everything. Get your stuff out of the car, Andrew said with anger and authority. The girls pulled their belongings out as quickly as possible and moved to the side of the road. He jumped in, and the car puttered away. Mia assumed it was due to the lack of gas. He never bothered to check the trunk for more. He's leaving us? Whitney asked with a quivering voice. He'll be back, Mia said. We just need to wait. You're blackmailing him? Whitney asked. That's not like you. You never think about this kind of stuff. I've never seen you plot or scheme in your whole life, and this is an evil plan. This is stuff criminals do. I'm doing what I need to do to survive, for both of us to survive. It was not in her nature to deceive, and Whitney looked disgusted with her. But Mia didn't care. Her friend needed to lose her old concept of the world. It was time for a new one. Chapter 12 Girls should take care not to grow inappropriately attached to anyone in their lives. The only relationship that matters is that between husband and wife. Once that bond is created, there is no reason to miss any part of your previous life. The Registry Guide for Girls The sky was turning lighter by the minute. Whitney kept quiet while Mia tried to keep an eye out for Andrew. As the blues in the sky became brighter, so did Mia's realization. Andrew had stolen the car and deserted them. He'd been gone for too long at this point, and even if he was traveling by foot, it would be too hard to catch up to him. For the first time all day, Mia felt like joining Whitney in sobbing. Just when she decided to give in to despair, she noticed a person jogging toward them on the horizon. He's back. Mia shook Whitney to wake her up. We need to start walking to meet him. He left us, Whitney said, without bothering to look toward the figure. Let's just sleep here till they send out the search party. Ignoring Whitney, Mia began her walk toward the figure. She knew it was Andrew. They hadn't seen a single car or person since he'd left. Mia heard Whitney calling to her to slow down, but she couldn't. With every step she took, she felt herself flying away. Her grin grew so large it took up most of her face. But as she drew closer to Andrew, she saw he was not returning her smile. Mia felt hers fade as the two met. She had to catch her breath, but he wasn't a bit tired. Finally, he spoke. We need to lay down some rules. I will help you get to the border. That is it. You don't make a convincing boy. You need to keep your head down and never speak. Don't ask any questions, and don't talk to me. Is that because you're mad I'm forcing you to help us, or because I'm a girl? Mia surprised herself by speaking to Andrew this way, but she needed to toughen up. You're already breaking a rule. Andrew kept his chin up. Just as Mia was going to protest more, Whitney came jogging behind gasping for breath. It's great to see you. I didn't think you were going to come back for us, Whitney managed to say. That black eye does help. You'll be able to fit in a little better than the royal. Andrew looked toward Whitney while he spoke. I'll let your friend fill you in on the rules. Mia was upset. She didn't enjoy her new nickname. So what's the plan? Whitney seemed to have renewed energy. Right now, we walk, Andrew said, as he turned and started to walk along the road. When the sun is too high, we will move into the fields and find a place to rest for the day. Then at night, we will walk some more. How come she gets to ask questions? Mia was confused. Manager's daughter, you may ask me questions because you are not annoying and manipulative, Andrew said. But don't abuse the privilege. It's Whitney, Mia said. She thought Andrew was showing off. He knew their names. Whitney nodded at Andrew's instructions, and the three began their walk. The gap between Andrew and the girls was always about ten feet. They could not keep up with his long strides. After some time, Mia finally broke the silence. 
Ask him why he ditched the car, Mia said. Mia expected Whitney to protest and not waste her questions, but Whitney nodded her head. Why did you get rid of the car? Whitney had to yell to get him to hear. Because. Why are you helping us? Whitney asked. Mia was surprised to hear her inquiry. She was just as interested to hear the answer. Because, he answered again. Whitney gave Mia a smirk, a sign of approval. Mia smiled back and winked. It was nice that Whitney was starting to understand her plan of action. But both girls' expressions darkened as they looked forward at the long road ahead. Mia realized how tired she was. At this point in time, she didn't care about his answer. She was just happy to have him as a guide. The sun was now visible in the sky, and the cornfields surrounding the highway were bathed in gold and greens. Andrew pointed ahead and to the left, to a small patch of trees that stood in between rows of corn. He began walking through the stalks, and the girls followed. They had to move fast in order to keep up. A snake slithered through the rows, and Whitney screamed, but Andrew's pace didn't falter. Mia wanted to reach out and hold on to his shirt. The corn was taller than he was, and if she lost him in here, she would be alone forever. She was overjoyed when they reached the greenery. Now we rest. Andrew reached into his bag and pulled out some water, taking a little sip. He handed the bottle to the girls. Try to conserve. Don't drink too much. How long are we stopping for? Whitney wiped sweat from her forehead. Till sundown. It's too dangerous to travel during the day. You'll get sick from the sun. Dropping her bag, Mia sat in the shade. She wanted to protest the long break. She didn't think they were far enough from home and had assumed they would hitch a ride from someone in a car like Andrew told her parents earlier. But before she could form the words of her argument, the rhythmic sounds of the birds chirping lulled her into a deep sleep. Chapter 13 You are the protector and guardian of our free nation. Your passion and precision in defeating the enemy will result in a free lifestyle, uncorrupted by the despair that plagues other nations. Through your service, you make your country great. The Boy's Guide to Service Dust and gravel filled the air as Grant turned down the long driveway toward the Morrissey house. He hated how dirty his rental car got every time he drove it here. He also hated driving such a low-brow car. He owned so many superior vehicles. Cars were one of his many indulgences. Unfortunately, the rental company offered slim pickings in this pit, and Grant was stuck driving a cheap convertible. He couldn't wait to get out of here and back to civilization. He smiled at the thought of never having to return. But as he neared the house, even he had to admit there was some rustic charm to the giant structure. He reminded himself he was taking home the most charming part of it. Grant liked the idea of having such a sheltered girl as a wife. He planned on keeping her that way. He had met too many young ladies who were far too educated for his tastes. This innocent was just what he was searching for. As he drew closer to the house, the road changed to pavement and the dust began to settle. Without the cloud of debris, Grant noticed some cars in the driveway. They were black SUVs, government cars. He assumed this was why David had requested his company so early. Grant grinned and shook his head. He presumed the cars meant some of his friends had heard of the engagement and wanted to congratulate him or attend the party. He would be quick to oblige their requests. Throwing the car into park, Grant checked his hair in the mirror and straightened his collar. Now that his proposal had been accepted, he decided to dress normally. No more suits. His signature look was a polo shirt, plaid shorts, and sandals. This was not how one would expect a mogul to dress, but Grant didn't care. He jumped out of the car and made it a step before David was at the front door. Good morning, David. How is my bride-to-be? Grant called out as he neared the house. 
Please, come in and sit down. It's Mia. She is missing, David said in a low voice. It didn't take long for Grant to realize the government cars were not driven by his friends. These cars belonged to rag agents. Grant was much more interested in what they had found than in what David was saying. He thought back to his time in service. He had worked for military intelligence and was excellent at his job. He would have been a rag agent if he hadn't found his calling in arms dealing. And I'm sure someone took her. Poor girl, she must be so scared. She is so lucky she has you to worry about her. Why don't you stop insulting my intelligence, Grant said. We both know your daughter made a run for it. She didn't want to marry me. David froze, not knowing how to respond. And we both know if it gets out that she ran away, or I find out she ran away, I can back out of the deal. If you don't present a bride, I don't have to buy her. I could break off the engagement this second if I wanted to, and there is nothing you could do. Grant stopped and took a sip of water. He enjoyed the confused look on the old man's face. The fear that his expensive transaction might fall through was apparent. So please stop telling me someone took her, because it doesn't matter to me one bit. I knew she was headstrong. I just didn't think she was this brave. I admire her. A smile and a look of relief crossed David's face. Here is what we are going to do. Effective today, we are going to sign the paperwork. You get your money, and I'll get the legal rights to your daughter. This search becomes my search. I'll find her and take her to her new home. You will have no rights anymore. You stop worrying about your daughter and let me worry about my wife, Grant said. His voice was calm and collected. What are you going to do if you find her? David looked concerned. The steel is not going to stay on the table for long. I wouldn't waste your time worrying about situations we both know you don't care about, Grant said. He thought David a stupid man, motivated solely by money. Grant watched him pull out the paperwork and start signing documents. As Grant took the check out from his wallet, he thought about David's question. He wasn't sure what he would do to Mia when he found her. Her escape only made her more desirable to him. He was not a man people said no to. He smiled as David signed the marriage certificate, or as Grant saw it, maybe the death warrant. Grant slid the check over and signed the license before folding it up and pocketing it. Well now, I'm a married man, Grant said. Aren't some congratulations in order? Congratulations, David said. Now, tell me everything about my wife's disappearance. Lifting the yellow tape, Grant felt a rush of excitement as he entered the roped-off area. Just the chance to hunt someone down was worth every penny. Grant enjoyed the chase more than anything else. He felt excited by the piles of lopped-off hair. The two rag agents did not look pleased as he crossed into their crime scene. He decided to introduce himself before he was removed. Hello, gentlemen. You might not know who I am, but I assure you your boss does. One of you get on the phone and tell him you are looking for Mr. Grant Marsden's wife. Also tell him I would like to speak to him personally. This is a closed-off area, sir. One of the rag agents started toward him. He was a slim, dark man, about Grant's age, maybe a year or two younger. I hear so far there are two girls missing. They both cut off their hair and stole a car. I take it you put out an alert for the model? Any hits? Grant asked. The slim agent reached Grant and placed his hand on Grant's chest, attempting to push him back behind the tape. Grant reacted with lightning speed and twisted the young agent's arm till he heard a pop. With his other hand, he reached under the agent's jacket, pulled out his firearm, and pointed it at the second agent. The first yelped in pain, and Grant released him. The agent fell to the ground, choking back screams. Grant lowered his weapon and let out a laugh. It's been so long. 
I really missed this, Grant said with true happiness. He signaled to the rag agent still standing. So, any hits on the car? No, the agent was uneasy. We have checkpoints on the major highways all over the area, with descriptions of the girls as well as the vehicle information. Good boy, Grant said. He turned his attention toward the agent on the ground. Now, I think it's time you made that phone call. Tell your boss I want to see him. Chapter 14 The outside world is dangerous, not all men are capable of becoming husbands. Those who do not qualify are openly hostile toward females. It is important for a girl to remain in the safety provided by her male guardians, as they always have her best interests at heart. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia didn't know whether she was more tired of walking or of the lack of conversation. She had never thought her big escape would be so boring. The trio had been moving along a dark stretch of road in complete silence for several hours. Andrew still wouldn't acknowledge her, and Whitney was starting to get nervous. Do you think they are looking for us? Whitney asked. Is it safe to walk so close to the road? It's so dark out here we would see a car long before they would see us. It would be easy to jump and hide in the ditch, Mia said, proud she knew that at least. Where are we? Whitney's voice was starting to get a bit of a whine to it. Where are we going? We are going south. That's all that matters right now, Mia said in a whisper. This is ridiculous, Whitney said. He has no plan. He is probably trying to get us caught and sent back. Why don't you ask him what the plan is and maybe he'll tell you, Mia said. But Whitney immediately shook her head no. A flock of birds flew across the night sky. Mia wished she could move as quickly as they did. She remembered chasing the ducks around the farm, always laughing and never catching them. It had been an easy way to spend an afternoon. But then her mother noticed. She'd yelled at Mia and said running around and getting dirty wasn't ladylike. That her energy should be spent staying clean and pretty. Back then, even though Mia would have rather chased birds, she wouldn't have dreamed of behaving in an unladylike way. Mia gulped, understanding it was time to put all concerns about proper conduct out of her head. She took a deep breath and attempted to ask a question. Andrew, she said, where are we going? South, that's all that matters right now, Andrew said with a smirk. Whitney gave Mia a look, and Mia recognized it right away. Whitney was annoyed. Mia wasn't any more amused with Andrew's answer. Mia knew she needed to rethink the situation or risk losing Whitney's support, and she couldn't lose her only friend. Enough, her voice echoed across the open fields. I understand you don't like me, but this is my life and I am taking some control. I want your help, but I need to know what the plan is. We can't just walk all the way to Mexico. And please, treat me like a human. Treat me like I'm just one of the boys. I am not your wife to boss around. After a moment of silence, Andrew began to form his response. His voice took on a hard edge, but his face remained expressionless. You want my help. You forced me into helping you, and then you want me to be in a better mood. You have contributed nothing. You are dead weight, and I plan on treating you as such. I was going to spend my final month seeing a little of the country, maybe spending some time studying, relaxing before the next chapter of my life begins. Instead, I am breaking who knows how many laws because of you. I am risking my future and my life because of you. And while it may not be worth thousands like yours, it's still my life. Mia felt guilty over the harsh words she had used. I am treating you like a boy. Like a boy I don't like. So I'm ignoring you, Andrew said. He turned around and started walking again. Mia glanced toward Whitney for some sympathy, but received none. 
Instead, Whitney started to quicken her pace to keep up with Andrew's strides. It surprised Mia to see Whitney side with Andrew. But Mia knew Whitney didn't agree with her tactics. Mia did feel guilty. Andrew was right. So far, she had made no contribution, and this plot was her brainchild. She had expected Andrew to do everything. She pushed any thought of hurt feelings to the back of her mind and continued to walk. Trailing behind the other two, Mia spent several hours thinking of ways to help, or at least contribute, but was coming up blank. Eventually, she gave up trying and just focused on the sound of Whitney's steps on the pavement. She wondered why Andrew's shoes made no noise, but Whitney's made a loud squish with every step. It wasn't long before the sky went from dark to light and the sun moved above the horizon. They had walked all night. We need to find another shaded area to rest. Do either of you see one? Andrew asked. Wait, Mia said. She didn't know if she was desperate to prove herself or had a good idea. I think we should hitch a ride. Wait for a driver. No, it's too dangerous. You'll be spotted, Andrew said. We won't be able to walk another whole night, Mia answered. I'm fine to keep walking, Whitney said, but Mia knew she was lying. Whitney was still programmed to listen to everything Andrew said and be agreeable. Both girls needed to start thinking differently if they were going to make it to Mexico. No, you're not, Mia said. Your shoes are about to give out. The soles are coming loose and they're making a strange noise. Whitney lifted up her feet and noticed the wear and tear on her shoes. We can't walk all the way to the border. We are going to have to hitch a ride. We should do it when the sun's up, when there are cars on the road, Mia said. Mia was happy. Andrew appeared to be pondering her contribution. She was capable of generating an idea, and her best one had come from just listening. He didn't look very pleased, but he nodded in agreement. Make sure you keep your hats on and stare at the ground. Don't make eye contact and don't say a word, Andrew said. Then he pointed at Whitney and continued. We need to keep moving. Be aware of your shoe situation and if your feet start to hurt, say something. Whitney nodded in response. What if nobody comes? Whitney asked. We're on a main trucking route. We'll get picked up within the hour, Andrew said. Mia expected Whitney to be happy about getting out of walking, but instead her friend just looked worried. Mia could tell Whitney doubted her plan. She put her arm around her and gave her a squeeze for encouragement, but it didn't seem to ease Whitney's nerves. Chapter 15 Time may change the state of war, and it may be difficult to tell who the battle is against, but one thing always remains constant. You are becoming a citizen of the greatest country in the world, and all other nations are in some ways enemies. The Boy's Guide to Service Stop screaming. It's just a truck. Andrew was getting frustrated with his charges. Neither girl had ever seen a truck before. Both found them unpleasant and loud. You're boys now. Act like it. The young ladies tried to stand straight up and imitate Andrew. He was not amused. Mia snuck Whitney a sly smile, and they both started to laugh. Andrew didn't believe they were taking the situation seriously. He debated lecturing them, but decided it wasn't worth it. If there was one thing he had learned about women during his time with Mia and Whitney, it was that they were stubborn and didn't want to listen. This was the exact opposite of what he'd expected. He glanced over at the girls. Both of them looked happy, like they were eagerly awaiting the next truck to drive by so they could scream and grab each other again. Andrew couldn't recall the last time someone had grabbed him in a loving, protective way. He strained to remember, but he doubted it had ever happened. It was more important to survive in the world. He couldn't waste his time focusing on others. And yet, he was surprised by an urge to wrap his arms around Mia and Whitney, to join in their fun. 
He debated squeezing their shoulders with a friendly grip, apologizing for his anger, and maybe even getting on the receiving end of those smiles. But before he had the opportunity to act on his feelings, his brain began to tear those thoughts down. He knew it was a waste of time, and he needed to focus his energy back on survival. It wasn't just for him this time. He had to think about their safety, too. Nothing had prepared him for this scenario. He was more than ready to protect himself and his country. The only woman whose safety should be a concern to him was his wife, and he was a long way off from having that luxury. He had envisioned his future bride like he'd envisioned all women, simple, helpful, and obedient. He had never anticipated running into any problems with her, but the more time he spent around Mia and Whitney, the more his imaginary wife was disappearing. Part of him knew they were just as worthy of his protection as his country was, even though these thoughts were unpatriotic and possibly treasonous. The image of Grant grabbing Mia had angered him to his core. He had tried to let go of the anger, but it stayed with him. He couldn't be the type of man who let that happen. She needed to get away from him. And the sooner he could drop them off, the sooner he could shift his focus back to himself. Someone needed to take their trip seriously. He may have become an unwilling protector, but he was going to protect them nonetheless. Another truck zoomed by, and again Mia and Whitney let out little screams and huddled together. Stop it. Andrew turned to stare both of them down. He watched as the glint of happiness faded from their faces. The quiet made it easier for him to concentrate. He stuck his hand back out, hoping to get off this road and away from them. Chapter 16 Females mature much faster than males. Girls must avoid unserved boys, as contact would only threaten a girl's growth and development. The Registry Guide for Girls I am sorry about your eye, Mia said. It's okay. It makes me look more like a man, Whitney said with a fake, gruff voice. The sun was starting to cause sweat to pour through their clothes. Whitney did make a pretty convincing boy. Her hair clung tight and short to her head. The dark hair on her arms helped her stay in character. Mia didn't think it was a good idea to compliment her on this transformation. The sun is brutal. Mia took off her cap to wipe her brow. Leave your hat on, Andrew said. Without it, you don't look like a boy. You look like a teenage girl trying to start a new fashion trend. We'll end up caught. Mia was surprised he'd spoken again so soon. She knew that his words were meant as an insult, but she found herself smiling nonetheless. Whitney even grinned, too. Mia could tell she was relaxing. Whitney always liked to plan. When they were young and would imagine their weddings, Mia always cared more about what to wear and how to style her hair, while Whitney took more joy in scheduling out the day's possible activities. Mia was certain Whitney's brain was back to planning an imaginary timetable of their trip. As the next truck started to whiz by, Andrew stuck up his thumb and waved his arms. The semi just gave a loud honk as it sped by, making Andrew stumble a bit. Mia looked at Whitney with a small smile and let out another little yelp as the machine passed. She didn't care if Andrew was angered by their antics. They were having fun. She wished he could relax and join them, even if just for a moment. Second and third trucks were already visible in the distance. The land was so flat it was easy to see them as they approached. Within minutes, a large semi stopped on the side of the road. Andrew jumped up on the passenger side and greeted the driver. Mia and Whitney stared at the ground as instructed. Mia tried to listen but couldn't make out anything they were talking about. Her nerves were back. She wanted to reach out and grab Whitney's hand, but that would draw too much attention from their new benefactor. Young men didn't hold hands. After a short wait, the driver jumped out of his seat and walked toward the back of his truck. Andrew walked toward the two girls. You two have to ride in the back. Don't worry, I'll be in the front with him, Andrew said. 
Where is he taking us? Mia asked in a low voice. She felt nerves shoot all over her body. She questioned whether this was a good idea. South, he's going to drop us as far down as he's going. You'll be stuck back there for about four hours or so. Both girls nodded, but Mia had no clue how far south he would drop them. She thought back to Whitney's map and wondered if they were out of the Iowa place. She knew it was the wrong time to ask, and Andrew signaled for them to go to the back of the truck, where their driver was waiting. Don't touch anything or I'll give you boys a whipping, the trucker told the girls as he opened the back. Mia glanced up at him. He looked sickly, skinny and dirty, with hair almost as long as hers had been. She looked away, trying to avoid eye contact. A sickening smell flooded everyone's noses. It was a mix between sulfur and rotten food. Don't be shy. What are you waiting for? An invitation? You'll get used to the smell soon enough. I'm hauling manure, the driver said. Mia hid her disgust and was the first to climb in the truck. She swung her leg up several times before sliding in on her belly, wishing she had asked Andrew the manly way to climb into the back. Whitney fared no better trying to enter the cargo space. The trucker gave Andrew a look before shaking his head and slamming the door. Your friends are weird he said. It was pitch black in the container. Both Mia and Whitney chose to huddle toward the front of the truck. It seemed there was less of the smell in this area. They were tired, and Mia had a feeling sleep would come soon. As her eyes began to close, Whitney spoke. You like him, don't you? He's kind of mean to me. Mia saw Andrew only as a means to an end. It's okay if you do. I don't have any romantic feelings for him. He's too young for me. I know he's more your type, but I still like the attention. I don't think any man has paid as much attention to me as he has, Whitney said. Mia thought she sounded sincere. Well, it's not as if we know many men, Mia said. Besides, what about your father? I think he's happy I'm gone. I bet he won't even look for me. Well, do you think maybe he wanted you to feel that way so you would run? You suggested that before. Maybe he wanted a better life for you? Mia asked. She did wonder about Whitney's father. She assumed Karina had smuggled the article from someone at finishing school. But maybe others knew the evil ways of the registry, but were too scared to act. It was very dark in the truck, but Mia swore she could see Whitney smiling at that thought. What is Iowa? Mia whispered. We live in America, Whitney said. This place used to be made up of different countries before we were just areas. The Midwest area used to be several countries. The Southeast area used to be several countries. Now the names of the countries are meaningless. We're just one big group. All the different countries agreed to the registry system? Mia found this unacceptable. Or they were overpowered, I'm not sure. How do you know this? Whitney's intellect always surprised Mia. We've moved. I heard my father mention the different countries to people. We're from Michigan, or we traveled through Wisconsin. I asked him what he was talking about, Whitney explained. And then that map I found, of course. How come you never told me any of this before? Mia had always thought the two were close. Whitney chuckled softly at the question. You never asked. You never cared, she said. I know something happened to you. People don't just change overnight for no reason. It was a few months back. All of a sudden, you were interested in different things, asking questions about the world instead of my opinion on hairstyles. What happened? You can tell me. Mia sighed. She knew Whitney had the right to know about the article. She struggled to form the words. She felt as if telling Whitney would make the situation more real. It would make Karina really dead. Without speaking about it, Mia was able to convince herself her sister might be all right, that she just ran off again, this time to safety. Telling Whitney would send that illusion crashing down. Plus, 
She risked Whitney's not believing the article's information. Karina hadn't till she experienced it firsthand, and Mia still struggled to accept it. But she knew it was just a matter of time anyway. Mia took a deep breath and was about to explain herself when all of a sudden the truck came to a stop. Mia welcomed the distraction and walked over to the side of the cargo area to look through an unblocked nail hole. What's going on? Whitney asked from right behind her. I'm not sure. I think we stopped. We've been driving for about 15 minutes. We haven't traveled that far south, have we? Whitney asked. I don't think we've moved very far, Mia said. She had a feeling something was going wrong. A pit started to form in her stomach. She signaled to Whitney to quiet down. Chapter 17 It is your duty to serve this country. Your entire pre-service life gives you the strength necessary to survive the military. The harsher the world is to you, the easier your time in service will be. Being the strongest, bravest, and fastest soldier transfers those qualities over to your country. The Boy's Guide to Service So, what's your story? The trucker asked. Don't have one yet. Andrew hated this part of hitchhiking. You? Name's Scott, but you can call me Scooter if you like. Just live in the dream. Where are you from? Asked Andrew. The Navy. Best four years of my life. Wish I could have stayed in longer. My biggest mistake was leaving. Always re-enlist. Now it's just me and Carrie here. Scott patted the steering wheel. I named my truck. She's practically my wife. I'm just driving cross-country, trying to save up for a real one. I already got about $20,000 saved, and that's just in four years. I think once I hit 100000 I'm gonna start shopping. Oh, Andrew replied. You need decent money to get a decent wife. I don't know anyone willing to pay less than 20000 but I think I can do better. I'm not a bad-looking man. Scott smiled, showing his rotten teeth. If I get a nice-looking gal, maybe I can retire off my daughters. So you live in your truck? Andrew asked. He didn't want to talk about the registry. Easier to save money. Andrew's eyelids felt like they had weights attached, forcing them to close, heavy enough to make even the best-trained strongman weak. He was certain Whitney and Mia were sound asleep in the back of the truck, and cursed them. Andrew was aware of the rules for travelers. Making conversation was mandatory. How do your little buddies in the back fit into your plans? Scott asked. For a brief moment, panic struck Andrew. He stumbled before an answer came to him. I worked with them on my last job, on a farm. There were a lot of working boys. I stayed there for over a year. Those two were always getting picked on, not the brightest. I knew if I left them there, they would face constant torture. So I told them they could see me off and maybe I'd try to set them up somewhere better along the way. Andrew glanced over at Scott, who focused straight ahead on the road. Well, that's nice of you, Scott said without moving his head. There was no time for Andrew to worry about maintaining Scott's belief. A roadblock appeared up ahead. The line of vehicles ran about half a mile. Closer to the blockade, several trucks were being searched, their owners sitting with officers. What's this? Andrew asked. Hard to say, but my guess is they are looking for something. Whatever it is they're looking for, they don't want it to leave the area. That's an intense blockade. Scott stopped his truck and waited in the line with a bored look on his face. Sorry about this. We should sweep right through. Does this happen a lot? Andrew asked as nonchalantly as he could. What if they stop us and want to go through your stuff? Nope, every couple of months or so, maybe longer than that. It's annoying, but I didn't steal anything. Scott rolled down his window and spat before continuing. 
Did you? No, Andrew said quickly, not wanting to give Scott any ideas. Well then, keep your pants on. With each inch closer to the officers, Andrew's fear grew. His whole stomach turned with knots. He had no options, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. He debated knocking out Scott and using his truck to ram through the blockade. Violence usually got the quickest results, but Andrew hoped to avoid it at all costs. A rag agent knocked on the driver's window. Papers, please, he said in a dry manner. Scott pulled out his ID card and handed it over. As long as Mr. Morrissey hadn't mentioned that Andrew left the farm four hours before the girls disappeared, he would be safe. The agent handed back Scott's ID without bothering to scan it. Andrew saw this as a good sign, but the fear still overtook him. The agent leaned in and stared right at him. I'm pre-service, no ID yet, Andrew said. Reporting soon, I hope. You're looking a little old. Next month, trying to travel a bit more. You'll love it, best four years of your life, the agent responded. Andrew was growing tired of that advice. He still needed a backup plan in case they didn't pass. Andrew looked around the cab. There were no weapons. He would have to knock Scott out with his elbow. Taking out the agent would be another issue. Andrew decided he could just run him over. Andrew had his plan of attack set up in his mind. He would wait until the last minute to swing into action. Is anyone else traveling with you? The agent asked. Andrew's heart raced. It was over. Mia and Whitney wouldn't know how to respond, and it was obvious they were girls. He was preparing to make his move when Scott spoke. Just me and Andrew. Trust me, I'm hauling manure. I think if anyone tried to ride back there, they would die from the stink. Scott added, flashing a smile. Andrew was shocked Scott hadn't turned them in. He was probably too dumb to remember his other passengers or didn't want to waste time. Either way, Andrew prayed the agent didn't get suspicious. The agent did not look amused, but he didn't look particularly interested either. He pulled out a flyer and passed it over to them. Andrew recognized the girl in the photo. It was Mia. Her hair was slicked back and her face looked plain and defeated. He thought she looked natural and beautiful, with a sweet sadness in her eyes. His heart raced a little. He was sure it was from the fear of getting caught and not the sight of her. Have either of you seen this girl? If I saw a face like that, I'd remember, Scott said, handing the picture back. That's a looker. What happened to her? She get kidnapped? They're being real hush-hush about it. I'm just supposed to ask and search your truck if I think you're hiding something, the agent said. He moved his eyes up and down Scott before breaking into a grin. You guys seem trustworthy, though. Moving manure, you say? The girl's not my problem. No thanks. Go ahead. You can drive on through. Andrew felt every muscle in his body start to relax as the truck switched gears and rolled past the blockade. Sorry about not mentioning your buddies in the back. I just don't like the idea of some agent sniffing through my stuff. We'd have been stuck there for hours, Scott said. No worries, Andrew said casually, hiding any hint of gratitude. That agent wasn't too clever, you know. What do you mean? We don't have anything to hide, Andrew said, his body once again thrumming with tension. Oh, I didn't mean about us. His not searching the truck was understandable, Scott said. Just thought his comment about the girl not being his problem was a little weird. Scott paused to spit in a can. You see, his job is paid for by the registry, and that photo was a registry shot. The Midwest area makes money to pay his salary from their homegrown girls. That girl who's missing is definitely his problem, especially if she gets out of the Midwest. I never heard that before, Andrew replied. But he was starting to think Scott suspected something. Life on the road teaches you things. 
I know some people who do bounty hunting. Not me, though. The work isn't steady enough. There aren't many abducted girls worth much money these days, and rag agents are quick to find them. But I've met some guys who make a little extra on the side, Scott said. Have you ever heard of a girl just running away on her own? Andrew was thinking of Mia's threat. Heck no. They always pin it on some guy. Why would a girl run? Some people think it's a conspiracy. They like to set an example, you know, the beating and punishment the accused abductor gets. Not me, though. I just don't think a woman is smart enough to run on her own. Shaking his head, Andrew thought about Mia's belief that Mexico was only a few hours away from the Midwest area. She was certainly sheltered. He let out a big yawn. You look like you're on the brink of death, boy. Close those eyes and get some rest. I'll wake you when I get as far south as I'm going, Scott told him. Andrew knew he should stay awake and make sure Scott wasn't putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But he told himself Scott was just speaking hypothetically, and if he was going to turn them in, he would have done it at the roadblock. Besides, even if Andrew had wanted to stay awake, it was impossible. The second his eyelids closed, he drifted into immediate sleep. A constant tick, tick, tick woke Andrew. It took a moment for his confusion to pass and for him to remember where he was. The truck was parked and the sound was coming from the cooling engine. Scott was nowhere in sight. Andrew rubbed his eyes before opening the door and climbing out of the cabin. His initial guess was correct. They were parked at a rest area. The little building that housed bathrooms and some vending machines was a dead giveaway. Andrew strolled toward the building, hoping to use this opportunity to relieve himself. He wondered how long he had been out for. The sky was dark and brewing with a summer storm, making it impossible to tell. He knew it couldn't have been long. They were still surrounded by cornfields on all sides. Andrew entered the restroom. He was surprised Scott wasn't in there. He had assumed that was why they'd stopped. Andrew wasn't too worried. This place wasn't big enough for Scott to wander off too far. He splashed some cold water onto his face and went back outside. Making his way toward the truck, Andrew noticed the cargo door was propped open a little. Adrenaline filled his body as he thought about the possibilities of the current situation. His mind was overrun with the urge to protect Mia. He prayed the girls hadn't thought it was a good idea to stretch their legs and hoped Scott hadn't thought it was a good time to get a better look at his other passengers. Andrew had just reached the back of the truck and started to pull the door open, when out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a quick flannel flash. He raised his arm to defend himself, but he was too late. The last thing Andrew saw was the bat coming down on his shoulders. He crumpled to the ground as everything went black. Chapter 18 Cleanliness and hygiene should always be a priority for a female. It is next to impossible for a dirty girl to land a husband. She should keep herself as pure as possible to ensure a happy life. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia woke with a start. She thought she had heard a grunt of pain, but she was too out of it to know for sure. Her eyes adjusted to the dark cargo space, and she could see Whitney sitting up. A slit of light shone through the back door. Where? Mia started to ask before she was shushed by Whitney. Stay quiet. Something's not right. The sliver turned into an outbreak of gray light. Both girls had to shield their eyes. A large figure stepped into the truck. The light behind him made it impossible to tell who he was. Mia sat straight up and put her hand over her eyes, fearing the worst. Andrew? Whitney asked with a shiver in her voice. The outline moved closer toward them, his footsteps echoing with each stride. He was five feet from the girls when he squatted down to their eye level. Mia recognized the face of the truck driver who had picked them up. 
She relaxed a little, thankful it wasn't a rag agent. Sorry, just me, name Scott. Andrew's knocked out at the moment. Boy, was he tired. Their driver flashed a grin. Mia could see the stains on his teeth, even in the poor light. She wished he would go back to the cab and leave them alone. Why are we stopped? Mia cleared her throat, trying to make herself sound more like a man. I was trying to figure out what I should do, and over the last several hours, I decided. Might not be the world's best idea, but I think it'll meet everyone's goals, Scott said, grinning. Is dropping us off here the plan? Mia already knew the answer. Lady, you are the plan. I hope you were able to rest well. The smile never left Scott's face. I'm no lady. Mia dropped her voice several octaves and started to stand. She looked for a way to get around him. Shut it. There's no way out of here. So sit, or else I'll make you. Scott left his squatting position and towered over Mia. She lowered her body back down to the floor, knowing she couldn't take him out. You see, it's my lucky day. You two are a present. I thought something was off when I first saw you, but I didn't put it together till we crossed through that roadblock. I bet you're worth a lot of money with a large finder's fee, he signaled to Mia. They showed me your picture when your hair was long. I knew it was you right away. I thought I'd better not turn you in, though. I can't get mixed up in your scheme, getting labeled as an abductor myself. It was clear Scott was proud of himself. Mia wasn't about to give up. I have no clue what you are talking about, Mia said, her voice shaking. Scott ignored her and continued. I spent the last couple hours thinking about what I could do with you, going over every situation in my head. My admiral told me to always have an idea. I thought about taking you for myself. You've been gone a while, and we could live in hiding together. You'd give me some pretty children. He reached out toward Mia, hoping to run his hand down her face, but she pulled away. But then, I'd always be scared you would try to run, and that's no way to live. Don't be scared. I can't hurt you. I wouldn't get any money if I turned you in damaged. Hell, I'd get thrown in jail for violating something as pretty as you. He cracked his jaw and turned his gaze toward Whitney. He reached his hands out and tried to grab between her legs. She fell back and screamed before he made contact. Thank you. I had a feeling you were a girl too. Based on that scream, I know for sure now. And I bet you have nobody looking for you. I could have some fun with you and not get into a bit of trouble. Touch her and I'll kill you. Mia could feel the fire growing in her eyes as she moved to block Whitney. That sweet sisterly love. But ladies, I think I'm in control here. I am going to have some fun with your friend, then turn you in and get some reward money. Andrew! Mia started screaming at the top of her lungs. She was out of options. Scott just laughed at her. You can't wake him because he's almost dead. I left him lying under the truck. I'll kill him in a little bit. Act like I was saving you from him, your abductor. But I gotta make sure the time of death sinks up. See, if I killed him now, how would I explain the time gap? Plus, I always enjoy a good rough and tumble. Scott grabbed Whitney by the forearm and yanked her toward him. Mia lunged forward, trying to protect her friend, but was met with Scott's other hand. He pushed her against the wall. Stay, Scott said with a grin. He turned and began dragging Whitney out toward the doors of the truck. She reached out for Mia, but Mia was too stunned to react. They were almost out the door when Mia started running toward them. All of a sudden, Scott dropped Whitney's arm and stumbled out of the truck, falling to the ground. Mia hurried to the edge and wrapped her arms around Whitney. She held Whitney as she peered out the door, watching the scene play out on the ground below. Andrew was raising what looked like a bat and swinging it down with full force. 
Each blow created a sick, crushing sound. Andrew was talking to himself with intensity. You think you're going to kill me? Blood was flying onto Andrew's clothes and the back of the truck with each swing of the bat. He looked wild. Whitney cried and looked away, but Mia couldn't take her eyes off Andrew. With each smack of the bat, he grew more intense. After a few minutes, it was difficult to tell if Scott had ever had a face. Mia couldn't take any more and screamed for Andrew to stop. Dazed, he looked up and saw the girls. It was clear they were the farthest thing from his mind. His breathing was rapid. It dawned on Mia that this killing wasn't a protective measure. It was revenge for Scott's assault on Andrew. However, no matter the rationale, Mia was grateful. She let go of Whitney and climbed out of the truck. She glanced at what was left of Scott. There was no possible way he was alive. Andrew's breathing began to slow down to a normal pace. He tossed the bat on the ground and started to walk toward the small building. He looked insane as the blood dripped down his face. Mia stood speechless. She noticed the weapon wasn't a baseball bat, but a tree branch. It made the killing seem even more ruthless somehow. She looked at the body and knew it couldn't be left here like this. She wasn't sure whether it was safer to hide Scott in the corn or put him back in the truck. Either way, sitting here wasn't going to do much. Whitney, grab some fertilizer bags and empty them. We're going to need to move this, Mia said, still not taking her eyes off the corpse. Chapter 19 Technology Leads to an Oversimplified Life Post-service, it is important that you use only government-approved devices. The Boy's Guide to Service Again, let me offer my condolences. We will have your wife home before the day is over. Leonard, the senior regional agent, was apologizing again. And as for Agent Jeffrey's conduct toward you earlier, he meant no disrespect. Calm down, you'll give yourself a heart attack. Grant smiled into the rearview mirror and gave Agent Jeffries, who was cradling his arm in a sling, a wink, much to the agent's chagrin. Grant tapped the dashboard as Leonard drove. Remember, boys, I am in charge, and I doubt we'll find her tonight. She's already been gone for almost 48 hours. The longer she's gone, the harder she'll be to find. Sir, you have our full team at your disposal for anything you need. We are confident she couldn't have gone far, replied Leonard. The SUV slowed to a stop along the interstate. The four men piled out of the car. Jeffries and the other low-level agent did not look happy about taking orders from Grant. Grant didn't really want their help, anyway. He was happy to do this on his own. He just wanted their resources, and he didn't mind showing off his skill set. Leonard was an older man, tall and thin with no hair. He was also used to giving orders, not taking them. The car was found abandoned about 25 feet into the crops, said Leonard, as he signaled for the group to start walking. Giddy, Grant rubbed his hands together as he made his way through the corn. Part of him hoped she had gotten farther away and would make the hunt more difficult. The tracks and the crops led straight to the car. Grant circled the vehicle. You think she drove it in here by accident? One of the agents asked. Grant didn't bother to respond. He kept circling the car, looking in through the windows, at the ground, and at the crushed corn stalks. My, my, a worthy adversary. I must say I am surprised, Grant said. So she ran the car off the road. Since she didn't know how to drive, I can't believe she kept it on the road long, Jeffrey said. I'm satisfied, Grant said as he started walking back toward their vehicle. The three agents followed close in tow. Don't you want to look a little more? You didn't even go into the car, Jeffrey said, not impressed with Grant at all. I saw everything I need to see, replied Grant curtly. 
I'm going to call in and have a forensic team sent down here. Maybe they can tell us something. Leonard reached for his phone. You would waste your department's money, Grant said. But suit yourself. Well, why don't you just tell us what you figured out? Jeffries asked. He did little to hide the smugness in his tone. Grant was happy to accept his invitation. He stopped in the midst of the corn and turned toward his audience. All three of them were uncomfortable in their black suits, the standard rag uniform. But Grant was dressed sensibly. He had opted for a lime green polo with navy blue shorts, casual yet cool. He enjoyed making them sweat, but not nearly as much as he enjoyed showing off. One person was in this car when it was dropped. The door that was open in the field was the driver's side door. Since we know there are two girls traveling together, the car was a dump. The gas gauge was on empty, but those girls were smart enough to try to hide it. We know they were heading south, and this car was deserted a long time ago. Even if she were walking, she would have made it past our radius by now. So I'd stop the roadblocks. Sir, it is policy not to release a picture to the public until an abductor has been identified. We can't put it out there that she just ran away. It's not worth the backlash of other girls thinking they could run. So, without the roadblocks, there's no way to get the word out, Leonard said. Tell me something. Are you married? Grant asked. Or, at the least, do you know anything about women? All three agents stared at Grant, confused. Two little girls who have just ventured into the big bad world are not going to leave each other's side. At least not at this point in the game. So why would one of them get out of the car while the other drove into the corn? Maybe one was scared of the bugs and muck in the fields, Jeffrey said. More scared than she would be sitting on the side of a highway alone? Grant asked. Nobody responded. Gentlemen, I think these young ladies have some help. I think they both waited on the road while someone junked the car for them. You got all this from some bent cornstalk by one of the doors? Jeffrey said. I'm just not buying it. That and the fact that the seat was slid all the way back. Grant did a jogging backward motion, trying to make light of the other's stupidity. Neither of those girls would have been able to reach the pedals. Furthermore, the car's owner, Mr. Morrissey, is not tall enough to have the seat set that far back. Someone taller said it that way. Grant did not wait for a response. He skipped to the SUV and slid into the front seat. With some hesitation, the other agents got inside. Alert the closest agents. Tell them to look out for three individuals. We need to head back to the Morrissey farmhouse. I think David has some explaining to do, Grant ordered. Grant's devilish eyes flashed as the car turned around and headed north. His thoughts raced with pleasure at the prospect of getting information out of the old man. He hoped he might be required to use force. Chapter 20 Married life is luxurious. Wives are surrounded by love and affection and need only worry themselves with pleasing their husbands. If a wife commits herself to that goal, she will never have a care in the world. The Registry Guide for Girls For the first time in days, Mia became aware of how bad she smelled. She was sure it was from the sweat and travel and not just the stink of the manure. She rolled the fertilizer body bag all the way to the back of the truck, picked up her and Whitney's bags, and jumped down, slamming the back door. She did her best to clean up the scene of the crime, but the trickles of blood were still visible on the gravel of the parking lot. It would have been easier if she had some help. She gave Whitney a dirty look, but was faced with her back. There was nothing to do about it now. There was no point in dwelling on it. She walked toward Whitney, who was sitting on a log, looking out over the landscape. Mia dropped the bags and had a seat. I didn't sign up for this. People dying. Whitney's voice quivered. 
better him than us. He wasn't a good person. Mia was unsure how to comfort her. We knew we'd run into problems. Did you know Andrew could do that? I never thought he was scary, Whitney said. Mia bit her lip. She didn't want to worry about a split in her team. Whitney was not familiar with violence. She regretted not telling Whitney about Karina's article when she had the chance. Maybe then she would have understood the situation better. She decided if she told her now, the story would seem forced and Whitney might not believe her. Mia looked down and noticed the blood all over her shirt and hands, which was also mixed with bits of fertilizer. She assumed she made a convincing boy now. Did you bring a change of clothes? Mia asked as she stood. We need to change. You're almost as gross as I am. Whitney didn't stir. Instead, she just stared off. Mia did not feel like dealing with this right now. She rose and started walking toward the parking lot. Put it out of your mind. He's dead, she said to Whitney. Whitney gave Mia a scowl, but she did stand up. As the girls made their way toward the building, a shock of lightning lit up the sky and the rain came pouring down. It fell with such force that Mia thought it would take off her skin as well as the grime. Neither of them attempted to get out of the storm, using the weather to bathe instead. Mia scrubbed her arm and watched the mud and blood slide to the ground. Even Whitney seemed to relax a little with the shower. After both girls felt cleaner, they moved back under the trees. Now what? Whitney asked. Now we wait for Andrew. Is he still in there? Asked Whitney. I think so. I didn't see him come out. Shouldn't we get out of here? Not without him. I think we need to leave. He is dangerous. This is a bad idea. We'll be better off on our own. Let's go, Whitney said urgently. Not without him. Mia wasn't about to change her stance. Did you see what I just saw? How he killed that man? What's to stop him from hurting us? Whitney choked back tears. He was protecting us. He is the best shot we have at Mexico, and I am not going to abandon him. Mia's voice was stern. He was not protecting us. He killed that guy because he wanted to. It was just our luck we benefited from it, too. He was going to hurt you. Andrew saved you. Aren't you grateful? Whitney stared at the ground before she spoke. This is too much for me to handle. I'm glad I'm okay, but I've never seen someone in such a rage before. He is dangerous. And that rage wasn't because I was about to be violated. It was because that man hurt Andrew. Well, it wasn't directed at us, and I'm not leaving him. Fine. Whitney threw her arms up, still not seeing Mia's side. Mia didn't think Andrew would hurt either of them, but she did realize he was capable of doing so. Karina popped back up in her mind. She wished Andrew would have beaten William the same way he had taken care of the trucker. Then maybe her sister would be alive and traveling with them. Whitney didn't understand those feelings yet. If you won't leave him, at least go and get him, Whitney nudged Mia. No. We'll wait a while. I think he might need some space. Mia saw the fear and concern on Whitney's face. She realized why she couldn't comfort her friend. Mia was not afraid or concerned. Scott's death was incidental to her plans. She shuddered when the cold thought crossed her mind. Her desire to escape was costing her her humanity. Chapter 21 Your time and service will prove your worth as a human being. The harder you fight, the more worthy you are of calling yourself a citizen of this wondrous nation and reaping her rewards. The Boy's Guide to Service Andrew splashed the cold water over his face. He opened his eyes and saw that the sink was turning pink with Scott's blood. He gripped the edge of the basin so tightly he thought he might crack the porcelain off. The anger was building up again. Andrew felt it rushing to the surface. How could he have been so stupid? 
Mia and Whitney were having an effect on him. Seeing their friendship was clouding his judgment. It was making him too trusting. He never should have fallen asleep. It was his fault the girls were almost attacked. He put his hand to the back of his head. They weren't the only ones who were facing threats. He felt a big bump under his mess of hair, but it didn't seem like the skin was broken. The only blood on his body was from the trucker. His thoughts turned back to Scott and how Andrew had let the hatred spew out of his body as he beat the man over and over again with the branch. The sickening crack of Scott's skull replayed in Andrew's ear till he couldn't take it. Andrew ran to the toilet and his stomach heaved. When its contents left his body, he let himself slide to the floor. His mind started to clear. His only goal was to keep Mia and Whitney safe, and he was failing. Not only were they close to danger, but it was because of Andrew. He was getting too close to them. He needed to push all personal concerns away. Keeping his distance was what would keep them all safe. Mia and Whitney trusted each other, and he had wanted to experience trust too, mistakenly putting it in Scott. He needed to do a better job protecting the girls, and that could be accomplished by their staying strangers. He didn't understand why this was so hard for him. He'd never had difficulty avoiding relationships or friendships. It was how he'd survived this long. He wanted to know more about them and to tell them about him, but it didn't make any sense. He needed to focus, just get them to safety and then report for duty. Andrew was surprised by the way Mia had tried to help Whitney. He would have expected her to cower in the corner, but instead she had chased after her friend. She hadn't even looked phased when she needed to tell Andrew to stop the beating. He liked her strength. Whitney, on the other hand, didn't seem to be faring as well. Andrew feared her opinion of him had altered. He tried not to care. The sink dripped, sending echoes of the tiny splashes around the whole room. Andrew closed his eyes and thought back to the school he was raised in. The building had been dilapidated, and water always made its way through the ceiling whenever it rained. Sometimes it landed on his mattress, and the other boys teased him that he had wet the bed. He always let their taunts roll off his back. He had known even as a kid not to care what others thought or said about him. He reminded himself that nothing had changed. Chapter 22 It is customary for a husband to lavish his wife with gifts. The better the wife is, the more her beloved will adorn her. But it is important to remember the best gift a husband gives is that of his undying devotion. The Registry Guide for Girls The rain turned to drizzle, and the girls' lips started turning blue. To combat the cold, they each tried to twist the water out of their clothes. Both agreed it was stupid to change into a fresh set, as it would just get wet again. Mia had not been able to get the blood out of her baggy top. The effects were less gruesome, but still obvious. Between her clothes and Whitney's black eye, it looked like the two had been fighting. Both girls were on edge when Andrew reappeared. They whipped their heads toward him when he walked out of the small building. His hair was wet and slicked back. He looked as if he had showered and had a new set of clothes on, plain dark blue jeans that were a bit too big, and a black t-shirt. He walked over to them as if nothing had happened. Did anyone see you? No, Mia answered. We kept watch. Nobody even came close to this place. Did you move him? Mia nodded her head. You didn't have to kill him, Whitney said. You're both going to get sick if you don't change. Andrew ignored Whitney's comment as he walked toward the cab of the truck. He did what he had to do, to protect you, Mia said to Whitney. You can't think that the trucker's life was more valuable than yours. Whitney nodded, but the look of concern stayed on her face. Mia felt for her friend. Whitney had been attacked, but she had lived. She needed to move on and forget the incident. Mia lightly squeezed her friend's shoulder 
and walked toward Andrew, who was now in the front seat. Are we taking the ride? Mia hoped she didn't need to drag the body out. She was kicking herself for not throwing it in the field. No. Andrew was flipping through the glove box and searching the rest of the cab. He pulled out a couple pieces of clothing and a small felt blanket from the sleeper section. What are you doing then? Mia asked. Trying to see what we can use. Andrew stood on the seat and looked in the overhead storage space. Do you have room in your bags? Mia nodded. She had space and assumed Whitney did too. At least change your shirts. Andrew tossed two shirts toward the girls. Mia thought these tops smelled worse than the bloodied fertilizer one she had on now. But they both put them on. Mia noticed Whitney had wrapped her chest down, making her figure less noticeable. Again, she marveled at the resourcefulness of her friend. Lucky enough for Mia, she was not as well endowed and didn't have much cause for worry in that respect. She looked at the gross blue shirt she'd pulled on. It had a picture of an eagle on it. Whitney now wore a black one that read, sit on it in red lettering. Mia found the saying weird and wondered what it meant. Andrew jumped out of the cab, handed Mia a blanket to stuff in her bag, and threw a pair of shoes at Whitney. Stuff socks in there until they fit, Andrew said. Where is he? We took care of it, Mia said. The blanket and clothes are nice, but I was hoping to find his money. It might be in his pockets, so I need to see the body. Mia reached into her bag and pulled out the man's wallet. She tossed it to Andrew, who removed the cash and threw the rest on the front seat. He counted the money without acknowledging Mia's forethought. She was annoyed he hadn't noticed. What happened to you? Whitney asked. You're a thief now? Great, I'm with a killer and a thief. It was clear Whitney was on the verge of a panic attack. Mia knew she had to bring her friend back to reality, but she was running short on patience. Again, he was a bad person, or would you have rather been assaulted? We are one step closer to finding your gorgeous husband who will love you and treat you right, or would you rather be the one in the body bag? Mia stepped closer to Whitney and grabbed her arm. Mia could feel the intensity flowing out of herself. We do what we have to. And right now, we have to leave. Andrew picked up his sack and started walking. Mia followed as Whitney gave in, slid her feet into the new shoes, and caught up. He walked back toward the small building, right up to a glass case. Bracing his elbow, he smashed the case open and pulled a map off the wall. He glanced at it before folding it up and sliding it into his bag. The group walked, all spaced ten feet apart, down the ramp back toward the highway. Mia was shocked how close to the road they were. The terrain looked the same as it had near her home. She wondered where they were and what they were going to do next. But she was still confident in Andrew's ability to lead. Chapter 23 To a certain extent, men are expected to govern themselves. This includes dispensing punishment to those who have wronged one. A victim always has the option of sentencing the perpetrator of the crime to private punishment. The Boy's Guide to Service Patience was Grant's key to winning. He believed everything he had accomplished was due to his ability to wait. But even he had a breaking point. Whenever he felt his tolerance being tested, he was likely to snap. David was the newest victim. You keep repeating yourself. You keep saying that there was nobody who could have helped her escape. Yet I know this isn't true. So either you are trying to protect someone or you are stupid. Which is it? Grant sat with his legs crossed as he questioned his father-in-law. He wiggled his foot back and forth to lessen the tension in the room. David sat behind his mahogany desk. It was clear he had not been expecting Grant's visit, as piles of money were laid out in front of him. Grant wondered if it was from Mia's fee, but doubted David would keep that much cash from a check. Plus, 
David would still have to give the government their 25% cut. He figured it was the farm's earnings. Why are you speaking to me with such disrespect? David asked. He sounded angry. I know you are frustrated with the situation, but as you pointed out, she is no longer my problem. I have told you everything I know. In fact, I have told you twice now. I apologize. I mean you no disrespect, sir. Grant placed a strong emphasis on his words. But I am not getting through to you. We must find some way to make you understand. I understand, David said. David continued to babble on, but Grant was no longer listening. He pulled out his nine millimeter and held it on his knee. This shut David up. Did you know people are less likely to fight back when someone pulls a knife on them instead of a gun? I always found this strange, because a gun can do so much more damage so much more quickly. David gulped as Grant rose and walked to the other side of the desk. He placed the gun against the back of David's head. Now, let's start again, he said as he cocked the weapon. Nobody helped her. I swear, I don't know anything, David said. His voice was shaking. Grant was getting frustrated with the situation. He moved his lips from a frown to a smile as he thought of what to do next. I could end your life right now, but I'm not going to. You know why? Because it would not benefit me. I would gain nothing by your death. However, I need to find something that will motivate you to talk to me. Grant lowered the gun so it was right next to David's ear and fired down, straight into a small pile of money. Bits of green paper flew everywhere. David covered his ear and howled in pain. Grant wasn't sure if he had nicked David's leg or not, but he didn't care. He fired two more quick shots into the piles. All you seem to care about is money. You sold your daughter, your own flesh and blood, without even utilizing the mandatory waiting period to check me out. You knew me less than a week before agreeing. I bet right now you still don't even care about her. Grant grinned as he walked back to the front of the desk. Now, I'm going to give you about ten seconds to tell me who could have helped her before I fire again. Think hard. Fear coursed through David. As Grant counted down from ten, he raised his voice and pointed his gun toward the desk. If David hadn't been shot yet, he was sure to take a bullet this time. One. Grant cocked the gun. A boy. One of my workers. He left earlier in the night, around five o'clock, David screamed. I don't think he had anything to do with it. He was dependable and he had no contact with her. It couldn't be him. A cold smile crept across Grant's face as he lowered his gun. He didn't put it away yet. He wanted to make sure David didn't feel safe. Grant didn't want his well of information to dry up yet. That wasn't so hard, was it? Now, tell me everything about this boy. Grant sat back down and crossed his legs again. Chapter 24 The joy a bride feels is indescribable. She will earn the admiration of her family and the undying love of her husband. Her life has come full circle, and she is capable of enjoying all the pleasures the world has to offer. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia wished she had a better understanding of travel and distance. It felt like they had been walking for miles, but she had no clue how far along they were. The trio was still spaced apart as they trudged through the corn rows. Andrew didn't walk on the road, and both girls followed his lead. Mia wasn't sure what the point of this move was, because she thought the shaking stalks drew more attention than just some random boys on the road would. The rain stopped, but the sun never reappeared. Mia's sweatpants started to dry a little, but hung on her like extra weight. 
The moisture from the crops didn't help the situation as she tried to fight off the shivers. When Andrew turned off the main highway, Mia felt hopeful that they might rest soon. A sign directed them toward the town of Schuyler, two miles away. Mia thought of a task that might bring Whitney out of her slump. Mathwiz, Mia asked, if we're two miles away from a town, could you figure out how long it takes us to walk a mile? Mia wanted to distract her friend, but she was also curious about their speed. Whitney showed a slight smile and nodded her head. Mia was worried about her friend. Her eyes still held a bit of terror. Mia just wished she would stop misdirecting it toward Andrew. The rows of corn ended, and Andrew began walking back toward a patch of trees. Mia sighed, as this meant it was time to rest, making her project for Whitney pointless. She made an apologetic face toward her, and Whitney nodded in understanding. Thunder sounded, and the wind picked up, sending chills down Mia's spine and reminding her of the need for rest. She hoped they would make it to the trees before the rain picked up again. Just as they reached the sprawling branches of a group of maples, the rain came. While some drops made it through the leaves, they were safe from major rainfall. Mia dropped her sack and leaned against the tree. Whitney was running toward them, tripping in the rain. Mia didn't realize she had fallen behind. She expected her to be angry, but instead, Whitney looked tired and defeated as she peeled off her wet clothes, pulled out a blanket, and wrapped it around herself. It was surprising to see Whitney so uninhibited. Mia couldn't believe she would just undress in front of Andrew. Then Mia glanced around and noticed Andrew was nowhere in sight. She stood and started to circle the tree. He could not have gone far. There were only about four or five trees grouped together. Endless cornfields loomed ahead. Andrew was walking between the maples, staring at the ground. He looked almost as if he was pacing. Mia thought he must still have been upset about the day's activities. She wanted to comfort him and thank him, but wasn't sure he would appreciate the gesture. Then she noticed he was not just pacing. He was looking for sticks. She turned back toward their packs and saw that Whitney was fast asleep, using her bag as a pillow. Mia picked up the strewn-about clothes and hung them up on low branches, hoping they would dry out. She lifted her pack and Andrew's as well, trying to make sure they stayed out of the water. She wondered if Andrew had a blanket in his pack or if they would be forced to share the one Andrew had stolen for her. She felt herself blush at this idea. She didn't know what was coming over her. The difference between the two bags was noticeable. Andrew's was stuffed tightly and professionally. Mia's was tiny and empty. She scolded herself for thinking Andrew wouldn't have a blanket in there. He had everything. Shaking her head, she unzipped her bag and pulled out two empty water bottles. Walking out past the branches, she stuck them in the ground, hoping they would collect some rainwater. Andrew was back and stacking up the sticks he had collected. He placed the smaller ones on the bottom and made sure the bigger ones were not crushing them. She wanted to help, but knew she would only get in the way and make it harder for him. I hope this works, Andrew said. I was having a hard time finding dry wood. When it rains, things get wet. Mia cringed as the words left her mouth. She wanted to have a useful anecdote to add, but she had no clue wet wood wouldn't burn. She didn't know how to get a fire going. Survival 101 was never part of her mother's curriculum. How are you going to start it? Standard procedure is with a mirror, but there's no sun out, so I'll have to use an emergency match. Andrew didn't look up as he opened his bag. Mia was surprised Andrew had thought to bring matches, and then she remembered his departure was planned. He hadn't left in a hurry with no clue what he was heading into. She began to focus on his pack and wondered what else was in there. She was curious about whether he had food. Her stomach let out a long, low growl at the thought of sustenance. Almost everything she had taken from home was gone, 
and she hadn't eaten a real meal in days. We should take inventory of our supplies, she said. I don't think that's necessary. The nature trail part of our journey is almost over. He threw a match at the bottom of the pile of sticks and used his hand as a fan. It looked more like a smoke cloud than a fire. What do you mean? I didn't think we were close to the border. It dawned on Mia that they could be, though. She still wasn't sure how long it would take to get to Mexico, and she had fallen asleep in the back of that truck. We're still in the Midwest area. Heading to the southeast area, though, less than halfway to Mexico from your home, Andrew replied. It was your home, too. Mia looked into his eyes. I guess, Andrew shrugged. Your father was good to me. How do you know? Mia asked. Did you have anything else to compare his treatment to? Yes. Andrew's jaw clenched. I understand why you don't want to marry that man, though. Thank you, Mia replied. Mia took comfort in his conversation. She had a feeling the days when she wasn't allowed to ask questions were over. The smoke flickered and a fire sprang up. She could feel the warmth and edged closer. Andrew pulled off his shirt and hung it by Whitney's clothes. Next came his pants and socks. Mia was shocked at how muscular he was. Just because he was thin did not mean he wasn't fit. He looked down at her and realized she was staring. She looked away, embarrassed, focusing on the flames to hide her red face. He changed into fresh clothes and sat down by the fire, bringing a small bag with him. You should change too. You'll get sick sitting in those, he said, as he opened the bag and fished out some dried meat. Mia had never seen something that looked so delicious in all her life. The salty beef almost made a snap as he bit into it. You can change right here if you want to. I already saw you almost naked in that black dress. He raised an eyebrow. Mia laughed a little, happy he was displaying a sense of humor. Making jokes now, are we? She walked toward the trunk of the tree and stripped. She wondered if he was looking at her, but was too shy to check. She opened her pack but didn't have a change of pants. The extra t-shirt was on the top, followed by the blanket. She pulled out the rough gray blanket and wrapped it around her waist. It was small and went down only to the middle of her calves, but she had little choice. At the bottom was her leftover food, a few cookies she had stolen from the kitchen. She sighed as she pulled them out and returned to the fire. That dress was beautiful, by the way, she said. I might not buy into the system, but I still know a beautiful gown when I see one. I guess, Andrew shrugged. Once she sat back down, she caught Andrew's eyes. He was staring at her and turned away awkwardly. Mia smiled, thinking they were even for the moment. She pulled out a cookie and ate in silence. Andrew continued to snack on his meat, focusing on the flames. Cookie? Mia asked. Andrew shook his head, but broke off a piece of his jerky and handed it over. Thank you, Mia said. Andrew just nodded. Mia wondered if he knew she was thanking him for more than the food. Her inquisitive nature was getting the better of her, and she wanted to get him talking. Have you ever killed a person before? She asked. An uncomfortable look crossed his face. He took a deep breath and exhaled. Yes. Why? Because I had to, he said. There was no pride in his voice. It's a hard world. If you don't defend yourself and you're not ready to attack, it could be you that's dead. Both of them sat in silence, watching the flames dance, listening as some rain fell through and hissed as it hit the fire. Mia knew this topic was closed, but she wanted to keep him talking. Do you know why the registry exists? She asked. Andrew gave her a confused look. Do you know the history? Why we live the way we do? He sighed and looked away. 
In school, they didn't cover much. They just tell you it exists everywhere. But that's not true. I've heard stories. America is powerful and respected because of its armed services. We have the best in the world by far. A few hundred years ago, there was a great war. Back then, all countries fought with each other all the time. Our army was all volunteers and not enough men were stepping up. So they made it mandatory that all men had to enlist. We won the war right away. Things went back to peacetime, but the government kept the enlistment requirement. Now we dominate and end all wars. I thought we used to be little countries, then we merged together. Mia was thinking back to Whitney's story. Not really countries, just smaller territories, Andrew responded. How do you know that? I don't, it's just what I've heard, he said casually. This was the most Mia had ever heard him speak. She was intrigued for multiple reasons. That's just about mandatory enlistment. What about the registry? And why do people give up their sons? She wanted to know more. The origin doesn't matter. There is always fighting and war in the world. You're lucky you're protected from it. That's my job, to go out and face it. No matter who the enemy is, as a country, we need to fight them. Mandatory enlistment lets America stay on top. And if the registry is a part of that system, it must be good. So the registry fuels mandatory enlistment? Mia was confused. No, I mean, I don't know. But they both exist here, and mandatory service is a good thing. It was obvious that Andrew had never concerned himself with thoughts of the registry. Mia wished he had more information. Can't mothers raise their sons until enlistment time? I guess. But why would they? Sons are a waste of money. Mia was surprised that Andrew thought of himself as a waste of money. She couldn't think that raising someone was a bad investment. What was the Great War about? Mia hoped to keep him talking. It seemed like the military was a favorite topic of his. What wars are always about? Power and money. What about love? Mia looked, wide-eyed, at Andrew. She didn't know much on the subject, but it seemed a powerful force. She always thought she would love her husband at first sight. It was her duty. Now the idea seemed absurd. She doubted romantic love existed, but there was still room for the feeling in her life. Glancing at Whitney, she felt love between the two of them, and the feelings would have been enough to drive her to war. She wondered if she and Andrew would ever develop that bond. Her eyes ran up and down his form, and she felt a shiver run through her. But she pushed the idea out of her mind. She was not escaping to form more friendships. Andrew laughed. It was at her expense, but she was glad to see him smile. He didn't understand the emotion and shook his head in disbelief. Rather than embarrass herself more, Mia changed the subject. Where are we going next? If the nature portion of this trip is over. Traveling this way isn't going to work. It's too risky and it would take too long. We are going to get jobs until we make enough to get on a train to the border. How do we get jobs? Mia didn't think she would be good at much. Andrew winced with annoyance. Mia realized she knew nothing about the world outside her father's farm, and the answer to each question she asked was common knowledge. He must have felt like he was traveling with a baby. We are going into town. We'll wait until someone needs workers for some odd jobs. There is a bar that was marked as a good place to find work. Have you been there before? Mia asked. No. Then how do you know it's a good place for work? Because. Ugh, Mia groaned in frustration. If you were just better at explaining things, we wouldn't have to go through this every time I ask a question. Andrew remained still, chewing on his food. Mia couldn't tell whether he was going to snap or answer her. At that rest stop, the map I took. On the glass, someone, another kid probably, 
marked this bar as a good place to find work. So I thought we'd go check it out. Oh. Mia was happy he had responded. But now she had more questions. How many kids are traveling the country? A lot, I guess. Pretty much every boy under 19. I've been out here since I was about 13, and I've never run into the same one twice. Do you miss your parents? She asked. I can't miss what I never knew. I thought you said 13. Mia assumed that meant he was 13 when they kicked him out. I was raised in a school for boys in the Midwest area, a few hours from your farm in a big city. The government releases you when you're around 13. They give you six years to toughen up before service. My parents got rid of me when I was one day old. Besides, if parents keep their sons, the boys won't be hard enough to survive service. It's really mercy, throwing them out. Mia couldn't believe abandoning a child was an act of mercy. She didn't feel ready to battle Andrew on his ideals, though. You're almost 19? Mia asked. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know my birthday, but the date they give you to report for duty is based on when you exited school. I'm somewhere between 18 and 19. It had never occurred to her that the world was so harsh on boys. She knew young men traveled around before service time. Her father always had a staff full of them on the farm. She had thought they were runaways or special cases. She'd had no idea there were so many abandoned sons. It doesn't bother me. I'm stronger and tougher, and I'll have a better chance at surviving service and getting a good placement, too, replied Andrew. She didn't believe that being tossed out didn't bother him. Her heart ached. He had been raised to believe his life was worthless. He wasn't even important enough to know his birthday. She felt an urge to hug him and tell him that she cared about him and he was valuable to her. The feelings growing inside her put her on edge, and she decided not to push the issue any farther. What about your name? Andrew? What about it? Who named you? And what about your last name? There's just a database, a rotation of names. It was assigned to me when I was young. My last name right now? It's CMW1408. Your last name has numbers in it? Mia was confused. Once I'm discharged, I'll earn the right to choose my own last name. That's when I'll be deserving of a citizen's name. Again, Mia was shocked at the lack of affection and comfort awarded Andrew. Stop with that look. Don't feel bad for me. Do you know what name you'll pick? Something that starts with a Z. Andrew Zap. Andrew Zoop. I like the A-Z combo. Zoop? Mia laughed. That's not even a word. It doesn't have to be a word. Just pronounceable. I'll be the only Zoop in the country. Andrew closed his eyes and leaned back on his elbows. Mia thought it was sad that he was so happy being alone. Even when he could choose a name, he wanted one that nobody would share. He showed no desire to form a community. She couldn't understand how nothing bothered him, but didn't think she'd figure it out tonight. Hey, why did we stop here tonight? The town isn't far. We could have made it, Mia asked. It's not safe to go to work spots at night. Andrew responded. Mia glanced around and noticed how dark it was. She wished she knew the time. Something as simple as the time could be so valuable, but she supposed it didn't matter. She let out a large yawn and pulled the blanket closer. Andrew walked over to his pack and pulled out something rolled up. He flopped it out, unveiling a large sleeping bag. He unzipped it and started to crawl in. Mia dropped to her side and tried to curl up under the blanket as much as possible, turning herself into a tiny ball. She knew she should have grabbed her pack to use as a pillow, but the thought of standing up right now was too much for her. She shivered as a breeze blew through. Good night, Andrew said. 
Mia selfishly wished he would have offered to trade beds, but knew why he didn't. She imagined climbing under his blanket and getting closer to him, but quickly forced the thought from her mind. She felt her face grow warm as his breathing steadied. Her thoughts remained with him, though, her savior. Thank you, she said in a soft whisper, before sliding into sleep. Chapter 25 If the wronged party does not want private punishment upon government intervention, the punishment for crimes committed may include, but is not limited to, imprisonment, mandatory re-enlistment, or death. The Boy's Guide to Service The rocking chair moved back and forth with a loud creak. Grant gazed down the long driveway as the sun rose behind the house, illuminating the landscape. He thought one day he might get used to this, find it relaxing, but not today. The black SUV turned down the drive, Grant had picked his in-law's house as a meeting place. He assumed David wouldn't mind. Grant chuckled to himself as he stood on the porch and looked at the waiting agents. The three men stepped out of the vehicle in their standard black uniforms. Grant had decided to go for orange plaid shorts and a yellow polo today. Gentlemen, I trust you had a relaxing evening, Grant said as he met them. Jeffries and the other young agent grumbled something, but Leonard smiled as he shook Grant's hand. He was the only one who understood what Grant was capable of, and with that knowledge came a level of respect. My wife has been missing for over 72 hours. I am not pleased that she is not home in my loving arms, Grant said, using his hands to mime strangulation. Why do you care about her? It sounds like you want to kill her anyway, Jeffries asked. Grant was growing tired of the man's attitude. She's my wife. I have the legal right to punish her for disobeying me. Why don't you care? She could become a blotch on your record, Mr. Recovery of Abducted Girls Agent, Grant replied. He understood Jeffries' lack of enthusiasm. It was rare for a girl to run these days. Grant doubted if Jeffries had ever had a case that wasn't open and shut. Grant's bride had fared better than anticipated. I learned some news. We do have an abductor, Grant said. That's fantastic. We can go full-scale public with this now, get their pictures all across the country. Who took her? Leonard was so eager. Don't get too excited. I don't want to release his name or image yet. Besides. I don't have a picture, just a description. That's the best way to find her. We can get a sketch artist to draw him. She'll make front page news everywhere, Jeffrey said. Yes, and then they will disappear. Right now, he doesn't think he is in any danger. If he continues to go out in public, we may be able to spot him. We release his image, he goes into hiding. Grant knew they didn't agree with his plan. He is my best chance at finding her, and I don't want to spook him. The other agents looked confused. Do I have to explain everything? Grant placed his hands on his hips. He is young, pre-service, and about three weeks away from his enlistment date. I'm going to put a hit on his name in the system. If we don't have her in three weeks, he enlists, and boom, I've got them. Or we could just release his picture and someone will find him, Agent Jeffrey said. I have to agree with the boys on this one, Mr. Marsden. You could have your wife home for dinner tonight if we go public with this, Leonard said. Gentlemen, gentlemen, do you have no appreciation for the hunt? For the excitement? I haven't felt this alive in years. I will catch her, with the help of my team. If, for whatever reason, I can't catch her... I have a safety net. The boy reports for duty and I pick her up then, Grant explained. It's a waste of government resources, Jeffrey said. Watch your tone, young man. You fail to realize that I am one of the people who gives the government most of its resources, Grant said. Leonard looked back at his agents and nodded. 
a chopping sound in the sky grew closer, circling the men. A strong wind kicked up, swirling dust and debris around them, as a helicopter landed in the backyard. This is why I wanted to meet at this spot one last time. There's enough room for landing, Grant said over the roar of the propellers. Don't worry, it's from my own private collection, he added, winking at Jeffries. The engine died and the noise began to subside. The whole farm was up now, staring in awe at Grant's favorite toy. Agent Jeffries, would you like to accompany me? We have something to check out. Grant walked toward the chopper. Leonard, you and your boy go by car and meet us at the truck stop a few hours south. I sent the location to your phone. We should be finished by the time you get there. Grant jogged to the helicopter. A reluctant Jeffries followed him and climbed in. Just because he wanted a challenge didn't mean he had to fight fair. The helicopter was the top of the line, and they would be there in well under an hour. Grant insisted on flying. He left the original pilot on the ground. He hoped Agent Jeffries would enjoy the flight. Please, try to lift us off, Grant spoke through the headset to Jeffries. I don't know how to fly, Jeffries smirked at the suggestion. Grant batted his eyelashes and signaled to the dashboard. There were minimal buttons and gears, and a simple joystick in the middle of the front seat served as the steering device. This is one of my prototypes, a light, fast, easy-to-fly chopper. Grant stared at Jeffries. It's designed for ease of use. A monkey could figure it out. Give it a try. The agent's interest was piqued. He grabbed the joystick and pulled back. The helicopter lifted up into the air. Grant watched as Jeffrey's face brightened. This is pretty cool. He moved the stick toward the right, turning the helicopter in a circle. I wouldn't know how to land it, though. That is the tricky part. Don't worry, I'll take us down. Anyone sitting in the front can fly it. How many people can fit in here? Jeffries didn't bother looking to the back. He kept his eye on the sky. There's room for four, but this is a prototype. I wouldn't put in more than three. The more weight, the slower it goes. We'll be there soon then? Jeffries was relaxed, growing comfortable with flying. I'll be there soon. We've probably already flown 30 miles or so, said Grant. This is the way to travel, Jeffries smiled broadly. We're not vacationing. We're working. Did you forget, Jeffries? No, I didn't forget. The agent's face went blank. In order to save my young wife from her abductors, I'm going to need a team. In order to get that team to do what I say, I'm going to need respect, Grant said. I respect you. You built this. Jeffries became serious. Your arm signals otherwise. It's in a cast because you failed to respect me. You questioned my ideas. That didn't show admiration. Well, I'm sorry if I offended you. I was only trying to do my job, too. Jeffrey's voice filled with annoyance. It's okay, Agent Jeffries, Grant said. You're a lost cause to me now. But I can still use you to influence the others. So, in fact, you're not totally worthless. With a quick thrust, Grant grabbed hold of the joystick. He swung the stick to the far right, causing the chopper to turn on its side and plummet downward. The unsuspecting Agent Jeffries tumbled out of the doorless machine. Grant moved the stick into its upright position and pulled back. The helicopter rose. You should always buckle up, Agent. Grant saw the man's hands hanging onto the side. It hadn't been a clean dump. Or you should just keep your mouth shut. Then you really wouldn't be in this mess. Your death will let the others know their places, though. Jeffrey's screams made it unlikely that he heard any of what Grant was saying. The agent was disrespectful till his final moments. Grant reached into the back and grabbed the first long object he could get his hand on. A rifle. Laughing, he jabbed the gun at Jeffrey's fingers. 
He wished he could focus on watching Jeffrey's fall, but the sky needed his attention, too. He did enjoy his helicopter rides. Chapter 26 Motherhood is the next phase of life for a wife. In the event that a son is born, it is up to the husband to decide how to raise him. A good wife will always encourage turning the babe over for government protection. The son will grow to become a strong soldier, and the wife will demonstrate the love she has for her country. The Registry Guide for Girls Despite her uncomfortable surroundings, Mia slept well. When Whitney shook her awake in the morning, she had difficulty remembering where she was. Dry and in the light of day, Mia also became self-conscious about her lack of bottoms. She had rolled around in her sleep and was completely exposed. She noticed Whitney's disapproving look. She wasn't sure if it was for Mia's lack of clothing or sleeping in so late. Either way, she didn't want to deal with it. Whipping her clothes down from the branches, she turned her back and dressed as fast as possible. In her attempts to avoid facing Whitney, Mia had exposed herself to Andrew, who was walking back toward the two young women. He looked away, but Mia noticed the slight smile on his face. Surprisingly, she felt no remorse or embarrassment. It was almost liberating. She giggled a little at the idea. Quick meeting, Andrew said. Mia glanced at Whitney. She was listening. It looked like all the angst she had been carrying yesterday had disappeared overnight. We better listen up, or else you might kill us, Whitney said with a bite to her voice. Mia was wrong. Whitney still had animosity. Mia wanted to defend Andrew, but he didn't look phased by Whitney's harsh words. She knew Whitney was just out of her comfort zone and didn't mean any of what she was saying. After all, Andrew had saved her life. We are going to find work. There is a delicate way to do this to make sure it's a legitimate job. You two need to stay out in the parking lot. Don't talk to anyone and don't look at anyone. Try to stay hidden. If someone approaches you, walk away. You two are mute, got it? Both nodded in agreement. Mia noticed that Andrew looked uneasy, as if he were having a difficult time thinking of the right words to say. I understand you two have lived sheltered lives. You may see some things you need to ignore, okay? It is important that you keep your cool and don't expose us to anyone. Even if someone seems harmless, there's a very good chance they're not. Andrew didn't wait for a response. He turned and started walking. Mia and Whitney shared concerned glances before they followed him. Mia no longer cared about how far two miles was or what was wrong with Whitney. All she could do was imagine what horrors awaited them at the tavern. No cornstalks hid the little group from cars, but none passed by. It didn't take long for the small building to come into view. The flat landscape made almost everything around visible. As they drew closer, the building became clearer. Mia had a hard time understanding what the big deal was. It looked like any old structure. It was small and painted in a chipped blue. The low roof was tilting to the right, and it sure looked like the building was falling down. Mia wondered if Andrew would be able to stand up straight inside. When the three were about 50 feet away, right on the edge of the parking lot, Andrew stopped the girls. I'm going the rest of the way by myself. Sit here and wait for me. Try not to let anyone see or notice you. Most importantly, remember not to talk to anyone. He tapped the top of his head, signaling for Mia to put on her baseball cap. I don't know how long I'll be. It could be five minutes or it could be five hours. With those final words, Andrew continued walking toward the bar. Mia could not figure out why he was so cautious. Just as she was about to comment on this to Whitney, she saw an arm reach up from the lot and grab Andrew's leg. She lunged to help him, but Whitney held her back. It was a skinny, dilapidated creature. Andrew shook it off and another one jumped up and tried to grab him. It didn't take long to shake that one off too. 
and Andrew finally entered the bar. One of the creatures tried to stand but didn't have the strength. It gave up and slumped back against the building. The other continued to lie in the gravel. Mia's eyes darted around the parking lot, and she noticed several more lying in the gravel covered in dust. She also became aware of blood stains on the ground. She had a sickening feeling that these creatures weren't even human. They were emaciated walking corpses. She tried to wrap her mind around what they were, maybe some breed of animal she'd never seen before. Her mind raced over the cows, horses, pigs, and chickens her father raised. She convinced herself that's what they were, some sickly animals. She wondered if they were the source of the bloodstains. Mia turned toward Whitney, who was having a similar realization. The two held hands and crouched down, then backed away from the lot. Mia wanted to run, but was too scared to draw attention to herself. They crawled in the grass, away from the building. Mia had never missed corn so much in her life. She was concerned about getting too far away from the meeting place, but out of fear, she didn't stop moving. Once there was sufficient space between them and the bar, she stopped. Whitney wanted to continue lengthening their distance. What were those things? Mia asked, hoping to halt her friend. I don't want to know. Whitney turned and sat in the grass with Mia. I hope they don't get Andrew on his way out. He didn't seem afraid, though. Well, I hope they do get him, Whitney said. What is your problem? He is helping us. He saved you. You liked him just fine the other day. He is a killer. He killed a man. And I could get over that because it was to protect us. But he is affecting you in some way I don't understand and I don't like, Whitney said. You picked up a dead body like it was nothing. You got blood all over yourself and didn't care. That is his influence. This is all a terrible idea. We shouldn't be with him. He is turning you into a man. I like being a girl, and I want to stay one. Why did you come then, if you were happy with the way things were? For the millionth time, I just want a husband, and I was never going to find one at home. But now I'm starting to think I should have just accepted my fate as government property. I'm good at cleaning. At least I would have lived with self-respect. Whitney softened her voice. Maybe I should head back. We can't be that far from home. You can't. I can't do this without you. I need you. If you aren't here, then I'll end up just like him. Mia pointed to one of the figures outside the bar. What's the real reason? Whitney asked, her eyes wide. I know something happened. Just tell me. Mia knew it was time to explain herself. She closed her eyes and gulped in the air. Do you remember my sister Karina? Mia wasn't sure she would. Her older sisters had spent most of their time away at finishing school. When they were home, Whitney was shut out of their lives. Yes, she isn't much older than us. She... She came back after her wedding, just a few months ago. Did her husband try to return her? Whitney couldn't hide the shock in her voice. No, she tried to get away from him. She looked... Mia tried to think of the right word. Horrible. Whitney's eyes widened. Mia felt the tears coming. He did terrible things to her. Things I didn't know a person could do to another person. My parents didn't do anything to help her. They just sent her back. And then, a week later, we got word she had died. Supposedly, she got sick. But I know he killed her. Whitney pressed her lips together. Mia could see her brain making justifications. Well, maybe she did something wrong. It's her responsibility to please him. That's not all, Mia said, interrupting. She told me to find something, an article. I think it was from another country, but I, I, I'm not sure. Do you have it? Whitney asked. No, I was too scared to hold on to it. If we were caught, we wouldn't even have been able to lie our way out of it with something like that on us. I destroyed it, but I remember everything it said. Whitney looked intrigued. Mia continued. It was just a short page, 
like the rest was missing. It talked about how American brides are just slaves, how we are programmed to ignore that fact. There was even a line about how America is the most hated country in the world. But we're the best country. Everyone knows that. How does everyone know that? Because some book tells us so? Because the government forces it on us? Why are we the best? It sounded like marriage in other places is nothing like it is here. It is even up to the girl to say yes, and it doesn't happen till they're older. Maybe it's a gag article, something Karina and her friends made up. No, it was professional. She lost her life to show it to me. Her last words were, it's all true. Mia looked at the ground. She let out a sob and buried her head in her hands. She felt Whitney's hand on her back. Did you think that was going to happen to you, with your husband? I, I didn't know. It could happen to either of us. I never thought punishment could be physical. You're more like a sister to me than any of my real sisters, and I couldn't risk leaving you to that fate. I need to know that you are safe too. I'm so sorry. You don't have anything to apologize for, Whitney responded. I don't want you to end up like that either. You're the closest person in my life, and I do care about you, more than anyone. You are going to get to Mexico and find a nice, sweet husband who deserves you and treats you well and have smart children you get to raise. But until then, we need Andrew. Without him, that trucker could have turned you into Karina. You don't know what he could have done to you. Andrew saved you. And it would be a whole lot easier if you could be warm to him again, Mia pleaded. Tears streamed down Whitney's cheeks as she nodded. Mia wasn't sure if the tears were due to her guilt over trying to leave, or her despair at realizing it wasn't an option. She gave her friend a quick hug. Try to remember. Andrew doesn't have a charmed life either, and wishing him captured by one of those monsters isn't fair. Both girls glanced back toward the structure. We'd better try to get a little closer. He might not be able to find us if we stay this far back, Whitney said as she wiped the tears away and started to crawl. Chapter 27 You may report for duty at any government building. From there, you will be taken to the nearest training camp. Your initial training marks the beginning of your manhood. You will grow into more of a man with each day of service. The Boy's Guide to Service The tavern looked just like Andrew expected and the blacked-out windows made it impossible to tell what time of day it was. A long, sturdy hardwood bar spanned the whole length of the place. This was a tavern designed for heavy drinking. In the morning, there weren't many customers. A sleeping older man, Andrew, and the bartender were the only ones in the place. After a quick survey, Andrew sat down at the bar, close to the door, and pulled out the money Mia had taken off of Scott. It wasn't much, but it was enough for Andrew's entry. He threw money down and ordered a beer. The bartender was a short, heavy man who looked annoyed to have a customer already. He pulled out a bottle and set it in front of Andrew. Andrew took a deep breath and took a swig from the bottle. He hated the taste of beer. He'd never understood why so many men enjoyed it. But he knew the rules. If he wanted to stay inside, he had to order or else it would be begging in the parking lot. The parking lot was not as bad as Andrew had anticipated. He had thought it would be bloodier. He was surprised to see boys still alive. He didn't like being jumped on, but was certain they were just starving to death and hoping to rob him. He couldn't feel for them right now. The girls were his current responsibility. He shrugged off any feelings of sympathy and turned his attention to the bartender. After all, Andrew didn't want to starve to death either. Do you know where I could find some work around here? Andrew asked. This caught the attention of the bartender, who turned and examined Andrew. He ran his eyes up and down Andrew's frame. You're thin but cut, aren't you? What are you, 17, 6 foot 1, 160 pounds? The bartender asked. 18, 6 foot 3, 
175 pounds. Andrew didn't like where this was going. We host fights at night. $20 a round if you win. $50 if you kill the other guy. I'm not a fighter. Andrew felt his knuckles growing white as he gritted his teeth. He flashed back to age 13. He was just out of school with nowhere to go. The fighting circuit seemed like a great idea. You could make easy money and train for service. Andrew shuddered at the thought of how many boys had met their fate at his hands. He realized he was squeezing his fists too tight and tried to relax. Those days were behind him. I could clean your parking lot. I noticed some stains and some beggars on their last legs outside. I could escort them away for you. Killing someone gave Andrew no pleasure. Scott had been his first casualty in years. But Andrew had learned a long time ago that violence was often necessary for survival. Tonight's fighters will show up in a little while. They come early to get people to sponsor them. The fighters clean up the beggars for free. They get some practice out of it, the bartender explained. Andrew's flashbacks continued. This time he saw the face of a young boy, no older than 13. The image remained burned into Andrew's mind. The teen looked so scared, his eyes so hollow. But Andrew didn't even hesitate to crack his skull open. The crowd of gamblers went nuts, encouraging him. The younger boy was dead, and Andrew relished the applause. His mind went to a new vision. This time, he was in the same position as the dead boy. It was his final fight. He could feel death approaching as an older teen had him pinned in the ring. The crowd was chanting for the opponent to finish off Andrew. The fighter raised his fist, and Andrew closed his eyes. But no final blow came. His competitor let him live. He got booed as Andrew caught his breath. He was alive. The older teen showed Andrew compassion, something nobody had ever done before. That was his last fight, and he had lived through it. Just sitting in this place was making him sick, but he needed work. It was the safest way to help the girls, and for some reason he couldn't let Mia down. What about any locals? I know a lot about farming, he said. Stick around and check for yourself, as long as you're buying. The bartender pointed to Andrew's beer. He forced himself to pick it up and took a swig as he stood. He moved to one of the few tables. It wasn't far from the bar, but this way Andrew could avoid forced conversation with the bartender while he waited. He thought back to his conversation with Mia last night. He knew he should have been mad at himself for talking with her, but he wasn't. It did feel nice to share a little. He remembered his promise to himself to maintain distance. Maybe it wasn't a bad idea to get to know the girls a little better. After all, the error had been trusting Scott, not them. He nodded to himself. It wasn't like they would become friends or anything. Just make small talk to pass the time. He hoped that for now Mia and Whitney would stay put and quiet. Mia needed to keep out of sight because she looked like a girl. And Whitney needed to keep her mouth shut because she sounded like a girl. He reminded himself not to worry. Both of them were proving useful in their own ways, and they were better off out there than in here. Besides, there was no way he could afford to buy them all drinks. He chuckled at the thought of Mia drinking a beer. He doubted she would be able to stomach it. Chapter 28 Your rank and occupation and service will guarantee you a lifetime of respect. The higher you rise, the more esteem you are worthy of. A general deserves more honor than a private because he served his country to the very best of his ability. The Boy's Guide to Service Grant pulled out a small electronic tablet and held down the voice record button. The technology freeze had been in place for several decades now. The general public wasn't allowed to appreciate any of these advances. Laptops and cell phones were the newest inventions acceptable, and some homes kept televisions to watch news and occasional foreign programming. Grant didn't need permission, though. 
His clearance allowed him top-of-the-line inventions from all over the world. Develop comfortable nose guard to block smells but allow breathing, he said into the machine. He was always thinking of prototypes, a whole range of weapons or items that could assist the military. The scent of Scott Rand's decomposing body, along with the manure, had given him his latest idea. He smiled and waved as the black SUV pulled up into the rest area. Leonard and his agent stepped out of the vehicle and walked toward him. Think fast, Grant said jokingly as he tossed a wallet toward the younger agent. Meet your abductor. Please go prepare a press release and blast pictures of him, my wife, and her friend all over the news. The agent looked at Leonard for guidance, and he nodded his head. He pulled out his phone and began readying the story, while Leonard and Grant walked toward the crime scene. The area was chaotic. Yellow tape roped off the entire perimeter, and a forensic team was combing over every inch. Don't worry, Grant said. Most of these workers are from my own private group. I'm not stealing your resources. We have plenty of resources. Budget is not a concern, Leonard said. But thank you. What did they find? 26-year-old male, bludgeoned to death, left in the back of his truck. His body was cleaned and hidden. It looks like all blankets, clothes, and shoes were taken. Cash, too, if he had any. It's your girl. Anyone else would have taken more. The parts on this truck are worth a lot of money. And they wouldn't have cleaned up the body, Leonard said. I'm sure it wasn't her, but her companion traveler, Andrew. I don't think that she would be strong enough to kill. Grant laughed under his breath. He imagined killing Andrew. He hoped it would be with his bare hands. Why don't we just release details about the Andrew kid? Leonard asked at least in the local area. Soon, my friend. Right now, I am enjoying myself. Expand your mind. With this kid's enlistment date so close, even if I lose, I win. We'll just go pick them up then. You've been here a while. What else did you find out? Leonard asked. I've been here about, oh, five hours, Grant said. The driver was hauling manure, making everything stink and making it difficult to guess the time of death. They think it could be anywhere from a day to a week, but there is something interesting over here. The men walked closer to the building, and Grant flushed with excitement. He felt like he was back in service again, hunting, using his brain against a formidable opponent. It's a smashed case, Leonard looked puzzled. They stole a map? The map doesn't matter. The symbols on the case do. Travelers mark maps like this to let others know where to go and where not to go. It's sort of the code of the road. I spent most of my youth as a city boy, Leonard said. Me too, but I still know how the world works. Grant couldn't believe Leonard was so ignorant. My guess is that the kid saw something on here. Something motivated him enough to take the map for directions. So I'm having my team reassemble the glass, put a new map underneath it, and voila, we'll have an idea of where they're at. How long will that take? Should have the glass assembled by nightfall. I'm not sure about cracking the code, though. Might take another 20 to 30 minutes. You could have your wife home before bedtime, Leonard said. Grant wrinkled his brow at that idea. He wasn't sure whether it was because he didn't want to end the chase or because the idea of taking her home was no longer appealing. He shrugged it off. He could always kill her, make it look like an accident. Nobody would dare question him. Mr. Marsden, where is Agent Jeffries? Leonard asked. That's a funny story. Grant wrapped his arm around Leonard's shoulders. I let him fly my chopper. It's a less complicated prototype, but the guy forgot to buckle his safety belt and slipped out. Don't worry, I sent a team out to find his body. Grant continued flashing his million-dollar smile at an uneasy Leonard. He wished he could tell the whole story, how Jeffries dangled from the aircraft and begged for his life, but he figured the death was enough. Grant hoped the RAG team was beginning to understand the true extent 
of his power. Chapter 29 All grooms are American heroes. It is an honor to be the wife of a hero. She will enjoy respect from all her peers and bask in her husband's glory. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia was growing tired and hot. The morning sun gave way to the afternoon heat, and the two girls were still sitting in the field. They moved closer to their meeting spot, but not all the way there. Mia was getting restless and debated walking into the bar to see what was going on. It looks like something is happening in the parking lot. Whitney's voice snapped Mia back to reality. It did look like there was some action taking place. They were close enough to see people moving, but too far away to see what the people were doing. I'm going closer, to get a better look. Mia began crawling back to the original meeting point. She was surprised Andrew would have had them wait in such an open spot. Crawling felt stupid. The grass wasn't hiding her at all, and she had a feeling anyone who looked in her direction would notice her right away. But for whatever reason, Mia remained on all fours. When she got closer, the figures in the lot came into focus. They were fighting. Some were laughing and shoving, joking around, while others were full-on swinging. The monsters she and Whitney had noticed earlier weren't monsters at all. They were just starving people. Mia gasped in horror as someone started kicking a starving boy. The attacker was huge, double if not triple the weight of his victim. She wanted to rise up and yell at the attacker to leave the boy alone, but fear and Andrew's instructions kept ringing in her head. She continued to crawl. She was already well past the meeting point, almost to the end of the grass. Any cover she had was lost. Her stomach turned at the violence that she saw. Young men were laughing at each other's despair. It was wretched. Thoughts of Andrew filled her mind, that it was a possibility he could have shared their fate. It was a cruel world for young boys. She knew she had to do something. She was not going to sit by and let these people be killed. Mia became so fixated on the beatings, she did not realize a vehicle was parking right by her hiding spot. She rose to yell at the abusers and found herself face to face with a van. She ducked down, hoping to avoid the driver's notice. The fear of being hit by a car refocused Mia's energy. She felt like she had been woken from a trance and needed to run back to Whitney. She was about to turn and crawl when something caught her ear. Midwest area beauty Mia Morrissey was abducted late Tuesday night. The 18-year-old made headlines for having such a hefty price tag. She was purchased by a Grant Marsden of the Northeast area, and the two were married. Little is known about her abductor, who has been identified as Scott Rand, a 26-year-old truck driver. Her husband had this to say. Please give me back my wife. We did not get the chance to enjoy our lives together yet. I just want her home safe. Please. For more information, please visit our website at... The radio station was turned off, and the door to the van swung open. Mia was so interested in the report, she forgot about staying out of sight. Her eyes met the driver's for a brief second, and she reminded herself to close her mouth and look away. He looked nice, though, warm and welcoming, with silver hair. He tried to smile at her, but Mia started moving toward Whitney, never looking back. She decided it wasn't worth it to crawl. Andrew had picked this spot because he knew the boys were too busy being nasty to each other to worry about her. Maybe the radio misspoke, Whitney said. Did they say anything about me? How can I be married? Don't you think I would know about it? What does it matter? If you are married, it's better for your father. At least that means he got paid. What about me? Yeah, they mentioned you, said we were taken together. It sounded like they had just finished up your segment when I started listening. Mia lied, and noticed Whitney's joy at being mentioned. Let's walk closer to the bar. Mia stood and walked upright. I don't think crawling makes a difference. Nobody will pay attention to us. The boys who had been fighting earlier had scattered. 
Mia hadn't noticed any action at all since she made it back to Whitney. Even the starving boys were gone. Mia shuddered, doubting they had made it out alive. I'm hungry. This sucks, Whitney said. Mia was shocked at her language choice. She thought being a boy was starting to suit her. A tall, lanky, dark-haired figure popped out from the front door. Mia recognized Andrew and wanted to run to him. Every muscle in her legs was telling her to sprint and throw her arms around him. She was grateful he had made it to the farm, that he hadn't starved in a parking lot somewhere. She thought he needed to hear those words. But just as she sped up, her brain reminded her boys didn't run and hug other boys. She needed to play the role. She slowed down a little and could hear Whitney groaning over Mia's little sprint. Mia was so busy focusing on Andrew that she didn't pay attention to the gentleman who was following him outside. It was the guy from the van. She hoped the silver-haired man didn't mention their encounter to Andrew. The last thing she wanted was for him to get testy with her again. She pulled her hat brim low over her eyes and looked to the ground as she approached them. This is, uh, Walter and, uh, Marty. Walter and Marty, my traveling partners. Andrew sounded pleased at his choice of names. Mia assumed she was Marty. Hello, Marty, the man said. Both Mia and Whitney responded to his greeting. Avoiding eye contact made it difficult for Mia to tell if he noticed. Didn't have enough for us all to sit in the bar, so they're just tired from this heat. Andrew put his arm around Whitney. Isn't that right, Walter? Mia might as well have been blind. She was too scared to look at the man's reaction. It is hot out, the silver-haired man said. Well, you two little ones get in the back. Andrew, you can sit up front with me. It's about an hour's drive to my farm, so get ready for a bumpy ride. Mia gave Whitney a quick sideways glance. The last time they had been in the back of a vehicle together, it hadn't ended so well. She hoped Whitney's nerves weren't getting the better of her. I get carsick. Can I sit in the front? Whitney didn't do a good job disguising her voice. Mia was certain they were going to get caught. If this man hadn't had suspicions yet, he would now. Walter, you'll be fine. Mr. Piazzi and I have to talk about the work we'll be doing. When you're the one in charge, you can sit in the front. Andrew was already walking Whitney toward the back. Mia stayed close and jumped in first to help Whitney up. It was obvious her friend was uncomfortable, but Mia couldn't risk comforting her. It would expose them as females. There was a divider between the front seat and the rear of the van. Mia and Whitney had to sit on the hard floor. There were a few tools visible. Mia hoped the ride would go fast. She noted it was hotter in here than outside. Mia went to the window over the door to see if she could get it open. The van's engine turned over and they backed out of the lot, right over a giant blood stain. Mia wanted to reassure Whitney, but the sight of the stain sent a giant shiver through her body, and she decided it was best to remain quiet. The van was moving too fast to have a conversation anyway. Mia ignored the window and leaned back against the side. The heat was making it easy to nap. Chapter 30 When a groom chooses his bride, he becomes responsible for her well-being and safety. All of the future choices he makes are intended to ensure these principles. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia had always assumed her father's farm was average, but it was grand compared to the Piazzi farm. There was one small farmhouse, which looked like it might fall down any minute. The white paint was coming off in giant chunks, making the place look like it was melting. Only one barn was on the property. It was a shell of its former glory. Though it was about double the size of the house, it did not compare even to her father's smallest barn. Everything about the place was scary, and every bone in Mia's body told her to run. Jumping out the back of the van was easier than getting in. She tried to give Whitney a hand down before the men exited the front. However, 
Whitney was still moving slowly. Mia sensed a change in her friend and wasn't sure how to handle it. Whitney's mind seemed to be elsewhere, and Mia didn't know how to get through to her. Mr. Piazzi didn't seem to care about Whitney's sluggishness. His attention was diverted when a man popped out the front door of his home. The mystery man was in his 30s, with sandy blonde hair and a welcoming smile. He was capable of making any girl swoon, and Whitney was no exception. Mia noticed her face light up as he came into view. It was nice to see a father and son together. Earlier, Andrew had mentioned how rare it was to keep a boy child. They had stumbled onto an odd relationship. Mia wondered if Andrew was jealous. The young man greeted his father with a hug and a deep kiss. Mia's brow crinkled at this sight. She was unfamiliar with the father-son relationship, but had not thought it would be so physical. Whitney seemed to share her feelings, but Andrew leaned against the truck with a straight face, looking away. This is Andrew, Marty, and Walter, Mr. Piazzi introduced them to his son, while keeping his arm around his shoulders. I'm Alex Piazzi. Nice to meet you, boys. The emphasis he put on boys made Mia nervous, but nobody else seemed to notice. I told Andrew on the ride over, but please, call me Frank, Mr. Piazzi said. Mia knew he was talking to her and Whitney, but she was still dodging his glance. Let me show you to your area. Frank began walking to the barn. With each step toward the dilapidated building, Mia felt closer to her doom. He swung open the door to reveal the standard animal stalls for chickens, pigs, and cows. Almost all of them were filled, too. A cat sat in the rafters looking down on them with curious eyes. On the inside, the barn was well cared for. Mia thought it was nicer than her father's. Frank pointed toward some stairs and started to walk up. There were no railings and the climb made Mia feel a little uneasy. By the time they reached the top, she was sure a slip would result in immediate death. They walked into a decent-sized loft, with sleeping places for at least ten people, each with a straw mattress, pillow, and giant bowl. She wondered what it was like for Andrew at her father's housing unit. She had never been allowed to go near the boys' quarters. Andrew dropped his bag on a mattress and signaled for Mia and Whitney to do the same. How long are you looking to stay? Frank asked. About three weeks, Andrew said. That's a bit long. I don't know if we have enough for you to do. Frank showed concern. Well, as long as you need us then. Frank nodded in agreement. There's water in a well out back. You can't miss it. He pointed out the little window. Freshen up a little. I'll go get you fellas something to eat. Then you can get started on your project. Frank made it down the stairs and left them alone. Before the barn door was even closed, Whitney and Mia looked at Andrew for answers. Neither one of them was sure what was going on. Three weeks? Mia was shocked it would take that long. She wanted to arrive in Mexico as soon as possible. Why were they kissing like that? Whitney asked. Mia was surprised that out of all the things going on, that was what Whitney cared about. We need to make some money so we can get to Mexico quicker and with some cover. We can't walk the whole way, and hitching is out of the question after the last time. I have three weeks till my enlistment date, so we need to make as much as possible. I think the cost of three tickets will be about $300. Right now, I only have about 100 Andrew sounded annoyed. Were they father and son? Whitney continued to ask. Too much can happen in three weeks. We won't be safe here. You know they are looking for me, Mia said. It doesn't make any sense. I never saw any of the workers kiss like that. You had some close friends, didn't you? Whitney was still trying to get her question answered. I'm not rich. I can't help you any quicker. I'm doing the best I can. Andrew had to talk over Whitney's ramblings. What about two tickets to the border? Whitney and I can go on our own from here. As Whitney continued to babble on about the kiss, 
Andrew gave Mia a look of fury. She was taken aback by his anger. She had assumed he would be happy about leaving them. His look faded, and he started to answer Whitney. They are partners, married if they live together. Two men can marry each other. They don't go through the registry. They had to pay the government a fee. It's not a big deal. If you make it a big deal, it is going to make you stand out as some sheltered little girl, Andrew said. His voice was firm and cold. This calmed Whitney down, and she nodded. In agreement or out of fear, Mia wasn't sure. Andrew began storming down the stairs. Whitney was still trying to wrap her head around the idea of two men being married. But Mia had bigger things on her mind. Could Andrew want to come with them? She couldn't think of any other reason he would be so upset at her suggestion that they part ways. Maybe he wanted to make sure they actually crossed. She doubted any train would take them right over. Or maybe it was something more. She held her breath at the thought he might want to join them in crossing. Do you think they chose each other? Whitney asked, still fixated on Frank and Alex. It sounds romantic. I'd like to have a partner, have someone love me as much as I love them, Mia said. Mia immediately regretted saying that. She wasn't concerned with romance. She left a confused Whitney and began the descent down the rail list stairs. She heard Whitney get up and start the climb down, too. Her stomach made a gurgling noise. With all this excitement, Mia had forgotten how hungry she was. She hoped Frank had made something she liked for lunch. But at this point, she would take anything he offered and be thankful. Chapter 31 The marriage document signed by the groom states that he will love, cherish, and protect his bride. He promises to provide for her and care for her above all others. She is his queen and will be treated as such. The Registry Guide for Girls The Piazzi farm was larger than Mia had thought. A wooden fence lined the property. She was not sure what the point of the fence was, as it wouldn't keep anything out or in. Each post had a single horizontal piece of wood attached at its center and it was so short, a cow could have walked over it. The three of them stood at the start of the fence, closest to the farmhouse. Andrew began opening pails of paint and handing out brushes. Mia dropped to her knees and started swiping her brush back and forth on the wood. She found the task relaxing. Her mind could drift to other areas of concern without sacrificing her work. She felt guilty for making the suggestion that Andrew part ways with them. She convinced herself he was just concerned for their safety. But she had noticed his look of betrayal at her suggestion. She had a hard time believing Andrew's feelings could be hurt at all. Particularly since not having a family didn't seem to bother him. He never showed any self-pity. The idea that he would stay with them when it was unnecessary was insane to her. After all... He had three weeks left. Wouldn't he want to spend some of that time following his original plan? Her concentration broke as Whitney began to complain. I hate this. Mia wasn't sure whether she was referring to the work or their current situation. Either way, she lacked the energy to comfort her friend. Mia had thought learning about Karina's article would have brought Whitney more on board, but it seemed to have had the opposite effect. Eventually, Mia tuned Whitney out and daydreams filled her head. She imagined living like Frank and Alex, open and affectionate with someone she loved, running out to greet her partner with a big kiss, wrapping her arms around his shoulders, not because she had to, but because she wanted to. Making a home together, helping each other, kissing each other. Mia's heart almost stopped at this last thought. She glanced toward Andrew, who was working his way down the fence much faster. He was the man she was imagining her life with. She felt her stomach flutter at this realization and whipped her head away. The idea of her and Andrew had never occurred to her. It was never an option. Now her head raced with the possibility. If he joined her across the border, could he be her mate? She wondered if he felt something too, and that was why he wanted three tickets. 
Mia knew she needed independence, not a romance. Before she could dwell on her thoughts further, she was tossed back into reality. I need one of you to come inside. Alex is doing some interior painting. He could use the help as long as we have you. Frank pointed toward Mia. You, you have the smallest hands, good for delicate work. Excuse me, sir, I'm the painter. He doesn't have a clue what he's doing. Andrew started walking toward Frank. No, you stay out here. You're working the fastest. Frank moved toward the house, calling back toward Mia. Come on, little guy. She had no choice but to follow. If they were going to stay here long enough to raise money for three train tickets, she would have to do some things alone. Not looking back toward Andrew or Whitney, she marched straight to the house and followed Frank inside. Much like the inside of the barn, the interior of the house was a pleasant surprise. Each room was more magnificent than the next, with modern appliances and furniture. The kitchen was white with musical notes painted on the walls at random spots. All the decor was also accented with music. Even the dish towels looked like sheet music. The sitting room had a giant television set. Mia had never been allowed to watch TV, but her father kept one in his bedroom. Plush leather couches surrounded the entertainment center, and pictures of Alex and Frank doing various activities hung on the purple walls. Mia was certain neither of these rooms needed any work. She followed Frank into the third and final first floor room, the dining room. A large, dark wood table took up most of the space. A chandelier of equal size hung low from the ceiling. Behind the table, twin windows outlined in the same dark wood showed the backyard, giving Mia a clear view of Andrew and Whitney. The walls were a pale pink color. Mia loved the room. It was shocking that a room so exquisite was in such a rundown house. Mia must not have done a good job of hiding her thoughts, because Frank was quick to explain. Alex is from New York and likes to keep the old world elegance. I used to own all the land beyond the fence, but I sold it off. With the money from the land sale, he can pretty much set up this house any way he wants. I keep to the basement. That's where I have my comfy furniture and the stereotypical farmer stuff. Frank was nervous. Mia wondered why. You can keep that junk down there until I've completed everything up here. Alex said as he walked in. I still have to finish this room, the upstairs, and the outside. You've got a year left of that gross old furniture, so you better enjoy it. He wore an apron over his jeans and flannel shirt. His eyes shimmered as he looked at Frank. We'll see when it happens. Frank gave Alex a fake look of disapproval. It would have been clear to anyone that these two were in love. Mia had been around them for only a minute, but could tell their feelings were strong. Their love was authentic and unashamed. She had never seen affection of this sort. Most relationships were about honoring and obeying, but Frank and Alex were more about loving and cherishing. Mia was surprised she didn't feel jealousy, just admiration. It took her a moment to remember where she was and that she was staring at the couple with wide eyes. She shook her head and looked away, hoping they didn't notice she wasn't acting manly. While I have you here, I was thinking about changing up this room a little. Alex started to walk around the table. Maybe add some details to the painting? He faced the wall and moved his hands up and down. Mia thought it would be a mistake to change anything. The room was perfect. He continued to talk about lighting highlights and painting the room a darker pink. He asked her to come over to look at some samples he had against the wall. She shrugged instead of giving her opinion. She was trying to avoid speaking at all costs. Come on, you must like one more than the others, Alex said. Mia felt bad. She pointed to the wall, signaling not to change the paint. Oh, you flatter me. He held his hand over his heart. It's so nice to have a lady's opinion. We don't get that, well, ever. Adrenaline filled Mia. She made eye contact with Alex and her flight reaction kicked in. She pushed him and made a break for the door. 
Frank was standing in her way, and he picked her up. She kicked and punched, trying hard to wiggle free, but he held her in a tight grip from behind. She started to hyperventilate, but wasn't ready to give up her fight. She pulled her legs up and pushed off the great table, sending them both flying into the wall. She felt pain surge through her head. Although she was free from Frank's arm, she had hit it on the doorframe during her escape attempt. Mia tried to stand up, but Alex had run over and was crouching in front of her. Frank also seemed fine, and he reached for the back of her head. She heard their voices, but could not listen to what they were saying. Instead, she felt blackness come over her. Even though she tried hard to hold on to it, consciousness slipped away from her. Chapter 32 A bride makes no promises or vows. There is no need. It is understood she will do everything in her power to please her husband and honor his desires. The Registry Guide for Girls The creak of the floorboards, the farm machines starting in the distance. These were the sounds Mia woke to every day. She could tell the sun was starting to rise, but she didn't want to get out of bed yet. She decided to wait for her mother to come and wake her. Sure, she might get in a little trouble for being lazy, but it was worth it for just a few more minutes. She wondered what they were going to learn today. Maybe sewing. It had been a while since they had worked on their seams. Mia hated sewing. She groaned before flicking her eyes open. As she focused, she felt fuzzy. Literally fuzzy. She was lying under a leopard print throw, a blanket she had never seen. She looked up at the wall and saw a giant painting of two men posing with each other. She did not understand what was going on. Good, you're up. I got scared for a second that you gave yourself a concussion. Alex was seated on the bed next to her with a bottle of water. He handed it to her. Mia's memories came rushing back. She sat up in the bed and kicked off the leopard print throw. She wanted to jump out, but she was in the middle of a huge mattress. If she tried to roll toward the end, he would just grab her. She froze in fear and scooted up toward the dark wood headboard. Please calm down. We don't mean you any harm. Alex again tried to give her the water. We want to help you. Images of the trucker flashed before her eyes. She didn't want the kind of help he wanted to give. Think about it. We haven't called anyone yet. If we had, they would have been here by now. We are wealthy and have no need for your reward money. We are not supporters of the registry. What reason would we have to turn you in? Everything Alex was telling her made sense. She wasn't sure she could believe him, but she was thirsty. She relaxed a little and reached for the bottle of water. She could see how happy he was as she took a sip. How long was I out for? To her, it felt like a full night's sleep. Where are my friends? You were asleep for about an hour. They're still painting out back. You knocked your head pretty good. Mia noticed the pain surging in her skull. She lifted her hand and felt a bandage over a bump. As she winced, Alex produced two pills and put them in her hand. Weighing her options and finding none, she swallowed the pills. How did you know I was a girl? Mia was sick at the thought of her disguise failing. Honey... You aren't just a girl. You are Grant Marsden's wife. He is a dreamy rich man. You are all over the news. It's hard not to recognize your face. I'm not his wife, and he's a psycho. He married me after I ran away. Alex gave a perplexed look, not seeming to understand the arrangement either. Why would you want to help me? Mia asked. Well, lots of reasons. Alex paused to collect his thoughts. One of the downsides of living the lifestyle Frank and I do is that we can't have children of our own. We can adopt. A boy, but never a girl. Who would give a girl away? So because you can't have a girl, you want to help me? Mia asked. We helped another runaway once before. 
years ago. She stayed with us for a long time, and she was like a daughter. She was kind and sweet. She loved to read and was always asking questions. Alex placed his hand over his mouth and choked back tears. It was clear this was emotional for him. We agreed that since we would never see her again, we would help any girl who crossed our path and treat her like she was our Steffi. We thought we were going to change the world, make a difference. But people are more content these days. So you're our first since her. Why are people more content? Why don't more run? I'm not sure, sweetie. My guess is the government's been more effective at keeping outside information away from the people. Mia thought about the article. They weren't doing a foolproof job. What happened to her? Your Steffi. I'm not sure. Hopefully she made it out of the country. It would be too dangerous if she tried to contact us. It was clear to Mia this was a sore subject for him. Her instincts told her to reach out and give him comfort but she still wasn't convinced of his intentions. Why don't you just adopt a boy? It's hard. The government wants babies turned over. We've taken in older boys who we thought of as sons, but they never want to stay. They're too programmed not to accept love. Alex reached out and grabbed Mia's hand. But will you let us help you? For Steffi? His last comment resonated through her. She wasn't sure if it was because of his charm, because she felt bad for him, or because she had no other option. But Mia began to nod her head. He squealed with excitement, hugged her, and inadvertently placed his hand on her injured head. Oh, I'm so sorry, he said. At least it will make you look a little more like a boy. Let's go tell Frank. Before Mia could respond, Alex had her by the hand and was pulling her out of the room, yelling for his partner down the stairs. Mia found his enthusiasm infectious. As they rounded the bottom of the stairs toward the kitchen, both of them stopped, stunned. Frank was sitting at the kitchen table with a calm look on his face, while a knife blade was being pressed against his neck. Standing right behind him was an enraged Andrew. It was the second time Mia had seen that look. Chapter 33 It is common for wives to take on some traits of their husbands. After all, it is the woman's responsibility to know what her husband likes in order to please him. But a good wife will ensure she retains her delicate feminine traits. The Registry Guide for Girls let her go or I'll kill him. Spit flew out Andrew's mouth with each word. Mia was so taken aback that she forgot Alex was holding her hand. She shook it free and went toward Andrew. Put the knife down, she said. He did not look happy. Put the knife down, now, Mia said more loudly. Andrew looked down at his hand, then back at her. I can't, he said. If you don't want to kill them, that's fine. We have to at least tie them up and get a head start. No! Mia was growing frustrated and so was Alex. He let out a long wail. Mia hoped to get the situation under control before anything happened. Andrew had made it clear that he had no issue with disposing of either of these two. They want to help us. Let him go. The sole sound in the whole kitchen was Alex's cry. Mia feared he would charge at Andrew any second. Help us? Are you out of your mind? Andrew said. How can I trust they aren't tricking you? Don't. Don't trust them. Trust me. At this point, Mia was right next to Andrew, placing her hand on his arm, trying to get him to lower his weapon. He looked straight in her eyes. She could see the indecision in them. She felt heavy with pain for Andrew. He was so damaged, he didn't know how to trust. She needed to guide him through this. She let her face relax and nodded her head slowly, never breaking eye contact. His face responded to hers, and he let her push his arm down. She heard Frank breathe a sigh of relief and run to Alex. The couple wrapped their arms around each other. Mia was uncertain just who was comforting whom. 
she turned her attention back to Andrew. She realized they had never intentionally been this close before. Seeing Frank and Alex together made her want to embrace him. She had never felt a romantic inkling toward anyone in her life and didn't know what to do. She hoped he would pick her up and hug her out of relief. She wanted to tell him they would be all right, that he would survive. He looked right back at her, his eyes unflinching, and his face went from cold to warm, like he was falling into her. Their trance was broken when Whitney spoke, her voice shaky. What's going on? The moment between Mia and Andrew passed. She turned her attention back toward Alex and Frank, hoping the situation with Andrew hadn't changed their minds. We are going to help your friend, Alex said with pride. Frank nodded his head in agreement, and the two hugged again. Alex rested his head on Frank's shoulder. Mia assumed they were both thinking of their Steffi. And you too, Whitney, Mia said. It had never occurred to her that the men didn't realize Whitney was a girl too. Whitney seemed reluctant to accept their help. She did little to hide her fear. Maybe even the warrior, too, Frank said, looking at Andrew. Mia was relieved. She had a feeling all was forgiven on Frank's end. Andrew, on the other hand, still looked a little uneasy. It didn't matter. Mia was happy. With the Piazzi's help, Mexico would no longer be three weeks away. The new friends all sat down to a lavish dinner prepared by Alex. It was a chicken dish served on fine china. Mia knew this was a fancy dinner. Her mother had spent long hours teaching her how to cook, but Mia did not think she was capable of creating such elegance. She picked up her fork and knife and sampled a small piece. The flavor of the cream sauce was light and intense at the same time. She sighed with pleasure. It was clear not everyone felt the same way. While Whitney was enjoying her food, Andrew was having a difficult time with the fork and knife. He looked awkward and uncomfortable. She doubted he had received much training in sophisticated dining. Always the polite host, Frank dropped his fork and knife and began picking off little pieces, sliding them through the sauce and popping them in his mouth. Even grumpy Andrew smiled at his gesture. Mia wondered if Andrew felt bad about the earlier events, but doubted he wasted his time on regrets. Mia was so eager to learn about her new trail to Mexico. The Piazzis wouldn't present their plans until after dinner, but the anticipation was driving her crazy. Mia wished Whitney would act inappropriately and broach the subject, but Whitney still seemed stunned by the day's events. Mia had to try to bring up the subject. Swallowing a bite, she made her opening remarks. So, will you two take us to the border? Everyone continued to look down at their food. Neither Frank nor Alex made an attempt to answer, but it looked like Alex was holding in laughter and trying not to spit out his food. We don't have a death wish, sweetie, Alex managed to say without laughing. You need a trained professional to get you over. The border was long on Mia's map. She was sure there would be at least one spot where they could just march right across. It would be impossible to guard the whole thing. She looked to Andrew for support, but he didn't have any to offer. The whole border is protected by an electric fence now. The Mexicans don't enjoy escapees coming into their country, Frank said. And after we sent our army to stop the drug cartel wars, they agreed to never allow any unserved men over, which is what you are trying to parade around as. While Mia and Whitney might have been posing, Andrew actually was an unserved man. She was hoping to read his face for some response. She was still unsure how far he was planning on accompanying them, but he stayed unflinching. Mia forced any notion she had about Andrew's crossing over out of her mind. His priority had always been reporting for duty, and she was sure that hadn't changed. He just wanted to make sure they made it to the border safely. It was a waste of her efforts to think his coming was a possibility. But they don't send you back, right? That's the whole reason we picked Mexico over Canada. Anxiety was overtaking Mia. 
No, there is no formal agreement about girls crossing over. They don't care. They have enough problems of their own. But bounty hunters might try to stop you. They're private people paid for by your father or husband to track you, Frank said. Everything was always harder than she had anticipated. But it was still worth it. She would rather work hard for her freedom than live as a lazy prisoner. Maybe we should just go back and apologize, Whitney said quietly. Mia had almost forgotten about Whitney. She was being reserved. Mia gave her friend a little kick. They had discussed this before. Mia couldn't risk losing her. Whitney didn't seem to grasp the full implications of Karina's message, the photo of the woman in white at the man's feet. Mia assumed seeing Andrew with the knife this afternoon had jolted Whitney and she needed to refocus her friend. Even if Mia was willing to risk Whitney's return, it wouldn't be fair to Andrew. He was in too deep now, and Mia owed him. If any of them went back, it would mean lots of trouble for him. What's been said about us on the news? Whitney moved on to a new topic, rubbing her leg. No one else had heard her previous comment. Mia gave Alex a pleading look. She was aware that nothing had been mentioned about Whitney. It was almost as if she'd never existed. Nobody missed her or cared. Lucky for Mia, Alex caught on. They say you're clever and will be hard to spot, Alex smiled. Whitney tried to hide her pride at Alex's last statement. Mia found the whole thing disgusting, but Whitney still bought into certain aspects of the system including the idea that being desired by a man was the most important thing in life. I know Alex wanted to wait until after we finished his marvelous dinner, thank you again, but since we are on the subject already, I found someone who's willing to help you. This whole thing is cryptic, and we've only done it once before. I was surprised to get a response so fast, Frank said. Is it safe? Andrew asked. Mia thought he was having a difficult time handing over the reins to someone else and expected to hear some protest from him. I like to know what I'm walking into. It's never 100% safe, but I think this is our best option. I'm sure you don't need reminding that helping you puts Alex and me in a dangerous situation. If we're caught, we're looking at death or life in service. The person who is going to help you next is in the same position. In the event we get caught, they don't want us to turn them in, so all I have is a drop point and some instructions for you. How do you know it's not a trap? Andrew asked. I don't. It's all been set up online, but based on the language used, I am pretty sure this person is legit and safe, Frank answered. No, we can fare better on our own, Andrew said. When will we be leaving? Mia asked over Andrew. She appreciated his concern, but she knew this was their best shot. You agreed to get us to the border. This is how we will cross, she told Andrew. You're not thinking rationally, Andrew said. We'll stick to my plan, make money to get down there, then worry about the next step. Sorry, but the whole reason I am doing this is so I don't have to take orders my whole life. I am making a decision and going this way. You can come or not. Besides, if we stick with your plan, what happens when you need to report for service? Where will that leave Whitney and me? Mia wanted Andrew to say he would cross too and that he wouldn't leave her. But she knew he wouldn't. She could feel the nerves in her body disintegrating. Even though she longed for his company, for the first time in her life, she had spoken to a male as if she were his equal. She had to keep herself from smiling. As soon as the dumbstruck look faded from Andrew's face, he nodded his head in agreement. So, when will we leave? Mia asked again. In a couple of hours, Frank said. Tension refilled the room. Mia had never thought it would be that soon. She had assumed it would take a week or so to get things into play. It was apparent she wasn't the only one who was surprised. Alex's mouth hung open. I know you wanted more time with them, but this isn't about bonding. I found someone willing to help, and we need to move. 
Frank spoke to Alex with authority. Why don't you take the girls upstairs and give them some new clothes? Roughen them up a little. Andrew and I will take care of the dishes and get their packs ready. Before Alex could protest, Frank started clearing the table. Andrew didn't look too pleased with his latest assignment, but Mia was sure he had more practice with washing dishes than he wanted to let on. Alex threw his napkin down and signaled with his head for the girls to follow. Mia had no clue where they were going next, but she felt a sense of control, false though it might be. It felt good. Chapter 34 Respect, honor, obey. These are the promises you make to your country. While these promises stay intact until your death, you will reap the rewards of your oath post-service. The Boy's Guide to Service Dust was everywhere in this area, Grant thought to himself. He was starting to hate gravel and rocks. He wanted to get back to civilization with paved roads. It was nighttime, but the dust was still visible in the headlights of the black SUV. He had decided it was best to ditch his chopper for such a short drive. Leonard pulled into the parking lot. The crummy little bar had no sign. The only indication that it was open was the crowd in the rear. Toward the back of the lot, tear-down bleachers had been set up. Some holiday lights lit the area as men screamed. Grant guessed there was a fight going on. He had never understood the country lifestyle. Even in his younger days, he always found work within the city limits. This was barbaric, even to him. While Grant had an air of sophistication to him, Leonard and the young agent Ross did not. Ross looked fresh out of service, younger than Grant, with short black hair and pale skin. He wasn't intimidating in the least. Both men wanted to go check out the fight. Grant shook his head. He couldn't imagine either of them as fighters in their youth. If they had been, Grant, the city boy, could have dispatched them with ease. Grant held open the door to the dusty, dirty bar and ushered Leonard and Ross inside. Both of his comrades were surprised he didn't want more men on the case, but Grant had his personal team on standby if they were needed. All that mattered to him right now was to have a couple of men to bounce ideas off of. Leonard and Ross would do just fine. The interior of the bar was just as empty as the outside was crowded. Not a soul but the bartender. Yet he was as swamped as ever, filling glasses at a frantic pace. He was preparing them for the men watching the fight outside. Grant had a seat and decided to give him a minute before ordering. Once things calmed down a bit, the bartender yelled toward them. What can I get you? I have some questions for you, Grant said. The worker looked like he didn't want to waste his time on stupid questions when he could be serving drinks. Grant decided not to wait for the chance to hear an objection. We're looking for three kids. Did you see any new faces around here today? I don't talk if you don't drink. Rules are rules. The bartender walked over with three mugs and plopped them down. Six dollars, please. Grant sneered at the gross liquid in front of him. He had a feeling the main ingredient was muck. He pulled out his wallet and removed a hundred-dollar bill. He was not in the mood for games. He slammed the bill down, drawing the bartender's attention. The bartender stopped and looked at Grant and his group. His expression changed. Sorry, I didn't realize. Rag agents, I have the utmost respect for you guys. Appreciate what you do. Beers are on the house. Grant was always amused at what respect a uniform could gain. For all this bartender knew, Leonard and Ross were psycho killers, but with their badges on, they got instant respect. Grant had begun to slide the money back into his wallet when the bartender grabbed it. Yours is still two dollars. He gave a sarcastic smile and grabbed the cash, walking over to the register and changing it out. Grant had a feeling this place wasn't hurting for money. I didn't see any groups of three at all. Can't tell you the last time that happened. There are groups of one, maybe two. 
a man came in from outside and picked up a tray the bartender had prepared, dropping off a stack of cash and a new list. Without missing a beat, the bartender prepared more drinks. It is impossible to have a group of one, Grant said. If there's just one person, it can't be a group. Neither Leonard nor Ross smiled at his correction. Grant had a feeling the bartender's compliments were going to their heads. What about just a single new kid? Ross asked, taking a sip of his drink. Sure, about two or three of them. I think one is already dead and the other two aren't fighting until later. Leonard beamed at Ross, eager to watch the night's festivities. Grant knew Andrew wasn't one of the fighters. If a teenage boy was protecting two runaways, it would be unthinkable that he would enter a fight. This young man, he wouldn't be looking for a fight. He would want real work, or even just a ride, Grant said. None like that, but I work one o'clock to one o'clock. You'll have to ask the other bartender. Could you call him? Leonard asked. Grant noticed Leonard was quick to request this before Grant had the chance. Grant had imagined that the bartender would make another wisecrack, and Grant could crack his head open on the bar. Now Leonard had spoiled some of the fun. Sorry, sir, but I don't know his number or nothing like that. I can't even think of his name. We only see each other in passing. He'll be here in a few hours, though. We have opposite 12-hour shifts. Leonard tried to hide his excitement, but Grant knew that since they'd walked in, all Leonard and Ross had wanted to do was go back out to the fights. They looked to him for approval. Grant knew he was being soft, but there was little else to do in the area. He bit the bullet and took a sip of the stale beer. Hey, barkeep, you got a betting book? Looks like we're trapped here a couple of hours, Grant said. Both Leonard and Ross grunted with happiness. The two of them looked at the spread among tonight's fighters. Grant decided to let them enjoy it, since he had a feeling the rest of the night could be difficult. He thought about how lucky they were that he was such a nice guy. Chapter 35 A woman should never be in public without her husband. Married life is a gift. If the wife is seen without her mate, it will spoil the grand appearances they make together. The Registry Guide for Girls Clothes were flying out of Alex's closet. Mia and Whitney dove to pick up the pieces they liked. This is perfect for you, Alex said. He held up a silk button down and handed it to Whitney. Go try it on right away. Mia knew there was no way that outfit would work. It looked more like women's clothing. Whitney was relishing the attention and scooped up some more pieces before hopping into the bathroom. I haven't seen a fashion show since the last time Frank let me get him new clothes. That was months ago, Alex said. He reached up to the top shelf and pulled down a box of clothes that still had tags. And he won't wear what I buy him anyway. Mia went through the box and wasn't surprised. There were fitted pants and satin paisley print tops. Alex had a different outlook on the world than anyone else she'd ever met. Now was a good time to find out more about his unique perspective. Do you know why the registry exists? Why our world is this way? She asked. He stopped going through clothes, frowned, and sat down on the enormous bed. Sweetie, I wish I did for sure. I know it's not as old as the government wants you to think. Maybe only a hundred years. Well, then how did the armed services start? Why do people throw away sons? You have to know something. Because people are greedy and sons aren't worth any money, he answered. Mia didn't understand why no one could answer her questions. The frustration grew inside her. Don't look so sad, Alex said. I'll tell you what I've heard. The sides of Mia's mouth curled up a little. There was a great war, about a hundred years ago. All able-bodied men were called into action and sent somewhere across the ocean. That's how mandatory enlistment got its start. 
Alex's version matched up with Andrew's. Mia wanted Alex to tell her something new. Did women ever serve? Mia asked. I heard they used to have women soldiers, but after the population scare, they were needed back here more than on the front lines. Alex didn't seem interested in female soldiers. He continued. See, all the men were away. The women back home were vulnerable. Something happened. I don't know what, but the home population took a big hit. When the war was over, there wasn't much of a home to come back to. Americans had to build from the ground up again. That's how the registry was started. Mia thought back to Whitney's explanation. Alex's ideas didn't match up with the population control story. What happened here? That wiped out the women, I mean, Mia asked. I've heard so many explanations. Other countries invaded. Big bombs, plagues, nuclear explosions. You think of it? I've heard it, Alex commented. Why wouldn't the government want the people to know? I know the registry saved the country after it almost collapsed. But what caused the war? Alex looked stunned at Mia's comments. I guess I never thought about it. In military training, they make it clear that we won the war and earned the respect of the world. It would have felt unpatriotic to ask. And up till Steffi, I didn't really question much. If this was the version Alex found credible, Mia was curious what other explanations he'd heard. Before she had the opportunity to ask, the bathroom door swung open and Whitney stepped out in her silk shirt. This is the most beautiful outfit I've ever worn, she said as she twirled around. But I don't think I can pass for a lost boy. Mia clapped her hands and laughed. Alex joined in. She let her concern slip away and went back to sorting through the mess of clothing. The reason for the registry's existence, whatever it was, didn't matter. At least, not right now. Chapter 36 Failure to report for service will result in an immediate death sentence. Reporting is your first act of courage. The Boy's Guide to Service Peals of laughter came from upstairs, and Andrew was curious what the girls and Alex found so amusing. But he wasn't curious enough to ask. Frank handed him another stack of blankets to line the back of the van with. It was a long drive to St. Louis, and they were going to keep the girls as comfy as possible. It was approaching midnight, and the summer wind produced a slight chill. Andrew threw the bedding down and wished he could travel in the back. It would be nice to lie down, maybe even fall asleep. Even though the drive would take eight hours, Andrew doubted he would sleep at all. He had never been that far south, and while he had gone to school in a major city, he wasn't a fan of big city life. Frank was no help. He was sending them off but had no clue to whom or for how long. So far, Frank had been a gracious host. Andrew took his first real shower in days, and Frank gave him some new clothes. Andrew was happy to have a pair of jeans with a plain white t-shirt on again. He was scared the pants wouldn't be long enough, but they were a perfect fit. Because they were leaving so soon, there was not enough time to wash their clothing, so Frank gave Andrew some extra items. He laughed when he thought about the sorry state of the packs the girls had originally brought with them. This time, Andrew got them all ready and made sure they had necessities like clothes, food, and water. He chose hearty food that would be filling and last a while. Frank thought this was unnecessary and wanted to give him the leftover chicken, but Andrew knew that would hold only for a day at best, and he needed something more reliable. I think that about does it. We're ready to go. Frank leaned against the house as Andrew closed the door to the cab, dropping his pack inside. Before we get the girls down and say our goodbyes, why don't you and I talk? Andrew had known this was coming. Frank wanted to talk about the knife incident. Andrew had been hoping to avoid this. He had no intention of apologizing. He felt his actions were appropriate. 
He had promised Mia he would help her, and that included providing protection whenever necessary. Maybe you should part ways with the ladies. You could stay here with us if you want, Frank said. Andrew was shocked by his suggestion. You haven't been identified yet. They're blaming this whole thing on a trucker, but the deeper you get into it, the harder it will be to pull yourself out. Andrew understood Frank's warning. If he were caught, it would be death or life in service. Taking into account the whole situation, odds were on the former. The memory of the young fighter he had killed came to mind, as did the image of Mia. He couldn't seem to get her out of his head. The way she made him feel was unnatural, like he knew he should stay away from her but couldn't bring himself to do it. He knew it would be impossible to stop now. He shook his head. Frank nodded in return. That's how I thought you would respond, but I had to tell you anyway. You're not planning on crossing that border, are you? Andrew shook his head again. He knew that was a crazy idea. Good boy. You'll be surprised how fast the four years will go by, and then you can find her. I'm sure she'll wait for you. What was Frank talking about? Andrew asked himself. Who would he be looking for? Mia. No, Frank had the wrong idea. The thought of waiting around for a girl angered Andrew. He was a man. He was entitled to pick his mate. He would earn that right when he finished his service. He would never have to search one out. He could feel the rage bubbling inside of him as Frank continued to talk. He wanted to wring the man's neck, but instead took a deep breath and gritted his teeth before interrupting. You are mistaken. I am helping her because she blackmailed me. I have no plans to contact her ever again. I am an American male, and I plan on getting a girl through the registry after I complete my time and am ready to settle down. Andrew could tell Frank was surprised by his response, but he also knew the tone in which it was delivered closed the conversation. Frank gave Andrew a meek smile before yelling inside for the girls. Alex walked down with Mia and Whitney. All three were smiling over their new friendship. Both of the girls had taken showers and changed clothes as well. Whitney's black eye was starting to heal, and her jeans and plaid shirt hit her gender almost as well as the shiner. Mia was toned down too. She wore a pair of black work pants that looked like a tent, belted, no doubt. Her new top was a gray mechanic shirt. It did a better job of hiding her figure than the t-shirt had. She still looked like a girl, though. Andrew looked her up and down again. Her smile was what did it. It was light and feminine. It almost made him smile just seeing it. Andrew looked away. He needed to stop thinking about her features. All that mattered was that she pass as a boy, and overall, Andrew was happy with the transformation. He didn't think he would have to worry as much about their being found out with their new apparel. Andrew walked up and shook Alex's hand before heading to the van. He climbed into the driver's seat and waited. He was taking the first shift on the road, giving Frank the chance to catch some sleep. After all, Frank had to turn around and drive right back. Andrew glanced back toward the house and noticed the tears in the girl's eyes. He thought it was ridiculous how upset they were. If they wanted to act like men, they needed to stop it with the tears. But there stood Alex blubbering with them. Andrew wanted to honk the horn and hurry them along. It was crazy how all of them were behaving. They were strangers. The goodbyes were said, and Frank helped the girls into the back. He gave Alex a short hug and slid into the passenger seat. Frank repeated the directions, but Andrew didn't need him to. If anything, the Midwest area was predictable, and the entire trip would be mostly on one road. Andrew backed the van out and took off. He was happy when Frank started to doze. Andrew wanted the quiet. He tried to focus his energy on reciting the military codes he had memorized. His dream was still to make the Air Force, and he had to study before the placement exam. He had dreamed of piloting planes since he learned of flight. His mind wandered to flying fighter jets across the sky. 
Yet, even in his fantasies, Mia's face seemed a constant he couldn't shake. He reminded himself that she was just some pretty girl. There was nothing special about her. He snapped his attention back to the road and focused on his studies again as he drove through the dark. Chapter 37 Post-service is always a period of adjustment. Re-enlistment is an option for those who miss the exhilaration of battle. The Boy's Guide to Service Grant prided himself on being a man of structure. He was trained well and knew how to keep himself in top physical and mental shape. Staying up this late was not part of his daily practice. It was almost 2 a.m., and the boring Midwest area scenery was just as dull at night as during the day. He drove the agent's black SUV, which had no sunroof to let in any glimpse of the stars. The men were too interested in the fighting youths to notice that Grant had slipped away with their car. He knew where he was going and what he needed to do. Leonard and Ross were of no use to him, at this point in time anyway. The second shift bartender had been much more responsive. He remembered a thin new boy looking for honest work. It was Grant's lucky night, because the worker also remembered who he left with a wealthy man named Frank Piazzi, who lived well below his means in a tiny farmhouse about an hour away. Grant thought it was odd that someone who lived an hour away could be considered a local, but a lot of things out this way were odd. Grant wasn't excited about picking up his wife. He wasn't sure what her punishment would be yet. The thought of her running away and rejecting him was driving him to rage. She did not have the right to make any decisions, let alone turn him down. Her punishment would have to be severe. He was debating making her kill her friends, or at least watch helplessly while he did. Maybe if she could learn her place, their marriage could still work. Either way, he planned on taking all three of them back to his estate. Another reason to ditch the agents. The dilapidated house came into view. The bartender's directions were dead on, and it would have been impossible to miss this place. Grant threw the car into park and pulled out his bag from the back seat. It was filled with some specialty items from his own collection. Several handguns, knives, and other fighting equipment. He smiled to himself when he pulled out what he was looking for. Lunar vision glasses. They looked just like sunglasses, a little stylish even. These were one of his earliest inventions. They were smaller than night vision goggles, and unlike those bulky tools, they allowed the viewer to see everything as if it were day. There were no foggy green images. It was like having a personal sun. They didn't go with his outfit, but he doubted anyone was going to comment on his fashion sense tonight. A barn loomed in the back of the house. Grant had a feeling that was where he would find his wife fast asleep on some makeshift bed. He thought about how she'd chopped off her hair and decided he wouldn't be able to show her off until it grew back. Another reason to maybe just kill her. He swung open the barn doors and scared a chicken, which flew low through the air in front of him. The stench was awful. Grant hated the smell of the whole area. It didn't sound like the chicken had woken anyone, not that it mattered. He reached into his bag and pulled out a gun. He decided it would be easiest to hold one of them hostage in order to make the other two comply. After surveying the floor, his eyes caught a glimpse of the rickety stairs. He looked up at the loft and thought it was a good place to house boys. He cursed himself for not packing his heat sensor. He didn't want to walk all the way to the top if nobody was there. Grant slowly walked up the steps not wanting to wake anyone and lose whatever surprise he had left. He came upon the row of unused beds. He felt the first couple, and none of them were warm or looked slept in. It didn't look like anyone had been there at all. Grant's anger rose when he thought the bartender had lied to him and sent him on a wild goose chase. Even though the stairs were dangerous, Grant showed no fear as he walked down, kicking a feeding trough at the bottom of the steps. Grant began to head back toward the car. He was growing determined to destroy the bartender when he caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of his eye. A fence, 
with parts painted white. He strolled over to examine it and noticed three brushes drying out. A coy smile crossed his face. They were here. He stared up at the creepy old house and assumed they were inside. Grant might not have been a countryman, but he knew it was unheard of to house a laborer in your home. It was more common to force them to sleep on your lawn than under your roof. This discovery could mean only one thing. Piazzi knew. This changed Grant's plan. At first, he had thought of him as an innocent bystander, but now he was the responsible party in need of punishment. Grant was thrilled by this knowledge, pleased at how the night had turned out. It was simple to break into the old house. Grant just slid open the back door. He laughed to himself at how trusting people were in this area. While the interior was much finer than Grant had anticipated, the house was still small. He did a quick search through it. He noticed a pile of dirty clothes in the basement, far too many for one person, and five dishes set in the dishwasher. This was all the confirmation he needed to know that Mia was here. The array of pictures in the front room made it clear the Piazzis were a gay couple. Grant could not begin to comprehend what these men would have to gain from helping a runaway girl. He didn't care either. The fact that they were helping her was enough to lock them up for the rest of their lives. Grant examined the rest of the house. Only one person was present. Grant was pleased the man didn't wake up when Grant opened his bedroom door. Rather than act without a plan, Grant retreated back to the kitchen and poured himself a glass of water while debating his next move. Based on some letters on the counter, Grant found out that the man's name must be Alex. Grant did feel some relief at Mia's absence. His game of cat and mouse was not over, and he already had his next step lined up. He walked back upstairs and into the room where Alex was still fast asleep. Grant watched him for a moment. He was in a huge mahogany bed that took up almost the entire room. Everything was decorated in deep royal blues, including the man's silk pajamas. Grant noted that while Alex looked in peak shape, he probably would not be a fighter, and Grant had little to worry about. He removed his glasses, flipped on the light, sat on the bed, and introduced himself. Hello, I'm Grant Marsden. You can call me Mr. Marsden. The sleeping man jumped up, shocked by Grant's presence. Grant watched as the man struggled to adjust to the new brightness. He noticed the clock. It was almost 4 a.m. He hated being up this late and hoped to wrap it up soon. I hear you've met my wife, Grant said. Where is she? Alex rubbed his eyes and swung his legs out of bed to stand up. However, Grant grabbed one of his limbs and flipped him back down on the pillow. Please don't get up on my account, Grant stood. Don't lie to me either. You'll make this harder on yourself. I don't know what you're talking about. Grant brandished his gun and pointed it at Alex. As the man's fear grew, Grant could feel his own smile grow. In a quick move, he flipped the gun and gave Alex a smash with the butt, right into his nose. The crack of the bone echoed. Alex let out a cry and held his hands over his broken face. Again, where is she? Grant didn't show any agitation. I don't know, Alex said. His voice was muffled by his hands. Grant was readying to strike him again when Alex blurted, My husband took her, someplace safe, I don't know where. Please don't hurt me. I thought gay couples told each other everything. Don't you see each other as equals? He's paranoid. He didn't want to tell me in case something like this happened. Alex was sobbing. Well, I have to give him credit. You did fold quickly. When will he be back? Tomorrow, sometime in the afternoon. Alex didn't hesitate. Grant knew anyone who responded this fast wasn't lying. The man had no additional information. That gives us some time. I need to get some sleep anyway. Grant stretched his arms over his head and beamed devilishly. 
but what to do with you. Chapter 38 All will be done to ensure every female is matched with a husband. If after a year's time no match has been made, she will be married to the government, where she will still be protected. However, she will not have the same privileges as a wife. The Registry Guide for Girls Dawn was breaking, and the lightning sky woke Mia from her deep sleep. She was surprised how comfortable the back of the van was. Whitney stirred as Mia sat up. She went to the window. In the distance, she could see the outlines of massive buildings. Their projection against the morning sky was beautiful. Whitney appeared behind her and seemed just as in awe of the skyline. This was the first time either girl had seen a large city. It's fantastic. So many people. I can't wait. Whitney was filled with excitement. More people means more chances to get caught, Mia said. She was having second thoughts about this. Well, if we get caught, maybe it's for the best. Why would you say that? Mia asked. She didn't understand why Whitney still didn't think escape was the best option, why her friend was still filled with doubts. I'm scared, Whitney said with a shrug. Maybe I still would have been chosen. There were still six months left on my page. I'm scared too, but trust me, this is better than any alternative. Mia reached out and grabbed Whitney's hand. You deserve better than a life as a punching bag. It will all be worth it in the end. You're right. Whitney did not sound sincere. I guess being in the back of a vehicle just jars me a little now. Before Mia knew it, the large buildings were looming over her head, and the van was slowing to a stop. The height of the structures blocked out the blossoming sun, and a chill made its way down Mia's back. She opened the back door and hopped down. She offered Whitney a hand, but before it was accepted, Andrew rounded the vehicle and lifted Whitney to the ground. The trio walked around the van to the driver's side window, which Frank rolled down. Now walk up this street, and the contact will find you. He'll ask you, do you know how to type? Frank said. Frank's mouth hung open. Mia could tell he was uncomfortable and unsure of his words. Thank you, and Alex too, Mia said. If you're ever in Mexico, look us up. Frank nodded and smiled. He appeared happy. Mia's kind words meant he didn't have to make any more statements. She owed so much to this man and wanted him to know it, but decided to smile back and wave rather than give him any speech. Andrew nodded his head while Whitney waited on the sidewalk. Mia and Andrew backed up while Frank turned the van around and started his journey home to his love. Mia smiled at this idea. She kept beaming and glanced at Andrew. He glanced down, then gave her a peculiar look. Looking away, she reminded herself that this escape wasn't about starting a relationship. It was about never having to enter into one. But after seeing Frank and Alex together, her perspective was changing. She hoped her life would lead her to a relationship based on trust and compassion, where two individuals worked as a whole, not one where she was property. Whitney was bugging Andrew. She asked questions about the car ride and what was going to happen next. It was clear he didn't know the answers. But Mia didn't feel the need to step in and save him. She was scared and wanted silence, and hoped Andrew would yell at Whitney to stop talking, but knew that was unlikely. Instead, he would tune her out and let her ramble on. She sighed as the group walked to meet their mystery helper. The shade of the buildings provided little relief from the afternoon heat. Mia felt sweat pour down her brow. Any cleanliness from last night's shower was gone. Her stomach growled in pain, too. It was empty. Whitney wasn't faring much better. She had switched from asking too many questions to asking none at all. Mia was worried by her friend's behavior, but didn't know what else there was to say. She couldn't force years of programming out of Whitney's head. On the other hand, Andrew looked unfazed by the heat or hunger. Mia wished she could read him better. 
A whirlwind of men in suits walked past, ignoring them. At first, Mia was afraid of her new surroundings. But then she realized nobody was giving her a second thought. They were abandoned boys, and nobody bothered to look at them. Mia understood why Andrew didn't want to take a break. The path ahead of them was too unknown. Soon the booming city street calmed down, and they ended up in a quieter section. While Mia felt a sense of safety at the absence of the noise, she had a feeling they had missed their contact. She figured at least they were farther south. It would be easy to revert back to the original plan of having Andrew escort them to the border. She took comfort in that thought. Her contemplations were broken when someone walked out of one of the tinier buildings. It was a woman. She was tall and plain. Her hair was pulled tight into a bun on the top of her head. She wore a straight, long navy skirt and a white blouse. She was the first woman Mia had seen on their travels. She walked straight up to the group. Mia wanted to tell the woman to leave them alone, that they were boys and women shouldn't associate with males. Excuse me, do you know how to type? She asked. Fear lumped in Mia's throat. Andrew looked shocked and frozen, but Whitney was clearly relieved by the woman's presence. Yes, we love to type, Whitney said in her normal voice. Mia didn't think she'd ever seen Whitney so eager. Well, hurry, follow me. She turned and walked back into the building. Whitney bounced with joy behind her. Mia looked at Andrew for approval. He didn't respond, but instead walked behind Whitney. Mia sighed and entered the building. It was about 20 stories tall and made of brick. The woman walked up the stairs with speed, waving her hand for them to follow her. We have a project. We can pay you each $20. It shouldn't take you more than the afternoon, maybe the morning, the woman said. After climbing several flights, she pushed open a door to reveal an office. Multiple desks were set up with computers. Mia had to hide her wonderment. At the desks were women, all dressed like their mystery helper, working away at computers. Mia had never thought a place like this existed, not in America, at least. The woman kept walking toward the back of the office. Nobody looked away from her work. The side walls held private offices, most of them with closed doors, but the ones that were open showed men sitting at desks. Mia jerked her head forward to avoid drawing anyone's attention, but these people seemed so dedicated, she thought she could have sung opera music and nobody would have lifted their heads. They were led to a bank of computers along the back wall. The screens faced outward so anyone in the office could see their contents. The woman signaled for them to sit and walked to her desk. She came back with three stacks of paper and handed one to each of them. Enter these. Just retype them into the program. She leaned over Whitney's shoulder and double-clicked a file. A page opened with spots for different information, names, addresses, and other basic questions. Mia was confused. She looked toward Andrew with bewilderment. She wondered if he knew what was going on, but, stone-faced, he opened the same program and began entering items. Whitney started clicking at the keys with enthusiasm. It felt like a parallel universe had taken over. Mia was lost. She worried they had met the wrong person, and this was a real situation where young men were being hired to work. It was the equivalent of farm help for the city boy. Andrew gave her foot a swift kick and signaled for her to start. She blinked away tears of frustration and opened the program. She had never used a computer in her life. It was difficult, but Andrew looked just as awkward, while Whitney was right at home, following the instructions and catching on quickly. She told herself to remain patient. Even if this was a mistake, she knew she shouldn't draw any unwanted attention. She began entering the information, wishing for the day's end. Chapter 39 Soldiers are always ready and prepared for battle. War is necessary to defend what is ours. The Boy's Guide to Service Grant heard someone walk into the house and his eyes flew open. 
He checked the time. It was 4 p.m. A solid eight hours of sleep. He felt great. He heard a voice he assumed belonged to Frank calling for Alex. Grant decided not to stir. He propped himself up on one arm and waited for Frank to enter the bedroom. I'm starving. What do you want for- Frank's voice trailed off as he opened the bedroom door and saw Grant, lying in his bed, in his clothes. Grant winked and gave Frank a little wave. He was enjoying the look on Frank's face. It was a nice mix of desperation, anger, and confusion. Sorry about the pajamas, but those silky ones weren't me, and I didn't bring an overnight bag. Grant swung out of bed. If you give me a minute, I'll change back. Where's Alex? Frank asked. Grant was sure he didn't need any introduction. Oh, so you're looking for your spouse. You think I should tell you where he is? Grant, never the bashful one, changed back into his shorts and polo, while Frank looked on, dumbfounded. Let's make a trade. Tell me where mine is, and I'll show you yours. I don't know, Frank started to say before Grant cut him off. What is with you two and the lying? I don't tolerate it well. You said you were hungry. Let's go down to the kitchen. You can make me a snack. Grant pushed past Frank and strolled down the steps. He went into the kitchen and pulled out a container of leftovers. He searched the drawers for a piece of silverware. Frank followed. If you're looking for a gun, I took them all. Couldn't have you surprising me. And of course, if you kill me, you'll never find him. Grant picked at his food. This is tasty. Did she help you make it? I haven't had the chance to enjoy her cooking yet. Frank sat at the kitchen table. Grant thought the man was doing a good job remaining collected. He could tell a small sweat was breaking out on Frank's forehead. We can make this quick and easy. You tell me where you took her, and I'll show you where Alex is. And since at this point it's just me and no rag agents present, as long as you tell me the truth, the two of you will face no charges for your vicious, dirty crimes, Grant said. Grant wanted to keep the room light. He didn't like having to make deals like this, but it was the best way to get what he wanted. He couldn't believe the older man was not jumping on his offer. Grant decided to drive it home. I think your lifestyle is honorable. I do. It's not for me, though. You see, you and Alex see each other as equals, and rightly so. You're both males, both did your time in service. Both have the same opportunities. I could never live life that way. Grant walked toward the table. I don't want an equal. Would never want an equal. See, if we were in different positions here, flipped spots, and you had Mia somewhere threatening me, I would laugh at you. I wouldn't care about her enough to give up. Your relationship makes you weak. Grant had hoped to elicit more of a response from Frank, but so far he was being difficult. If you don't care about her, then why don't you let her be? Frank asked. Well, Frank, because I am me and she is mine. Grant was about to lose his temper. We both know this exchange of information is going to happen, so stop wasting my time. Frank gave Grant a smirk. It looked like he thought he had the upper hand. Grant wanted to bash the man's face in and began to feel for his gun when it occurred to him that this was still the best path to take. This man was stupid enough to care about someone else more than himself. You know, I've had about 12 hours with your husband. Not all of them were fun. Grant made an exaggerated frown and conjured up a baby voice. I bet he's in a lot of pain and scared, too. This tactic seemed to work. Frank couldn't hide his distress anymore. Grant enjoyed watching him squirm in his chair. And if you even think of lying to me, I will hunt you both down and make sure you never see each other again. Maybe I'll kill him and force you to spend the rest of your life as my personal servant. Grant could tell Frank was about to break. I'm not sure exactly where she is. I can tell you where I dropped her and what I know. 
Frank said. Outskirts of St. Louis. Grant closed his eyes and smiled. It was a while since he'd been to the gateway of the West. He was thrilled with the idea of going to a big city. She was on his turf now. Frank continued with the details he knew, the three traveling together and whatnot. Well, good sir, a deal is a deal. Grant rose from the table and opened the back door, urging Frank to follow. I hope you learned your lesson from this and think next time you try to keep a man from his wife. The doors to the barn swung right open. Grant picked up a shovel leaning against the bottom of the stairs and tossed it to Frank. There's a piece of piping sticking up in the corner. Grant pointed to a skinny tube. Dig down. The other end goes to your husband's mouth. Fire glared in Frank's eyes as he raced to the corner. You're a psychopath, Frank said as he dug. Thanks. Grant strolled out the barn door and back to the SUV. He called Leonard and explained he was coming back to the bar. Grant wasn't surprised to hear that Leonard was grumpy. The rag agents had been forced to sleep on cots in the back. Grant hung up the phone and made another call, setting up his helicopter and readying his team. It was time to put them to work. Turning up the radio, he drove back the way he had come, ecstatic that the chase wasn't over yet. Chapter 40 Girls who fail to wed will lack personal satisfaction. They will never know the feeling of pure love that a wife comes to expect every day of her married life. The Registry Guide for Girls The afternoon was never-ending. Mia had such a hard time entering the names, her knuckles were cramping. Andrew looked even more uncoordinated. Whitney was moving along, finishing her stack and the majority of Mia's. Mia couldn't understand how Whitney was able to catch on so fast, but she seemed enthralled. Mia noticed that men would exit their offices one at a time. Two or three women would stand and follow each man out, not even taking the time to shut down their computers. She guessed the man was married to all the women who followed him, but remembered multiple marriages were forbidden. Mia's father had told her that bit of information, but he had also said he expected the law to change sometime in the near future. He warned Mia that when she got older, she might have to compete with another wife for her husband's affection. The sun had set some time ago, yet there were still three men and their work groups. An hour later, it was down to one man, two women, their mystery helper, and them. Mia thought the office looked futuristic, doused in the rays of the screen's light. Soon the last man poked his head out of his office. He was about 60 years old, balding and worn down. He walked over to their pods. Mia did her best to make it look like she was working hard. The noise of the keys clacking increased as he walked out. Are you finished? His voice was angry. All three stopped typing but didn't move. Mia didn't think any of them were prepared to speak. No. The woman walked over and handed them each more paper. I have more for them to do. The man grunted but didn't seem to mind too much. I've got to get home to my wife. It's getting late, he said. You three can come back tomorrow. The last of the women workers stood and prepared to follow him. He sighed and put on his cap. Mia and her friends rose to trail him as well. They started walking toward the exit in a group. Sir, these young boys are new in town. They don't have anywhere to go, their mystery helper said. The man rolled his eyes, clearly not interested in their plight. Fine, give them an empty room. He walked at a brisk pace. Mia struggled to keep up without breaking into a run. Just for one night, though, and it's coming out of their pay. No food either. The group entered a small room. Mia didn't know what they were doing. It was awkward for so many to stand in such a small space. The doors to the room closed, and it began moving. Mia was terrified. They were going at a slow pace, but she couldn't tell in what direction. 
She wanted to grab onto Andrew, but knew it would be inappropriate. Cool, Whitney said. The room crawled to a stop and the doors opened. They were somewhere different. A skinny hall lined with rooms on each side. Their guide stepped out and sped halfway down the hall. As the girls and Andrew followed her out of the moving room, she produced a key and opened a door. You'll stay here tonight. The bathroom is at the end of the hall. Try to keep to your room. I don't think there are any other people staying on this floor. The room was almost as small as the moving closet. A set of bunked beds took up the majority of the space. It wasn't large enough for all three of them. Mia wanted to request another room, but had a feeling it might not go over so well. Work starts at 7 a.m. She was leaving, but Mia saw the woman slip something into Andrew's palm. The ding of the tiny movable closet sounded, and then the three of them were alone. Mia threw her bag on the top bed and climbed up the side. She was surprised nobody was pouting about their small quarters. Whitney's eyes focused on Andrew. She wanted to know about whatever the woman had handed him. Well? Whitney asked. It's a note. It says she'll come back later. Andrew yawned. Till then we have to sit tight. Wasn't that the most fascinating work ever? Whitney asked. I didn't know women worked like that, did you? It didn't look like they were having fun. Most of them looked pretty unhappy. Mia took some food out of her pack. Keep your voice down. I thought it was fabulous. What is this place? A government building, Andrew said. Is this a safe idea, working here? Mia asked. It's the only place women are allowed to work. All of these women are married to the government, Andrew said. They all sleep somewhere in here, too. My guess is they're not allowed outside much. How do you know that? Mia asked. Women were the teachers in the orphanage, Andrew said. None of her sisters had ever mentioned female teachers at finishing school, but then she remembered all the schools were private organizations. I thought women just got awful work, like being a maid or a factory worker, Whitney said. Why did you think that? Andrew laughed a little. But it doesn't matter. Whatever they do, it's a terrible life. I wouldn't mind working like they did today. That wasn't so bad. Whitney sounded genuine. It felt like I was using my brain, trying to figure out what keys to punch and how to do it fastest. They work seven days a week, long hours each day. A lot of them get burned out and retired, Andrew said. I wouldn't wish that life on anyone. I don't believe you, Whitney said. She turned her attention toward Mia. You know the reason I came along was because I didn't want to work as a maid. If I knew this life was an option, I might have changed my mind. It's not an option anymore, Mia said from the top bunk. Are you thinking about deserting us? Andrew asked. No, Mia answered for Whitney, hoping to avoid any confrontation between the two. You can ask our helper about it when she gets here, Whitney. But I bet Andrew's right. That seemed to put a stop to the conversation. Mia started to regret bringing her friend. Whitney did seem right at home plugging away on the computer. Maybe life as government property wouldn't have been so bad for her. Truthfully, Mia's biggest concern was Whitney's safety and not necessarily her happiness. Pangs of selfishness crossed her mind. Chapter 41 Transitioning from single to married life is exciting. A bride can expect to receive guidance from her husband on the adjustment, but she is now part of the world of pleasure. The Registry Guide for Girls The top bunk came so close to the ceiling that Mia didn't have much choice but to examine the cracks in the plaster. If she sat up, her head almost hit the ceiling. She doubted Andrew would be able to do the same without breaking through the plaster. Andrew used the time to do push-ups and crunches. Mia assumed Whitney was upset, feeling tricked into coming on this journey for nothing. Mia did feel bad, but she didn't know women were allowed to do anything but be maids or factory workers either. 
If work started at 7 a.m., those women put in more than 12 hours a day. That was harder than her father worked any employee, even during harvest season. Seven days like that would drive anyone crazy. Part of her wanted to go take a shower, but she decided that was too risky. Instead, she listened to Andrew breathe and counted the cracks in the ceiling. She was moments away from dozing off when the door to their tiny room opened. The woman entered. Her hair was in a long braid that hung down her back. She was dressed in a navy blue robe, navy blue slippers, and navy blue pants. They appeared plain and uncomfortable. Along with her change of clothes, her demeanor had also changed. Her face looked warm and welcoming. When Mia looked at her, she felt some pangs of missing her own mother, but shook the thoughts away. It was doubtful her mother missed her. Hello, I'm Lisa, the woman said in a soft voice. I don't have much time. My roommate thinks I ran to the bathroom. Lisa reached into her pocket and produced a sealed envelope. She glanced at all three of them before handing it over to Andrew. He started to open the back. No, Lisa said. Don't open it till tomorrow, when you get to the train station. Why? Whitney's voice sounded hopeful for a change. Those are train tickets. I don't know where you're going and I don't want to know. It is important to cover your tracks as much as possible. Just make sure you're at the station by 7 a.m. Her hand went back into her robe and pulled out a little map. She handed it over to Andrew as well. But don't you already know? Didn't you buy the tickets? Whitney asked. No. Lisa raised her hand to her mouth, covering a little giggle. It was obvious Lisa wasn't allowed all the privileges Whitney had imagined. There are a lot of things that go into helping people like you. It takes a team to move you. I'm just a middle person. So you didn't speak to Frank? Whitney sounded upset. She was realizing Lisa's job wasn't glamorous. If Lisa had spoken with Frank, that meant she had internet access. Mia had been shocked enough to see women on computers, but she knew there was no way they were connected. Who's Frank? Never mind, I don't want to know. Keep everything about your travels to yourselves. Lisa shook her head. One of my associates contacted your previous assistant, probably over a message board. What message board? Mia asked. Their helper bit her lip and looked nervous. Mia didn't understand why she didn't want to share information. Innocent-looking ones, where people get together and discuss puppies or poetry. There are lots of them on the web. You just need to know what to look for, to make sure it's not a trap, before you respond. What do you look for? Mia asked. I don't know for sure. Ones that look cryptic, not obvious, Lisa said. That's not my part in the plan. How did you get your job? Whitney asked. Mia realized she and Whitney were not interested in the same things. Mia wanted information to help them break free, while Whitney was still in too much awe of Lisa's occupation. There was no use asking more questions. Whitney was taking charge. So Mia leaned back and listened. Andrew appeared to do the same. Lisa seemed pleased the subject was changed. Well, I wasn't picked from the registry, and one day someone from the government showed up at my parents' house and took me away. I did some more testing and ended up here. That was about ten years ago now. Mia was shocked that Lisa was only twenty-nine. She looked far older than her years. Nobody picked me either, so I ran, Whitney said. I didn't know I had any options, that I could end up like you. You don't want to end up like me. I live in a tiny box, never get outside, work all the time, eat when and what they tell me, dress how they tell me. It's no life. It's prison, Lisa said. There's lots of pressure to go fast and be productive. If you're not, you risk the chance of being put into retirement. You're doing the right thing by running. Mia hoped Lisa was getting through to Whitney. If it's so bad, then why don't you run too? Whitney asked without a hint of sarcasm. 
I'm too old now, Lisa said, and I have something worth staying around for. I get to help people like you. Whitney was about to ask another question when Lisa moved back to the door. Wait, Mia said. Do you know why the registry exists? Lisa glanced outside the door and pulled her head back into the room. Mia noticed she was plain but still pretty. Her eyes were huge, her irises bright blue perfect circles, and really her only distinguishing feature. Mia was confused that this young woman didn't find a husband. Then she thought about the appraisal tests, with the questions Mia had struggled to answer. She wondered how easy it was for Lisa to breeze through those questions. Probably just as easy as it had been for Whitney. Maybe the government was punishing intelligent females. Yes, Lisa said, breaking Mia's thoughts. During the Great War, the government accidentally wiped out more than half the home population. All the men and some of the women were off fighting somewhere across the ocean. The soldiers came home to find males outnumbered females significantly and were prepared to fight over the women who had survived. The registry was put in place for female protection and to avoid civil war. Mia was stunned by this response. It was a crazy idea. Yet Lisa repeated it with such authority. The government had caused the population to be wiped out? How did they wipe us out? Why? Lisa did not look interested in Mia's questions. She was so nervous. I'm not sure. I have to go. Remember, the train station at 7 a.m. Don't open the envelope till you get there. It was nice meeting you all. Good luck. She closed the door behind her. And just like that, she was gone. Chapter 42 Enemies lurk around every corner. Anyone, any nation, that disagrees with our philosophy of prosperity and security is an imminent threat. The Boy's Guide to Service It was almost 10 p.m. when Grant's helicopter touched down on the roof of the hotel. As soon as it landed, he jumped out, spread his arms, and took a deep breath. He loved the smell of the city. Leonard and Ross clearly did not share his enthusiasm. They pulled themselves out of the chopper looking disheveled. Grant had laughed when he first saw them back at the bar. Their suits weren't so impressive after being slept in. The men were angry about their night, but Grant didn't care. He had made progress. Someone from the hotel was waiting for them on the roof. Their contact pulled open the doors and gave each of them a room key. Grant knew Leonard and Ross wanted to go straight to bed, but he had to brief them first. The gentleman led them into a conference room where an entire operation was set up. Computers, maps, and weapons lined the room. Grant turned and noted the expression on his counterparts' faces. He knew he was good, and they were impressed. Delight ran through Grant's body when he saw Rex, his head of security. A Marine who had done double service, dark and intimidating, he stood about six foot six and approached 300 pounds of pure muscle. The two friends hugged in a quick embrace. You have an update for me? Grant asked. We have her picture distributed to all major publications and news teams. We digitally shortened her hair, as you requested. Grant examined the photo. The haircut almost suited her. It accentuated her cheekbones. Maybe he wouldn't kill her after all. He handed the photos to Leonard and nodded to Rex. We have ten men patrolling the train station and five at the bus station. If she's in the city, she's not getting out, Rex said. What if someone drives her out? Leonard asked. Rex puffed out his chest and crossed his arms. Grant knew Rex didn't take well to other strategies. Rex, these are RAG agents Leonard and Ross. Leonard is the regional commander. Grant misstated his title on purpose. Regional coordinator. I'm fourth in charge of the whole organization. Leonard tried to stick out his chest now. I can call the local office and have roadblocks in place. Do what you want, but it's a waste of time. I already have my private team set up. 
Grant said with a yawn. I need to lie down for a while. I'll be back here around 5 a.m. for another briefing. Then I'll hit the train station. Why don't we all do the same? Why is it a waste? Leonard asked. Grant's eyes widened. This whole time, Leonard had never been a problem. If he started questioning too much, he would go the way of Agent Jeffries. She's getting help from professionals. These people have a lot to lose. They want to take as little risk as possible. It is much easier to set her up on a train or a bus. It wouldn't be an airplane because she couldn't get aboard without an ID. They are also well connected. If they hear of roadblocks, they will just wait them out, Agent Ross said. Grant smirked. He placed a hand on Agent Ross's back. Maybe I underestimated you. Agent Ross, was it? Grant escorted the men out of the conference room. He was pleased with the young agent's observations. He hoped he would prove useful in the morning at the station. Chapter 43 Premarital physical contact between the sexes is forbidden. It is not enjoyable and results in an unsatisfying life. Remaining untainted is the first thing a young woman can do to please her future husband. It intensifies the bond between husband and wife. The Registry Guide for Girls After Lisa left, nobody spoke. Tension filled the room, and there was no rush to break it. Silence was not something Mia was accustomed to. She climbed off the top bed and sat next to Whitney, who was lying down on the bottom bunk. Andrew used this moment to toss the envelope on the desk and resume his push-ups, counting under his breath with each repetition. Do you feel any better? After what Lisa said, Mia asked Whitney, hoping her friend was happy they were fleeing. Yes. Whitney turned to face Mia. But I wonder what other jobs there are for girls. If there's this place, there are others. Maybe some of them treat the girls better. I'm sure they are all like this or worse, Mia said. Besides, would you want to live in constant fear of retirement? Mia had no clue what retirement was, but had picked up enough to note it wasn't good. She doubted Whitney knew what it was either, but she wouldn't admit it. You're right, Whitney said and hugged her pillow. I think I need some sleep. It was unlike Whitney not to want a discussion, but Mia convinced herself it was just because she was tired. Mia climbed back up to the top bed. Andrew flipped off the lights. Mia thought they could all use a good night's rest. She closed her eyes and drifted off. Ugh. The sound came from the floor. Mia's eyes flew open, and she looked over. She noted the clock said 12.30 a.m. She had been asleep for two hours, but it didn't feel longer than two minutes. After a moment, her eyes adjusted and she saw Andrew, sighing and shifting, having a difficult time getting comfortable. Hey, she said, why don't you come up here and share with me? She was flustered at her suggestion. She was being so forward. She was shocked when Andrew accepted her offer. He didn't even hesitate. She pressed her body against the wall to make room for him. He slid right in and got under the blanket. Mia remained on her side with her back to the wall while Andrew lay on his back. The bed was small, and there was just an inch between them. The light from the street flooded into their little room and illuminated the white linens. She lifted her head off the pillow and admired how handsome he looked. His dark hair was ruffled, pointing in every direction, and some locks fell down over his forehead. She inched closer to Andrew, not able to take her eyes off him. Cloudy thoughts filled her head. She was unable to think about anything but him. This young man who had nothing, not even a real last name yet, was able to live with such force and not waste a moment on regret. Mia focused on his breathing, watching his lips move as each breath exited his lungs. She thought his lips were perfect. They looked soft and inviting. A haze settled over her. She felt like it was just the two of them. She thought about how brave he was, 
this lost boy who had grown up with nobody caring about him. He was so alone in the world, and she wanted to fill that gap in his life. She'd grown up thinking her first kiss would be with her husband, an American hero who had served his country and was ready to dote on her nonstop, someone who was respected by everyone around him and whom she was eager to serve. They would settle down in a small town where the two of them would be the most famous couple in the area, he for his bravery and Mia for her looks. Now that idea embarrassed her. She felt her first kiss should be with someone strong, supportive, and sensitive. The type of person who stood up for the meek and didn't waste his time thinking of appearances. Andrew. She slowly moved her face closer to Andrew's. Her nose filled with his scent, and her eyelids fluttered as she breathed him in. She was so close they were almost touching. His eyes popped open, and Mia froze. Even in the dark, she had a clear view of his intensity. His eyes focused right on hers. She saw the part of him he tried so hard to hide, the side filled with sensitivity and longing. He lifted his head, barely. It was such a small movement, Mia thought she was dreaming. His eyes closed again as his lips pushed together, up toward her. She followed suit and closed her eyes slightly, leaning down into him, her whole body filled with electricity. Just as their lips were about to touch, his eyes flew back open, and he moved back. What are you doing? He didn't even whisper. Mia pulled back and scooted against the wall. He sat up as much as he could without hitting his head on the ceiling. His face was distorted now. He didn't appear to be able to process what was happening. Were you going to kiss me? He said. His voice was thick with something she couldn't identify. You're, you're married. I'm not interested. You've got problems. Leave me out of this one at least. I, I, I'm sorry. Mia stumbled over her words. I just, I thought, as soon as I drop you off, I'm in service. I'm going to get a decent job and get a wife the legal way, from the registry, Andrew said. Mia was surprised by his outrage. She had always assumed he had distaste for the system, too. She was taken aback by being referred to as married, since she hadn't thought that would matter to Andrew. His words stung. He had never planned on crossing with her. I'm sorry. Mia felt the embarrassment rush in. Just stay away from me, he said. Why are you still here? Mia asked in a whisper, even though she was sure Whitney was awake. If you don't agree with me. You're blackmailing me, remember? And I did agree to help, and I am keeping my promise. He started to move out of the bed and back to the floor. Mia couldn't believe her foolishness. All this time, she had thought they were becoming at the very least friends, or something like it. She had been so sure he didn't buy into the system, that their beliefs were the same. That he, of all people, knew how messed up the registry was. The idea of his taking a wife from the very system he was helping her escape hit Mia like a slap in the face. She realized now he was only doing this because she had forced him. Stunned. Mia lay back down. She was ruining two lives. Poor Whitney believed she had run for nothing, and now Andrew had made it clear where his principles lay. Neither of them saw the world the way she did. On top of all this, she felt dirty and rejected for thinking Andrew might feel something too. She had no reason for believing that. He had never demonstrated anything more than concern for her survival. She was angry at herself for her behavior. She had forced herself on him. That wasn't her. She didn't want romance. In fact, that was exactly what she didn't need, at least not until long after she was a free woman. Mia wished she were alone. For the first time since she'd left home, she felt shame, not for leaving, but for involving others in her dangerous plans. Chapter 44 You will not question your service assignment, 
It is based on your capabilities and what is best for your country. The Boy's Guide to Service Andrew lay on the floor in pitch blackness. Several hours had passed, but his head had never calmed down and sleep was never an option. He didn't know who he was angrier with, Mia or himself. She had tried to kiss him. She had tried to form some sort of relationship with him. Chatting with her to pass the time was one thing, but there was nothing beyond that. He had survived thus far by avoiding friendships, let alone any romantic contact. He wasn't capable of forming an attachment. He thought he had made that clear to her. Besides, she was married, and to a man who'd already served his time. Andrew needed to respect that. He shook his head, ashamed that he had brought up her marriage. He knew this argument was flawed. He couldn't respect someone who treated women so poorly. Andrew still got angry picturing Grant's hand on Mia's chin during their initial meeting. Mia's marriage deserved no recognition. He reminded himself that Mia was different from other girls. She was trying to break all the rules, and Andrew was helping her reach her goal. If she was giving up the ideology she had grown up believing in, maybe it was time he did too. He should have let her kiss him. He wanted to kiss her. At least he thought he did. But what would that kiss mean? Just the feeling of her body hovering over his had felt so right. He knew she was getting too close, but at the time he hadn't cared. The way her heat melted into his was intense. It took every ounce of self-control for him not to wrap his arm around her waist and pull her down on top of him. He wanted to feel the sides of her hips, run his hand up her back. No, he refocused his thoughts again. It was wrong to have these ideas. He reminded himself there were no feelings. His only love was for his country. She was just a girl whom he was helping. That was it. There was no friendship and there was no relationship. He had been right to put her in her place. Then he remembered the feelings that had gone through his body when he opened his eyes and she was leaning over him. Her face had looked even better than it did in his imagination. She was feeling the same urges he was, only she was willing to act on them. It was indescribable. He had never wanted anything as badly as he wanted her in those few seconds. He wanted to allow her hands to explore his body, feel them run through his hair and across his chest. His mind raced back and forth between these arguments all night. If anything happened between the two of them, it would just create problems. They needed to maintain their space. But still, Mia Morrissey was driving him crazy, and he didn't know if that was good or bad. Chapter 45 All brides have some nerves on their wedding night, but there is never any reason to fear a husband. That night is the start of a long, magical journey, for which he is a willing guide. The Registry Guide for Girls In the morning, Mia welcomed the silence. Everyone looked like they'd been put through the ringer, with big black bags under their eyes. Mia spent the morning ignoring Andrew, trying to stay out of his way, still mortified from his outright rejection, and the blame she now saw lay at her feet. The walk to the train station took a little more than half an hour. Mia wondered where the next stop was and how long they would stay there. She hoped it was the last place before Mexico. She was sick of being a fugitive. A poster on the side of a bench caught Mia's eye, and she struggled for breath. It was a picture of her. Neither Andrew nor Whitney seemed to notice, but Mia decided it was time for the baseball cap. A grave thought crossed Mia's mind. The only way people could know she was here was if Frank had been caught. He had risked so much to help her, and now there was a chance his whole life was over. Her throat burned, but she knew tears would draw the wrong type of attention. She could no longer let anyone else risk his or her life for her benefit. As they neared the station, she came to a sudden stop. You two don't have to come with me anymore, Mia said. 
Whitney stopped in her tracks and looked at her with wide eyes. Andrew ignored the statement and kept walking. Go home if that's what you want, Mia said. You don't know where I'm going next. I'll be in no danger because of you. The truth is I don't know what I want. I feel lost, Whitney said. I want your life. I want a husband who chases me around the country. He's not my husband and he's crazy. Mia was confused by Whitney's statement. And what if you end up like Karina or one of the prisoners from her article? Well, I don't think that happens to everyone. She was just unlucky in her match. And the article focused on marriage, right? It didn't say anything about government assignments. I want a husband, but if I can't have that, then I think I'm better off trying to work, like Lisa. I know there's no guarantee, but I'm smart. Maybe I'll end up somewhere rewarding where I can use my brain and challenge myself. There was awkward silence while Mia processed Whitney's stance. She didn't want to leave her best friend. She didn't want her to end up enslaved to a madman. But Whitney made sense. Her price tag was so low she probably wouldn't be wed. And if she wanted to be an office worker for the government, Mia couldn't be the one standing in her way. If that's what you want, you should leave, Mia said. She shivered as the words left her mouth. And what about the people who helped you? Andrew's voice made Mia jump. Frank, Alex, Lisa, the first thing they are going to do is grill you about us, about them. You'll end up giving everyone up. I'll lie, Whitney said, her voice firm. Andrew was so angry his eyes looked like they would shoot out from his skull at any second. You can leave too. I can try it on my own. Mia looked toward him, meeting his eyes for the first time all morning. They were on fire. Both of you are so dumb and proud. He looked to Whitney first. You are selfish. All you care about is yourself and your own future. You don't listen to anything anyone else says. That woman just helped you and told you to run, and you think she was lying? Trying to keep you from some magical life? It's garbage. Turn yourself in and get Mia killed. Maybe you can slide right in and take her spot. And you don't think they'll figure out where we are? They torture people for answers. This is not a game. It's dangerous. Go on. Leave us. You'll be killed as soon as they bleed you for information. Now he turned his attention toward Mia. Most people say thank you when they're getting help, but not you. You think you're so special, being so pretty and worth so much money. You are nothing. People don't have to do whatever you say. I don't need your permission to leave. I could have left you on that highway that first night. Not everything in the world is about you. Get used to it. Andrew stormed into the station. Neither Mia nor Whitney followed him. They stood in uncomfortable silence, staring at the ground. Mia knew Andrew was right, about her and about Whitney. But she knew her friend wasn't about to change her mind. It was time to say goodbye to one of her companions. He likes you, you can tell, Whitney said. That's why he's so hard on you. It's the reason he stays. Are you staying? Mia knew the answer as Whitney shook her head no. I know he's right. I am selfish. But I'm not about to change now. Mia knew Whitney didn't expect a response. I couldn't have made it this far without you, was all Mia could think to say. The comment didn't seem to please Whitney. Mia embraced her, forgetting they were disguised as boys. Her mind flashed back to playing with Whitney as a little girl. One time they were dressing up in Laura's shoes, and since they weren't old enough to walk barefoot without tripping, it wasn't long before they both tumbled. Mia banged her knee and started crying. Whitney immediately wrapped her arms around Mia and promised she would be all right and the pain would subside. Mia knew she needed to return the sentiment now. She hoped Whitney would make it out safely and find happiness somewhere. If Whitney stayed with them longer, her return would only hurt more people. Mia squeezed Whitney tighter before pulling away. I love you, Mia whispered to her friend. I love you too, Whitney replied, 
Her eyes glassed over, and she smiled. The words touched her. Be careful. Give us some time to get ahead, Mia said. Mia didn't wait for an answer. She made her way down the stairs and didn't look back. The train station was a magnificent building. The whole thing looked carved from stone. The ceilings were arched and high. Mia wanted to spend more time admiring the structure, but after the recent blowout, she made a beeline for Andrew. He was staring up at a board with a list of cities and numbers. To the right and left, staircases led down to a giant gray room. The downstairs was just as ugly as the upstairs was beautiful. Mia could see the tracks and the trains through the hustling people moving in and out. Where are we going? Mia was filled with nerves, knowing he was still angry. The southeast area, track five. He didn't look at her or acknowledge her in any way. It looks like there are over 40 tracks. This place is so big, she said. She had hoped to start up some conversation, but instead he just grumbled and continued staring. Mia felt a tap on her shoulder. The touch startled her, and she smiled, thinking Whitney had decided to keep going. To her bewilderment, when she spun around, she was face to face with Grant Marsden. Chapter 46 Girls' educations go only so far. The teachings a husband hands to his wife are much more in-depth. She will learn a new array of fascinating subjects, and in some cases may become a necessary hand in her husband's business. The Registry Guide for Girls Grant stood waving his hand with a giant smile. Mia didn't have time to react before she was grabbed and pulled away. She almost lost her footing before realizing it was Andrew dragging her. They took off at immense speed down the stairs, knocking travelers to the side. At the bottom, a man stood in a combative position with a gun pointed at them. Andrew didn't flinch as he hurled his shoulder into the man, sending him toppling down before he had the chance to fire. The downed man looked just as shocked as Mia at Andrew's strength. She looked behind to see Grant talking on a radio and running after them. Come on, Andrew said. The basement of the train station was crowded and noisy. Trains pulled in and out across a great number of tracks. There were walkways so pedestrians could cross over the unoccupied rails, but Andrew didn't use them. He pushed Mia down onto a track and hoisted her up the other side, following her with ease. She didn't have the time to notice his force. Instead, all she could think about was Grant right behind them. A train was pulling into the next track, but Andrew shoved Mia down to the rails. She ran to the other side and tried to pull herself up before the train crushed her. She decided dying was better than becoming Mrs. Marsden. Andrew hoisted her up again, then pulled himself off the track, barely avoiding the train. Andrew landed on top of her. Both lying down, they rolled across the platform. He stood and pulled Mia up again. They had a moment to catch their breath. Grant had not beaten the train. They were sandwiched between two stationary locomotives with no tracks to jump. They walked fast. As they approached an overpass, the man Andrew had knocked down reappeared. He was giant and blocking their way. Crap, Andrew said, before running straight toward the man. Mia thought Andrew had lost his mind, but followed him anyway. Instead of trying to go through the man, Andrew veered the other way down the overpass. They were heading back toward the front of the station. The giant was right on their heels. Mia could feel him sticking his arms out, trying to grab hold of her. Mia and Andrew ran straight this time, fighting through all the commuters. Mia was scared to look back. Andrew turned right, running parallel to a huge train and an empty track. They put some distance between themselves and their pursuer. Being smaller did have some advantages. Andrew jumped down to the empty rails, and Mia followed. He pushed her up in their normal routine, but she didn't see him follow. She looked down in a panic. Andrew's pant leg was caught on a rail, and a train was on its way in. He yelled at her to keep running, but she couldn't, not without him. 
She knew she had plenty of time to help him and avoid the locomotive. He couldn't pull his leg loose. She jumped back down and removed the caught material. He did not look happy with her decision. Andrew gave her a boost off the track, but she was met by a pair of hands. Grant had run up just in time to grab her. He spun her around so her back was to him and placed a gun against her temple. She could see the large man on the other side of the tracks, shaking his head and catching his breath. It was over. He could rest. Andrew jumped up off the tracks and stood on the platform. The train was even closer now, and Mia felt relief as he made it to the platform. Andrew's expression was a new one. He looked lost. Grant tightened his grip on her arm. His breathing was quick and heavy. The entire journey flashed through Mia's eyes. Tears welled as she stared at Andrew. Andrew's expression began to harden as he looked past Mia and Grant. She could see he was about to lunge forward, when all of a sudden, Mia felt a strong knock. She and Grant started falling back onto the tracks. He let go of her waist and she reached her arms out. There was a tangle of limbs, but one face was clear. Whitney. The three of them were sprawled across the rails. Mia reached out to Whitney but felt a pair of hands under her arms, lifting her up. Suddenly, Mia was on the platform, and this time Andrew was gripping her. Grant was against the side of the rails, trying to sit up. But Whitney stood upright, still on the tracks. Mia could focus only on Whitney, who smiled up at her. Mia lunged forward to help her friend up, but Andrew gripped her tightly and pulled her back. The giant train almost took her arm off as it rolled into its spot. Everything went black. Mia didn't know if she was screaming, crying, or struggling to get out of Andrew's hold. Whitney had just sacrificed herself for Mia. Her friend was gone. Whitney was dead. Because of Mia. She felt Andrew's arms relax. The train was stopped now. She threw herself against it, hitting the steel sides. We don't have time. There's still that big guy. Andrew turned and walked. She looked toward Andrew with shock, but in her daze, she knew he was right. She caught up to him, straightened her hat, and kept his pace. She thought about what he had said earlier to Whitney, but it was Mia and Andrew who were selfish. They walked back a few tracks and stepped onto one of the trains. Mia should have been in awe. This was her first train ride, but with the recent events, she didn't care. It was tall and had two floors with orange seats lining the walls. All of them faced the front of the transport. Andrew climbed the small staircase and picked a spot. Mia sat down next to him. There were no windows on the top floor. Don't cry, Andrew said with no emotion. It will draw attention to us. Let's make sure we get out of here. Sitting silently in the train car was not easy for Mia. Other travelers came in and took seats. Nobody paid any attention to the two of them. Mia didn't think taking the train was the best idea, but all she could focus on was thoughts of Whitney. Chapter 47 It is appropriate and expected to take joy in the enemy's failures. After all, a failure for them is a win for you, and a win for you is a win for your country. The Boy's Guide to Service Grant stomped his feet in frustration. He couldn't believe they had gotten away. Rex was still bent over, catching his breath. He was more affected by the situation than Grant. You almost died, boss. Rex stood up and wrapped his arm around his stomach. I almost died saving you. Thank you, by the way. Grant didn't want to appear rude. He looked at the back of his shirt. Rex had stretched out Grant's collar a little. He told himself it was ruined and frowned. A group of eight men came running around the train toward them. With their tight black shirts and black pants, they did have a commanding effect. Where were all of you? Grant asked. What's the point in having a team if it can't be relied on? Boss, the station is huge. We were split up in teams of two, like you told us, one of them said. 
Leonard and Ross tumbled in behind. It was clear the older man was not used to field work anymore. His suit was drenched in sweat. Did you get her? Leonard asked in between breaths. Does it look like I got her? Grant shook his head. He was surrounded by imbeciles. Ross, go to the control room. Get every train out shut down. Don't let any more trains in or out, Leonard said to his subordinate. That's not necessary. They're on track five, going to the southeast area. Grant wished he'd won during the more thrilling chase, but he would settle for picking her up. If they're still here anyway. Ross looked at Leonard for confirmation and ran off. Leonard was on the verge of collapsing. Make sure they don't let anyone off that train. We'll do a search that way, Grant said. He looked at his group of men, who were standing there staring at him. Didn't you hear me? Track five, Grant said, and the men scampered away. Leonard remained behind. He turned away and placed his hand to his brow. Before, he had been enjoying the fight and the chase, but now he was starting to get annoyed. Grant did not like losing and did not like surprises. He had forgotten about the other girl. He knew it was his own mistake. He should have noticed they were missing one and told someone to hunt her down. Don't you want to go to the train? Leonard broke Grant's concentration. No, it's a waste of time. I'm sure they're not on it. That boy is smart. He knows I heard him say the number. Grant sat next to Leonard and pointed toward the ceiling. You see that? It's a camera. They have them all over here. We are going to let them escape and then watch for what train they got onto. If I shut down the station, they'll just find some way to get back into the city. And while I love St. Louis, it would be too hard to hunt them down here. But if they're going to some little place, I'll have the upper hand again. Well, why did you send the men to the train? Because they were annoying me. I wanted them out of my sight. Grant always enjoyed a worthy opponent, but this boy was not his equal. He hadn't even been in service. Grant noticed he was clenching his fist so hard his knuckles had turned white. He couldn't wait to get his hands on Andrew. It was a shame. The boy would have made a great soldier. Ross might want to tell them they need to scrape someone off the track. Grant patted Leonard's back before strolling down the platform. Chapter 48 Grooms have served their country and sacrificed a great deal in the process. If a wife mourns her old life, she only shows disrespect for all her husband has done to provide for her and his country. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia concentrated on breathing. It was easy to focus on, and she worried she might forget how as the weight of her grief pressed heavily on her chest. The train doors closed, and they rolled out of the station. Mia and Andrew were the only passengers sitting up top, affording them some privacy. Mia's eyes glanced toward the door. At any second, she expected Grant or his large buddy to walk through and grab them. But she reminded herself Grant was dead, just like Whitney. How are you doing? Andrew asked with genuine concern. I can't believe we made it out of there, Mia said. No, how are you doing? That was unexpected, he said. She's dead. It's terrible. I'm terrible. Whitney made a decision. It was honorable. We should remember her sacrifice. Remember her sacrifice? Mia couldn't believe what she was hearing. Whitney had died for her. There were so many things running through Mia's mind that she couldn't begin to think of what to say. But Andrew had summed it up in a single sentence with no trace of warmth. What are you going to do now? Mia asked. She wanted to mourn Whitney in her own way and not with Andrew's help. What do you mean? Well, he saw you help me. You can't go into service now. You'll be arrested. You're a fugitive. 
I doubt it. He would have to mark me by my number, which he doesn't know. Giving my description and the name Andrew won't be enough. And he's dead now. What's your number? I told you. CMW 1408. What you called my last name. Oh. Mia had assumed they were bound together now. But she was mistaken. How long till we're in the southeast? We're not going to the southeast area, Andrew said. He handed her the tickets. Their destination was Yuma, southwest area. Mia cringed at the sight of the extra ticket. Whitney would never see the southwest. Why did you say southeast area then? Because... Andrew turned to look at her. I was planning on going to the southeast, leaving you to continue on your own. Memories of their rolling on the train platform together crossed her mind. The feeling that she might lose him too made her feel empty. She looked at her cold, closed-off traveling companion and realized that was all he would ever be. Cold and closed. Every time the train came to a stop, Mia was sure a rag agent would enter and take her. But at every stop, people got off or on, and the train kept rolling forward. Mia and Andrew didn't do much talking the rest of the trip. She couldn't blame him for wanting to leave. This was a lot of work with no payoff for him. He had put himself in so much danger just by helping her. Whitney didn't leave her thoughts, and she couldn't bear the idea of Andrew dying now. If they both lost their lives, it would destroy her. Minutes turned into hours. Daylight turned to twilight. Somewhere in the process, Mia managed to doze for a while. She dreamed of Whitney. Happy in a loving relationship surrounded by a huge family. They were playing together on a beach, laughing and having fun. Mia wanted to join them, but they didn't notice her. Suddenly, Whitney saw her and ran over. Mia felt tears streaming down her cheek as the two joined hands. Whitney smiled warmly and crinkled her nose at Mia. Whitney wiped the tears away and then, in a fluttery voice, said, Stop. 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 We're the next stop. Andrew shook Mia awake. Her skin tingled where his hand touched her. She rubbed the spot till the sensation went away and tried to process her dream. Wherever Whitney was now, she hoped she was as happy as in Mia's fantasy. Yuma? Mia yawned. It was light outside again. She had no clue what time it was. No, that's the end of the line. We're getting off in Gila Bend, Andrew said as he stretched. We need to look for a large car that will honk three times. What time is it? Mia asked. I'm not sure. I think it's sometime in the afternoon. But tomorrow. Huh? Mia was confused. We've been on the train a long time. All you did was sleep. When you walked to the bathroom, you looked like a shell. Mia didn't even remember waking up to use the restroom. She still felt tired. She told herself it was probably from too much sleep. The two walked down the steps and waited by the doors. There wasn't anyone else in their train car. Mia stared at the ground, not wanting to deal with any feelings she had at the moment. I wasn't going to leave you. I just... You... Andrew struggled with his words. It was just a dumb idea. I was mad. Mia was surprised to hear Andrew explain himself. That was something he did so rarely. She wondered if it was because she was a woman. He didn't agree with her ideology and planned to use the registry. She couldn't tell if he saw her as a person or a possession. I told you to go, Mia said. But I'm glad you didn't. She blushed as the words came out of her mouth. They were the truth. If Andrew hadn't helped her, she would be dead or stuck with Grant. There's something else, he started to say. But the train came to a stop and the doors popped open. Mia walked past him and onto the platform. She was sure whatever Andrew had to say, she didn't want to hear it. It would be about boundaries or being careful. The station, if one could call it that, 
In Gila Bend was nothing like the one in St. Louis. It resembled a fallen dream of a major hub. A giant concrete wall was the only structure. There was no roof or sister walls to match. The concrete slab stood about 50 feet high. No construction materials to finish anything were in sight, and it appeared the elements had already started to chip away at the single protector of the tracks. It looks like they were building a station and stopped, Mia said. Does it say what to do when we exit? No, it just said to get off at this stop and wait for the car. Mia was happy Andrew had moved on from whatever he wanted to say. He sat down at a bench and pulled some food from his bag. Mia wasn't hungry. Eat. You haven't had anything in over a day. He threw her a granola bar given to them by Frank and Alex. Mia looked at the wrapper and thought of the nice men. She hoped they were all right. There were already two deaths on her list, and she didn't want to add any more. Mia, I'm not good at this, but that night, I wanted to tell you. Andrew was cut off when a giant car pulled into the parking lot. It was boxy and looked like a tank. The car stopped right by them. The driver blared his horn three times in quick succession, then rolled down the window. Get in, a low voice said before honking the horn several more times, making Mia jump. Come on, I haven't got all day. Andrew walked toward the open window and waved Mia behind him. He seems crazy, Mia said. She hung close to Andrew. Yeah, but everything seems crazy, Andrew said, before holding open the door for Mia. Chapter 49 All female physical desires will be satisfied with intense pleasure on a wife's marriage night. Over the length of the marriage, more pleasures will be afforded the wife, some so intense and glorious, it would be unladylike to put them into words. The Registry Guide for Girls The two comrades sat close to each other in the back seat. Mia was scared they had been tricked and this was the wrong car, but these feelings were familiar to her. She felt blind. It was hard to get a good look at the driver from the back seat. She tried to focus on their surroundings. The landscape looked flat, like the Midwest, but with no green. Everything was brown and rocky. Mia began to miss her home. This area seemed so depressing. I thought there were three of you, the mystery driver said. He didn't wait for a response. Doesn't matter to me. I'm glad to help the two of you. What are your names? Mia felt a sharp pang over Whitney, but then a warm sensation. She wasn't sure why, but somehow she knew Whitney had found her peace, wherever that might be. It had never occurred to Mia that the driver would know as little about them as they did about him. They were just two kids who needed help, and he was just someone willing to give it. She began to relax when she thought about how lucky she was that there was some good in the world. Amelia, but you can call me Mia. Andrew. Well, Mia and Andy, my name is Roderick Bernard Rowe. You can call me Rod. Mia inched away from Andrew and gave him some breathing room. She had a good feeling about Rod. Are you going to help me cross the border? Why, yes, I do believe I am. Relief filled Mia's heart. Her journey was almost over. She glanced out the window again. She could see mountains off in the background. They looked spectacular, and the sun wasn't so high anymore, causing purples and reds to appear throughout the landscape. Without noticing she did, Mia moved herself as far away from Andrew as she could get. Where are we going? Mia asked, growing more confident. Theba. It's about twenty minutes outside the bend. I'm a carpenter. Drive all over the area fixing things for people, Rod said. He was cheery. He turned off the main highway and onto a side street. Houses started appearing. It's pretty quiet out here. About five years ago, they wanted to make it a tourist spot or place for older people to settle in the warmth. Those plans went under when the developer realized it was too hot here for vacation. That's why the station is here. 
Mia liked how chatty he was. It made her anxiety fade away. Did you find us on a message board? Mia asked. Yes. The internet is good for something, Rod said. Was it about puppies and poetry? He let out a whooping laugh. Mia looked at Andrew, who shrugged. He knew as much as she did. When their driver finally stopped laughing, he spoke. Are either of you familiar with Sam Spot? Mia looked at Andrew, who shook his head. No. It's a website. People sell their junk, services, pets, vacations, really anything you could buy online. There are millions of postings. It makes it hard for the government to track them. You two were listed for sale under the pet section. I thought it sounded like people who needed help and not actual animals. Is there a chance you could have shown up at the station and found dogs? Mia asked. Yes. And there is a chance someone could have thought they'd be purchasing some pooches. It's a roll of the dice. Really, it's dumb luck we found each other. I'm sure there are other places on the internet to look. But you two were found on Sam's spot. As the drive continued, Mia noticed the houses got farther and farther apart, giving the homes more privacy. They weren't as far apart as farmhouses, though. Nothing would grow in this climate. Why do the houses get more spaced out? Cattle land. Well, not so much anymore. But there were lots of ranches out here. Now people just like their space, I guess. Rod turned the wheel and pulled into a driveway. Mia was used to mile-long driveways, but this was short, maybe 25 feet. The car pulled all the way into a garage. Rod did not unlock the doors till the garage door went all the way down. The garage held another car as well, a small, sporty convertible. Mia was getting the idea that carpentry did well for Rod. Mia guessed Rod was just younger than her father, in his late 40s. In the garage, she got a better look at him. He had a slight belly and was shorter than Andrew. His frame was dusted with a bushy, sandy blonde beard and thick hair down to his ears. The garage was clean but bare except for the cars, not even a workbench. The door opened into a large kitchen with clean, crisp black appliances and a freestanding island. A small dining area was attached. The whole floor was open. A mid-sized room with some mismatched couches and a television set was just to the right. Two doors were on the left, and a set of stairs was visible in the corner next to the front door. Welcome to my abode. Rod dropped his keys on the table. Did you just move in? Mia asked. She noticed how empty the place looked. There wasn't a bit of warmth or a personal touch anywhere. Nope. Lived here for about seven years now. Rod walked over to the stairs. Upstairs, two bedrooms and a bathroom. Here's the first floor, and here is the basement. Rod signaled to one of the two doors on their left. I'll give you the grand tour later. The house was clean, cozy, and plain. Mia thought it shared these traits with its owner. Just when Mia was starting to settle in, the unmistakable sound of shoes against the pavement and whistling came from the front door. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. Andrew stepped in front of her and raised his fists, placing himself between her and whoever was coming in. Whoa, whoa, it's okay. Rod lowered Andrew's arms as the intruder entered. It was a young man, about Mia's age. He had shaggy blonde hair and an overly prominent nose. He was maybe six feet tall, but had a strong build. He was dressed in jeans and a yellow t-shirt with the sleeves rolled up, showing tanned skin. His smile was beautiful. His white teeth glistened in a perfect line as he walked toward them holding a white bag. These the new guys? Hi, I'm Roderick Carter Rowe, but you can call me Carter. He stuck his hand out toward Andrew, who didn't respond. Mia made no effort to reveal herself to the new young man. Okay then. Not the friendliest, I get it. What about you? Carter leaned over, looking at Mia. Andrew moved his body to block Carter's view. It's fine. No need to worry. This is my son, Carter. Rod put his arm around the teen and grabbed the white bag. I sent him for dinner. 
Figured you two would be starving, and I'm not much of a chef. Andrew didn't back down, even after Rod tried to reassure him. Mia didn't think they were making the best impression on their new hosts. Sorry. She walked out from behind Andrew. We've just had a rough trip so far. People were hunting us. Were? Carter asked with a raised eyebrow. He died, Mia said. Remember, Andrew? Mia hoped he would start talking. How could I forget? It was just yesterday, Andrew said. He lifted his hand and shook Carter's. Mia could tell he was uncomfortable. I should have mentioned my son earlier, but it's just the two of us. No more surprises. Now, let's sit and eat. Rod tossed some paper plates down on the table. How many cars do you have? Mia asked, trying to ease the tension. I mean, I saw the two in the garage, and if your son was out... Carter. If Carter was out. The young blonde man gave her a huge smile. If Carter was out. You're observant, Rod said. That's good. The Hummer I picked you up in, the sports car, and a dirty old pickup truck. The two in the garage are my special occasion vehicles. Nobody continued the conversation. Mia felt overwhelmed by the testosterone. Where is your wife? Mia asked, noticing Rod's wedding band. Don't have one, he said. Mia was surprised a man like Rod wasn't married and wondered why he wore a ring. It wasn't any less surprising than hearing he had a son. She had a million questions, but before she could begin asking, Andrew spoke up. When will we be going across the border? We'll get to that all in good time. Just for now, let's have a nice meal together. Get to know each other, Rod said. It surprised Mia that Andrew had used the word we, but now wasn't the time to ask. She was tired, and the food smelled good. She pulled out a chair and sat. Andrew chose the seat to her right, and Carter sat straight across from her. She looked up. Carter was staring at her. Each eye was a different color, one brown, one green. She hadn't noticed at first, but she found him handsome. She broke into a smile, which he returned with a wink. She was looking forward to a conversation that didn't involve her runaway adventures or problems. Chapter 50 It is the responsibility of the man to work hard and provide for, feed, and shelter his family. It is the wife's duty to follow her husband's wishes. Without the support of a woman, a man will not be able to fully complete his tasks. The Registry Guide for Girls The dinner was greasy chicken. Mia gulped it down hungrily, and Andrew ate like he'd been starved. She didn't think the quality compared to the chickens she was used to on the farm, or the recipe was as good as the one she could prepare. But she still appreciated the hot food. One time, I had to install a slide in place of stairs. Rod was telling a story involving crazy work requests. Now, what use would that do anyone? I'm sure I would have loved it when I was five. Carter grinned at his father. There were a lot of things you would have enjoyed at five. You remember when you were sure you wanted to grow up and be a tap dancer? You danced around the whole place, wore out the floors, Rod said before breaking out in laughter. Mia joined them in laughing. She found their dynamic fun and welcoming. Even crabby Andrew managed to smile once or twice. It was nice to see such a close relationship. She wondered what it felt like for the two of them father and son. They loved each other without a single thought of money. The rows were worth more to each other than any price. She smiled at the idea. After dinner, Rod decided it was time for the tour. He opened the door to the basement, and Carter flipped on the light, leading the way down. Mia was led into a giant open room, much like the first floor but twice as large. The entire area was painted white, with a black checkered floor. There was a bar, a pool table, a dartboard, 
and two couches. The walls were decorated with music posters and Americana. Mia understood why the upstairs looked unlived in. This was where Rod and Carter spent the majority of their time. This was my little project. I finished it up last year. Rod didn't try to hide the pride in his voice. I help too, Carter said in Mia's ear as he walked by. She could feel herself blush. Nobody else noticed. Rod continued on, telling them about the different types of tools he used and asking Andrew if he knew any of the games. My father had them, but I wasn't allowed to play, Mia said before Andrew could speak. Well, miss, we might have to change that. A girl can be a shark, Rod said. I'm sure I could give you lessons. I'm pretty good, Carter said. The corners of Mia's lips began to curl up. She noticed a scowl cross over Andrew's face. She wasn't sure if it was meant for her or Carter. You too, Andrew, Carter said. Rod ignored the teens and walked over to the corner, where a giant machine hummed. He pressed a button and a can of soda fell out. Mia was amazed. Come here, Rod said. He pushed another button, the one for grape soda. Nobody likes grape. With the push of the button, the machine popped away from the wall. Rod gave it a tug and pulled it forward. It was in front of a door. A little room was behind the wall. It was big enough for the twin bed and dresser that were already inside. A flashlight lantern sat on top of the dresser, and a gray blanket adorned the bed. Andrew, this room is for you, Rod said. Andrew looked impressed, though his expression was trying to change. For a moment, Mia thought she saw tears forming, but his features returned to stone. Mia was desperate to know what he was feeling and thinking. It caused a pang in her heart. Wait till you see your room. Carter said. He was standing right behind her, and his voice shook her concentration. Did you help build that, too? She asked. Some of my best work, just for you. Liar, you didn't even know I would be coming, Mia said. I had a dream you would come here, and I needed that room for you, Carter said. He laughed at his joke. Mia smirked back at him as he signaled for her to follow him to the other side of the basement. She glanced back at Andrew, who was unloading his bag into the drawers, refolding clothes with care. She didn't see the point in unpacking. They wouldn't be here long. But he seemed content, so she didn't try to stop him. She hurried to catch up to Carter. They walked to the corner of the basement opposite Andrew's room. In the rectangular basement, the two of them were as far apart as possible which made Mia uncomfortable. Carter snapped his fingers and brought her attention back to him. He pushed up both his sleeves in a dramatic fashion, turning his arms over and back again to show Mia there was nothing hidden there. She giggled at his display. He held up his fingers and did a short countdown. When all his fingers were down, he reached up on a shelf and pulled on a small trophy. The wall below it came forward. The craftsmanship amazed Mia. She had not even noticed a crease in the smooth wall, let alone a door. Carter did not swing this wall open, but slid it toward him. There were no hinges, making the break in the wall harder to see. Mia looked at her new room. It was double the size of Andrew's. Two twin beds were made up with pink comforters on them. They took up the majority of the space. There was also a large, beautiful dark wood wardrobe with intricate carvings located against the wall opposite the ends of the beds. Mia had a strong urge to run her hand over the carved designs. Carter shouldered in front of her and slid the two beds together and against the far wall. Mia followed him inside. Now you can just keep them together. Have one big bed. Whitney popped back into her mind. It was sad to see the two beds, but Mia needed to keep going. Whitney couldn't have died for nothing. She wasn't interested in her sleeping accommodations at this point. She pulled open the panel on the wardrobe. The door swung out, almost hitting the end of the bed. To her surprise, the whole thing was filled with women's clothes, 
shoes, hairbrushes, and makeup. She looked at Carter with confusion. It would have been difficult for Rod to buy these things without drawing attention to himself. They're my mother's. She was about your size, a little taller, but I'm sure they'll fit. Carter brushed past Mia and went back out to the main basement. She assumed Rod's wife had died at some point. It all came together now. He'd not remarried. He'd kept his son, he wore his ring, and he helped runaways. He must have been lucky and found true love. Mia sighed, fantasizing about a romantic love story. She wondered if he'd gotten her from the registry. She must have been fortunate to end up with someone who held women in such high esteem. Mia pulled out a piece of clothing. The style was unlike anything she was used to. It must have been older. Ahem. Rod cleared his throat. Mia dropped the clothes and walked out to the main basement. All the lights are wired together. There are two switches, one at the top of the stairs and one at the bottom. Either will work just fine. You each have a lantern to use in your room at night. Bathroom right here. We try to conserve water so don't flush everything, and you can shower every other day, Navy style. If you can stretch it out longer, it's appreciated. But don't stink up the house. Every other day? Mia raised an eyebrow. She had assumed they wouldn't be here longer than a few days. When are we going to leave? Mia asked. She glanced toward Andrew, who stared at Rod, expressionless. Hard to say. My guess is a month. A month? Mia said. That's too long. Well, it's summer. During the days, it's about 110 degrees, and it is even hotter across the border. If you try to travel in this heat, you won't make it far. Mia wanted to protest, but Andrew cut her off. What's your plan? You two are all business, huh? Again, I have to think about it for a day or two. Hammer some things out. Rod turned his attention to Mia. There is no way you are going to pass for a boy. I think I'll take you across the border as my new wife. Going on a honeymoon. Get my hands on some fake papers. Mia looked to Andrew, who nodded, backing the plan. It's getting late. Andrew? Tomorrow you'll be joining Carter and me at work, Rod said. Mia, you have to stay here and stay downstairs. It's too dangerous with the windows upstairs. I'll leave some food down here and some stuff to occupy your time. Rod and Carter shook Andrew's hand again. Rod walked over to Mia, bent down, and gave her a huge hug. Mia imagined he was thinking of his wife. Mia was sure she was proud of him, wherever she was. Carter came over next. Good night, princess. He winked at her again with a devilish smile. This time she didn't look away, but smirked back at him. She remembered when Andrew had called her the royal back in the Midwest. I'm no princess. Angel, then. Mia shook her head as Carter backed away. He didn't turn around till he got to the stairs. I'm going to kill the lights. Rod called from the top of the stairs. She broke eye contact with Carter and allowed the blood to rush to her cheeks. Andrew didn't notice. He was already back in his room. Mia hoped to talk to him before he went to bed. She quickly grabbed her lantern and walked over to his area. Wait, are you okay? She asked. You looked upset earlier. Part of her wanted to hear Andrew say he'd noticed the way Carter was looking at her and didn't like it. She wanted to feel Andrew's hands on her body, even though she was certain it would never happen. Instead, he just looked up at her from his bed. She reminded herself to focus back on the getaway, on freedom, not on making Andrew jealous. I've never had my own room before, he said. The traces of tears were still visible in his eyes. He leaned back in his bed and turned on his lantern moments before the basement flooded with darkness. Sometimes Mia forgot how hard Andrew's life had been. There was a tug in her heart for the boy who was so moved by having a small space all his own. She might have been doomed to the life of a prisoner, but she'd had lots of luxuries. She gave half a smile and said goodnight. Andrew nodded. 
The lantern light spilled across his face, and she felt another pang for him. He was the toughest man she'd ever met, and yet he still had a sensitive soul. Mia was sure the moment she left him, his tears would flow freely. Chapter 51 Husbands often ask their wives to escort them to social events. It is up to a wife to dress appropriately, but the standard attire is a grand gown designed and created according to her husband's expectations. If a young girl hones her sewing skills, she will be able to fully demonstrate them as a bride. The Registry Guide for Girls The last of Mia's dreams dissolved, and she woke up with a large stretch. She had slept in a white t-shirt and a pair of comfy shorts. She doubted they belonged to the late Mrs. Rowe. There had been no dreams of Whitney last night. Mia had hoped she would visit her again, but knew it was over. The image from her sleep on the train still burned in her mind. She would always remember her friend that way, happy and free. Instead, her dreams were filled with Andrew, the two of them walking hand in hand, not saying a word. He looked at her and smiled. It took up his whole face. She went up on her tiptoes to kiss him, but their lips never met. They were constantly moving toward each other, but never reaching. It was bittersweet. Her body was stiff and sore. Then she remembered flying up and down over the train tracks. She had put quite a strain on it. Even though her body ached, Mia knew that was the best sleep she'd had in months. It felt like she had slept for days. Pushing open the door to her room, she realized that without windows it was impossible to tell the time. On top of the bar was a lunchbox with a handwritten note. Be a good princess. Don't make too much noise around your castle. We'll be back around six, maybe with a slain dragon to lay at your feet. Mia shook her head as she crumpled up the note. A stack of books, a case of darts, and a computer were set out next to the lunchbox. Mia snatched the computer. The first time she had used one was for Lisa. She sat at a bar stool and lifted the lid. The machine hummed to life. A notification popped up. This computer had internet access. Mia couldn't wait to roam the web, and she clapped her hands, feeling giddy. It took her a while to get used to the device, but once she got the hang of it, she did fine. She recognized the globe icon her father had used and clicked it a couple of times, bringing up the browser. She was sure it would have been painful to watch how slowly she typed and was happy nobody was around to notice. She imagined Carter typed as fast as the government workers from St. Louis. A page popped up with the option to type a phrase. She typed, Mexico. She was excited to read about her future home, but was disappointed with the results. The information was about the different types of aid America gave Mexico and the drug wars. The climate, economy, or anything useful was not touched on. She noticed links to other countries at the bottom of the page and opened a few. Each country was the same. A section about how much the people loved America, how much better life in America was, and how America had helped them. She was starting to have her doubts about how informative the internet was. She went up to the search bar again and typed in, News. A page popped up with the headline, American Troops Save Children, War Over. Other articles included, American Government Brokers Peace Between North and South Korea, and America Wins World Peace Award. This was not what she had expected to find. She typed her own name into the search bar. Her wedding announcement popped up, along with a story about the truck driver kidnapping her. There was a small article about her husband, and she decided to type his name in. Lots of information came flooding back, most of it about his job. But the one piece that didn't pop up was a notice of his death. This worried Mia. Most of the websites are lies. The voice scared Mia so much she almost fell off the barstool. She spun around to see Carter leaning against a post. He looked a little sweaty, 
in cargo shorts and a tight white tank top. His tan muscles made him look like a sculpture. We don't have open internet here. The government censors it. The internet in Mexico looks different, Carter said. He picked up a book. You'll get more accurate information from these. What are you doing here? Mia crossed her arms, feeling exposed. She found herself caring about her appearance for the first time in weeks. Silly me. In my rush this morning, I forgot some of my tools. Had to come back for them. Carter pulled out the chair next to Mia. She ran her hand through her short hair, wishing she had her long locks back. What time is it? Mia asked. Carter didn't respond, just leaned over her and pointed to the bottom corner of the computer. The clock read 12.02 p.m. You sleep okay, princess? Stop calling me that. You have no clue what I've been through to get here. I'm not a princess. You're right. You should be a queen or a goddess. Mia couldn't believe a boy was being so forward. If anyone had spoken to her like this when she lived at home, her father would have had him beaten. She turned her head toward him, ready to stand her ground, but was met with his lips against hers. At first she pulled back, but he had already slid his hand behind her head, holding her in a gentle grasp. This was her first kiss. An image of Andrew flickered before her eyes, but she pushed it out and returned Carter's touch. He pulled away and smiled. It was over before it had even started. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. He winked. I hope you're not offended. Mia brought her hand to her lips. She didn't know what she was. They tingled where his had been. Next time? Ask was all she could manage to spit out. He laughed a little and nodded. I do have to get back. He stood up. I'm sure we'll get some time together soon. Remember, books are better than computers. Mia was flustered. She didn't want him to leave. Not so soon. She blurted out the first question that came to mind. Do you have any history books? Anything on how the registry started? Carter made the same face everyone did when she asked that question. It looked like his interest was piqued. He glanced around before he sat down. They don't include that in any books. You won't find it anywhere. I'm confident I know why, though. My dad told me. Mia looked at him with intensity. She was curious about his answer. She hoped it was long and he could stay with her. All over the world, women never had many rights. Not until about 150 years ago. I'm guessing on that number. It was never as severe as the registry, but it wasn't good for them, Carter said. Governments always need money. In other countries, people give half their paychecks to their leaders. My dad has a $1,000 job. He pockets $1,000. But in any other country... He would only take 500. The rest would go to the country. Same if you buy something. A $2 loaf of bread costs $3. The extra money goes to the government. Mia wasn't sure what this lesson had to do with her question. She found Carter's story just as unbelievable as the rest, but let him continue as she focused on his mismatched eyes. We were like that. Then, about a century ago, the Great War. Mia finished for him. All men had to go fight. At least all young men. Some women went voluntarily, too. The politicians who stayed behind used this time to their advantage. They released a disease on the population. Why? Mia couldn't believe a government could be so cruel. Women had rights. They were equals. They were taking control. Some of the old men didn't like that. They unleashed some disease that was supposed to target only women. It wasn't supposed to kill them, just slow them down. It would put women behind men again. It was too strong, though. It took out everyone. It was quick, too. In 24 hours, it killed well over half the Americans. Then just vanished. We had to rebuild. That's when the registry came into place. 
It wasn't designed to be this severe. The government didn't realize how much money men were willing to spend on a wife. They made boatloads auctioning off the remaining women. The females who were serving in the war and lived were forced to join their counterparts back home. There were still lots of males and not enough wives to go around, so mandatory enlistment stayed. It gave the men a place to go. Everything bounced back. The government had loads of money and a huge army. Men got to keep their whole paycheck. Things just evolved into the registry. Mia looked at the ground and tried to process Carter's version of history. She wished there was some way to verify it. She didn't have much time to think before his finger was on her chin. Can I kiss you? Mia's brain didn't have the time to process his request. She felt herself barely nod before he tilted her head up and met her lips with his. She found the second kiss even more enjoyable. It was soft and wet. If you keep distracting me, I'll miss the whole day, he said, and kissed her again before standing up. With a wink and a smile, he walked up the stairs, leaving Mia stunned and dazed sitting at the bar. Her lips tingled with warmth as she ran her fingers across them. Carter was simple, nice, smart, and handsome. Mia had kissed a boy of her own free will, or at least returned a kiss. All her fears of Grant and of Andrew's going into service melted away. The feeling was glorious. Chapter 52 All the men you meet during service have the same goals and outlook as you. It is important you all work as one. The Boy's Guide to Service Have you worked as a carpenter before? Rod asked as Andrew helped him put up a wall to the gazebo they were building. No, farm work, fields, that sort of thing. Andrew was enjoying his time with Rod. He seemed interested in Andrew's responses. Andrew pulled out a screw and fastened the wall to the post. He thought this was a terrible structure, but Rod told him they didn't always design. This was a just-build job. Let's take a break. Rest till Carter gets back, Rod said. He wiped sweat from his forehead. The heat was excruciating. Andrew didn't understand how he would be able to wait days in between showers. There was nowhere to escape the sun. Besides the constant sweat, his shoulders and chest were becoming splotched red with sunburn. Rod noticed, too, and tossed him some sunscreen and water. So when is your enlistment date? A few weeks. Got a certain date? August 4th. Are you going to go? Yes. You're a brave man, fighting for your country. I respect that. Thank you. Andrew was surprised to hear admiration on this topic from Rod. I looked Mia up online last night. There's no mention of you anywhere, or even a teen abductor, Rod said. Now, she made it out like people are after her. Smart, dangerous people. How is it they don't know about you? I'm sure they do. What do you think will happen when you enlist? They don't know my call number or service day. They can't put a flag on me. How do you know they don't know that? Andrew was growing frustrated and impatient with the questions, but Rod had a way of phrasing them that made him want to answer. Andrew thought long and hard before he did. If they knew them, they would have made them public, and I gave Mr. Morrissey fake ones so they can't trace them. I don't know how well-read you are on Grant Marsden, but the guy's a billionaire. He's won several awards and was a decorated soldier. Personally, I think he's just a war profiteer. Everything that man does is plotted and planned. If you want my opinion, he doesn't want to catch you. Not yet, at least. I don't know if it's to make some example out of you or some sick game. He's dead. That's what you said, but isn't there a chance he already has something in place? What are you suggesting? I know it's dangerous out in the world for unserved American men, but some countries don't care. I'm not telling you what to do one way or the other. 
but you're pretty deep in this, and I would hate to see you walk into a trap. Andrew listened to Rod's advice. He thought the man expected him to freak out or snap, but Andrew wasn't phased. He had known this all along. He thought back to the day Mia threatened him. He'd made this decision right then and there. It was just now that he was coming to terms with it. He turned, looked at Rod, and nodded his head. Rod slapped him gently on the back and nodded as well. I'm sure your decision will make that girl happy, Rod said. Mia was not a topic Andrew wanted to discuss. He didn't know how to talk to her or how to treat her like a person. He kept replaying the night in St. Louis over and over in his head. The horrible things he'd said to her and the way he'd treated her were haunting him. He kept asking himself why he'd acted that way, but he had no answer. She didn't know him, the horror he was capable of. He'd convinced himself she was better off without him, and he had no chance. So when she put herself out there, beautiful, innocent, and trusting, it scared him. Woohoo! Carter said. He walked toward the men, spinning his drill in the air. Andrew couldn't understand how someone like Rod could have a son like him. One was intelligent and down to earth, while the other was a showboat. He wished Carter would just stay home every day. The time without him was pleasant. Chapter 53 some husbands choose to gift their wives with rings. These honor the ways of our ancestors, but also mark the first jeweled present bestowed upon the bride. Even without a ring, it is expected that a husband will adorn his wife with dazzling finery. The Registry Guide for Girls As the day went on, Mia grew disinterested with the computer finding only American propaganda and no information on what had spawned the registry. All she could learn about the Great War was that it had taken place in the Middle East, which, it took Mia a while to realize, was not an area of her homeland, and that America had saved the day. It didn't even say for whom or who was defeated. She was about to give up when an idea struck her. She went to the search bar and typed in, Sam's Spot. She clicked on the website and was surprised by the layout. It was columns of different things to buy. Each category looked like it had a million listings. It really was dumb luck that Rod had found them. She clicked on the pets section. There were lots of dogs, birds, cats, cages, and supplies for sale. They all looked authentic to her. Mia wondered if people from other countries could post. After staring at the home screen for several moments, she clicked on the Vacations tab. Under that section, she felt lucky to see an International button. Lots of listings came up. She skimmed through the topics before clicking on a posting. She came upon a Mexico listing and opened it. First Class Resort in Puerto Vallarta. Perfect for honeymooners or post-service getaway. No unserved men. Pictures of a fancy resort decorated the rest of the page. The place looked beautiful, but wasn't what Mia had in mind. She clicked back out to the listings. She scrolled farther down the page and checked several ads. They all seemed the same. She was about to give up when one caught her eye. The Guatemalan Way. This ad seemed different from the others. There was only one picture. Mia swore it was one she had seen in an earlier ad. Have you ever wanted to get away? Feeling the pressure? Let it fade away, the Guatemalan way. It was small. Mia scrolled all the way down. There was no more information. She clicked the Contact This Seller option. A small box popped up and the cursor blinked. Mia wasn't sure if this was a good idea. She didn't know how she would receive a response, as there wasn't even a space to write a return address. She also didn't want to fall into a trap and lead someone right to Rod and Carter. T.G.W. The Guatemalan Way. The Great War. 
she decided that was enough of a connection for her. Hi, I would like to learn more about the Guatemalan Way. Why was it created? Because of all the dead, tired people back home? Currently in the process of traveling, thinking about adding the Guatemalan Way as a stop. As soon as she hit send, she regretted her decision. The last thing she wanted was to bring trouble down on her new friends. She closed the web page and slammed the laptop shut. The rest of the day went by slowly. She flipped through some of the books, but the earliest one was 30 years old and she didn't think the information would be accurate enough. Carter's kiss made it difficult for her to concentrate on reading anyhow. Sorting through the wardrobe seemed like the next best idea. The clothes fit her for the most part and were only a little long. There were several dresses. Most of them were flowing and went way past her feet. They were from another generation. She'd never minded the boys' clothes, but she was starting to relish dressing like a girl again. Eventually, she decided on a sleeveless, long navy blue linen dress with multicolored embroidered flowers on the top. She would have loved to hem it, but a small ruffle with red trim went along the bottom, and she figured these clothes had sentimental value. She pulled out a hairbrush, a fake red flower, and some makeup, and went to the bathroom. Her hair was so short it was hard to do much with it, but she brushed back what she could and tried to add some volume, giving the illusion of more hair. Then she pinned the red flower behind her ear. She had lost interest in makeup over the last few months, but she figured she would play around with it to kill time. She spent the next hour applying and removing different shades. Mia thought she looked best with black mascara on her top lashes and pale pink lip gloss. While she was examining herself in the mirror, the unmistakable sound of the door opening made Mia jump with excitement. Her efforts at wasting time had paid off, and now her friends were home. Andrew came barreling down the stairs. He didn't have a shirt on, and his skin looked patchy and red. Sweat glistened in his hair. Mia flushed when she found herself staring. She smiled, hoping he would comment on her getup, but instead he muttered something unintelligible and popped open his room. Mia's heart hurt with another reminder of his lack of feelings. She didn't dwell on this long and redirected her thoughts toward Carter. Footsteps started down the stairs. Mia was sure it was him and tried to relax, not wanting to seem too posed or needy. She looked away from the steps and toward the ceiling. What are you looking at? Andrew asked. He walked behind her. He had a stack of clothing ready to take his shower. Mia scrambled to think of a response, but no words made their way out of her mouth. All the curtains are closed. Nobody should be by. Why don't you come upstairs for dinner? The voice from the stairs belonged to Rod. Mia hid her disappointment and was thrilled to have an excuse to avoid Andrew's question. You look different, like a woman now, Rod said. Mia held out the sides of her dress, giving a full view. Thank you for lending me the clothes. Better to lend them to you than Carter, Rod said. I've never seen embroidery like this before. How old are these? About 18 years old. They look older. Not the quality, just the design. Carter's mom made them. She was an old soul. Living in a later decade never suited her. What happened to her? Mia asked. She couldn't wait to hear the response. She believed she already knew the answer. She looked forward to hearing the love story. But Rod did not have the same reaction. His lips turned into a frown. Why don't you just come up for dinner? You too, Andrew, when you're ready. Won't take long, Andrew said as he entered the bathroom. It had never occurred to her that Rod would get upset. She wondered how far the version in her head was from the truth. Chapter 54 there is no gray area when it comes to war. All others are wrong and we are always right. It is futile to face us in any battle. Your active participation fuels the futility and anguish our enemies feel. The Boy's Guide to Service
the city lights blocked all the stars from the night sky. Grant stood on his hotel room's balcony. He found looking at the blank horizon soothing. The noise from the traffic below added to his relaxed state. He was happier in a city, but knew this feeling would be short-lived. He could hear Rex and Agent Ross coming up behind him. He was sure it was to tell him the hunt was back on. Gentlemen, Grant turned and raised his arms. What do you have for me this evening? Agent Ross remained in his black suit, while Rex continued to maintain the look of a soldier. Grant understood that they wore these uniforms to force others to give them power. Grant, on the other hand, didn't care about someone giving him power. He took it. Today he'd opted for pink and blue plaid shorts and a salmon polo with loafers. Rex was accustomed to his boss's style, and Agent Ross was getting used to it, too. The surveillance video showed them on the number 14 to Yuma, southwest area, Rex said. We already know that. Cut to the new stuff. Grant rubbed his hands together. The train makes about 15 stops between St. Louis and Yuma, Rex said. About 15 or 15. Grant was getting annoyed. Rex knew he liked straight facts. There are 17 stops, sir, Ross said, trying to contain his grin. Nice work, Agent Ross. Grant thought it was always important to create some animosity among his colleagues. Drop the sir thing. Call me Grant. Grant enjoyed the twitch coming to Rex's eyes. Even though they were about the same age, both of these men wanted Grant's approval. Grant was more than happy to dangle it in front of them and use it to his advantage. Of the 17 stops, 13 have security cameras. After reviewing tapes from all 13 stations, we've determined that they didn't get off at any of these stops, Rex said. Leaving four possible stops, Ross said. Thanks, Ross. Good work. I forgot what 17 minus 13 was. Great thing you were here to fill me in. Grant knew he was laying on the sarcasm pretty thick, but he needed to keep Ross in his place. Tell me about these four stops, Rex. Small towns. Friar Creek, Clifton, Grady, and Gila Bend, southwest area. Interesting. Grant tapped his fingers as he turned back to face the sky. His mind was trying to process the list of cities, run different scenarios. It was difficult because he had never heard of any of the towns. He assumed two teens on the run would stop somewhere they'd heard of before. After his background check into Andrew, he'd discovered the southwest area meant nothing to him. He'd expected to hear they were in Santa Fe, Mesa, or Tulsa, a stop large enough to hide in the crowd exiting the train. How would they know to leave at a stop that had no cameras? There was only one way. They're still getting help, Grant said. The southeast area was never the intended stop. He's clever. He would have found a way to meet up at the rendezvous. Did this train go through there? No, Rex said. But you heard the boy say track five. I know what I heard, Grant said. Maybe he noticed me before he spoke and lied. This isn't a case of two freaked out fugitives getting on the first train possible. This is two travelers with tickets who made it to their intended destination. Get me everything you can on these four towns. Rex and Ross left the room. Grant didn't understand how that boy had managed to outsmart him like this. But he would pay. Grant licked his lips at the thought of bringing this treacherous thief to justice. Personal justice, first. Mr. Marsden, did you need someone to bounce ideas off of? Leonard knocked on the door. I don't know what gave you that idea, Grant said. The old man hadn't proved much help. His main purpose was clearance. Then Grant had an idea. Wait. Have you decided to release the boy's picture? This was Leonard's go-to suggestion. Not to the public, but to all rag offices operating around the four towns I've narrowed their location down to. I still think there's a chance he might not flee with her. 
but if we plaster his face everywhere, we can kiss his reporting for duty goodbye. Grant said, give her picture to every border station. But almost nobody who's sneaking into a country goes through the front door. She'll try to hop the fence. It was obvious that years of being head of an office had driven Leonard to hate the exciting or unpredictable. Grant knew Leonard wished he wasn't taking such an active role in the investigation, but he didn't care. This was his wife and his fun. I think she has professional help, and professionals have a way of accomplishing things, Grant said. I, too, am a professional, so why don't you just do what I say and drop this little charade? Grant turned back to looking out from his balcony. He heard Leonard get up and leave. Maybe the old man was right. Releasing Andrew's picture would allow the public to call it in if his face was sighted but it would also keep him hidden. If the people helping them were willing to hide a girl, it would be just as easy to hide a boy. No, Grant was right. It was better to give them a sense of safety. Chapter 55 Unmarried females are not allowed to leave the country. However, Upon marriage, it is at the discretion of the husband if he wishes to show his wife other parts of the world. She may travel to beautiful beaches, swim in exotic oceans, and experience other cultures, all under the protection of her husband. The Registry Guide for Girls Dinner was more processed takeout food. Mia wished she could cook a real meal for everyone, but Rod never wanted her upstairs alone. She gobbled the greasy burger down and focused on the conversation. It was light and whimsical, with Rod retelling stories about silly things Carter had done as a baby. All four of them were in hysterics by the end of the meal. As the laughter died, Rod's soft expression went hard. I hate to bring the evening down to a sour note, Rod said. Then don't, Carter said. His voice was filled with cheer. Mia and Andrew said nothing but looked at Rod with focus. Mia knew that what he was about to say related to their journey. Carter seemed to pick up on the fact that no one wanted to keep joking and sank down in his chair. We should be good to head down in three weeks. The weather patterns are breaking a little, so it shouldn't be too hot. I'm working on having some fake papers drawn up for all of us. Mia and I will head down in the roadster. She'll be playing the role of the happy new wife I'm taking on a honeymoon. Mia thought about the Sam Spot ads she had seen earlier that day. It made perfect sense to go under that cover. Carter and Andrew will follow in the truck. They'll be recently released soldiers looking to let off some steam, Rod said. You're crossing? Mia asked. She shot her eyes toward Andrew. He had always been so adamant about service. It was a bit much to take that he had changed his mind. She'd wished so hard that he would cross with her, but now Mia wondered why. She didn't dare think it could be for her. It's too dangerous for me now. I don't have any other choice. Any hope Mia had for Andrew to return her feelings went right out the door. This was no grand gesture. This was just another reminder of how she'd ruined his life. It's important you play the part. We are going to spend a lot of time going over the things a soldier should know. If they doubt you for a second, they might check your papers. It is important you are convincing enough that they let you stroll right through, Rod said. What if they check the papers? Mia asked. Best case scenario, they think the scanner is broken and send them through anyway. Worst case scenario. Andrew and Carter are arrested and tried for treason. What about us? Mia asked again. They'll never check us. We're each playing a role we're familiar with, and that fancy red car screams rich man with a young wife. I'm not worried about getting through at all. What happens once we're on the other side? Andrew asked. Where will you take us? I've been doing some thinking on that. I wanted to bring it up to Carter alone, but maybe this is better. We used to help a lot of people across, 
But the last several years, it has slowed down. You two are the first in a couple years. I think we should relocate down south, too. Maybe the four of us can stick together for a while, till we figure out where we're going. So now there are four of us living dangerously in Mexico? I heard they don't like Americans too much, Andrew said. Well, they're fine with vacationers. We just couldn't try to get jobs or set up shop. We'd get deported right back up here, Rod said. I don't have everything worked out yet, but I will before we leave. And everything will be okay, I promise. Mia tried to read the expressions around the table. Carter looked thrilled with the idea. Rod was smiling at his son's obvious acceptance of the plan. Andrew's face remained blank, unmoving, and emotionless, like normal. She sighed and smiled, showing Rod and Carter she backed the idea. It was always safer in a group. When should Carter and I start learning about acting the part of the soldier? Andrew asked. His voice remained monotone. I'm all good, Carter said. He pushed his chair away from the table and placed his arms behind his head. Andrew glowered at his arrogance. Mia was shocked Carter was able to get a rise out of him at all. I've been training Carter for years, Rod said. Without missing a beat, Carter dropped all expression from his face, rose and made his body as still as possible, sat back down with perfect posture, and began eating his food, back straight, head up the entire time. It was clear he had a lot of discipline. Mia was impressed. Now, I've only got a couple of weeks to teach you some tricks, so we won't cover eating like a serviceman, Rod said. He laughed a little and slapped his son on the back. But from here on out, we will spend most of our free time working on this stuff, starting tonight. I'd like to learn too, Mia said. I mean, not the formal stuff. I just want to know how to defend myself a little better. Sorry, it's not that kind of training. More like how to talk or answer questions like a serviceman. A newly released one has a different outlook on life. Older, more mature, Rod said. Like finishing school? Carter tried to choke back a laugh while Andrew's eyes were on fire. It seemed like Mia had struck a nerve. How about I go over some basic defense moves with you while Andrew brushes up on his etiquette, Carter said. Mia was nervous about spending time with him after this afternoon. He was so forward. But happiness spewed forth from him, and it was infectious. She nodded, reminding herself to take Andrew off her brain. Great. You two go in the basement. Andrew and I will start work up here. Rod was pleased with the arrangement. It took only a glimpse for Mia to see Andrew did not share Rod's sentiment. The shorts were too small. Mia found herself trying to pull them down. They felt more like underwear. The shirt was too baggy. It fell lower than the shorts. She knew she looked ridiculous, but Carter had demanded she change into something she could move more easily in, and his mother had not enjoyed sweatpants the way Mia did. She pushed open the bedroom door to see Carter waiting. He had already moved the pool table to the side and laid down some mats. She could feel his eyes running up and down her body. You should dress like that all the time. You'd stop any attacker dead in his tracks. Mia felt her face flush. She wasn't used to receiving such open compliments and wanted to say something clever back, but her mind couldn't leave the afternoon kiss. I mean, what a stunning woman you are, Carter said, giving himself a bit of an accent. Are we going to chit-chat all night, or are you going to teach me something? Mia thought she sounded like Andrew. Fair enough, fair enough. Don't want to keep the princess waiting. Carter said. Rule number one when it comes to fighting is never attack first. Carter went on explaining how important it was to duck and avoid contact with the other person, not to let them grab you. It seemed to Mia he was telling her to run rather than defend, but she was eager for the information. After several more moments of driving this home, he rose to his feet. I want you to try to hit me. 
Mia cracked her knuckles and made fists. The smile never left Carter's face, making it hard for her to concentrate. She wanted to show him how serious she was about learning to defend herself. So she pulled back as far as she could and drove her fist straight toward his stomach, ready to knock him to the ground. Her fist never connected. He moved out of the way. He stepped behind her, wrapped his arms around her waist, and hoisted her up. She was glad he'd caught her, because the force of the punch would have made her fall. You've got some might, he set her down. Again. She decided to play his game. Instead of aiming for where he was, she aimed for where he was moving and pulled her arm back as fast as possible. Her fist never connected, and the same thing happened again. Carter held her up in the air. Better, but it's always easier for me to read you. You're the attacker, but I'm the one with the advantage. Again. This time, Carter was bouncing up and down. Mia had no clue which way he was going to run or how to hit him, so she came up with a better idea. Lifting her arm in an exaggerated movement, Mia punched, aiming at nothing and anticipating Carter's arms around her waist. Before he could lift her in the air, she pushed off, throwing herself into him, knocking them both to the floor. Mia was lying on top of him. She rolled to the side and was about to stand when he pulled her back down. Very impressive, princess. Maybe I don't need to move so slow with you. He moved a lock of her hair away from her face. Mia interpreted this as an invitation and bent down over his face, pushing her lips against his. He returned her kiss, his lips soft and barely parted. On the inside, Mia was squealing in delight. Carter raised his hand and placed it on her hip. She could feel him sliding it up the curve of her waist. This was too much. She pulled away. Hoping to avoid any obvious questions, Mia decided to ask her own. How come you're not afraid of me? I'm a girl. Most boys your age would be too scared to even look at me. It's illegal for us to behave this way. I didn't grow up like most boys, Carter said. We've always helped young women escape, for as long as I can remember. Some stayed with us for a while, too. It was like having an older sister. I just don't see you as much different from me. What were the other runaways like? Where did you take them? Mia couldn't hide her intrigue. There hasn't been one in years, Carter said. Most of them were smuggled to us by their parents. We'd hide whole families, and my dad would figure out a way to get them over. It was like a trail of big sisters. Mia felt anger and jealousy rising in her, that her own parents had offered her no help, but others did help their children. She quickly felt the anger wash away. She didn't focus on herself. Instead, she decided it was nice to know that some parents did love their children. None of them were quite like you, Carter said. You don't even know me, Mia responded playfully. I know that you're brave, that you're strong and I wouldn't want to get in your way. It takes a lot of courage to escape, and I am completely enamored with you. Carter's words were so refreshing. She went back in for another kiss. This one was short and sweet. Once it was over, she moved her head to his shoulder and lay down next to him on the mats. I thought boys were raised by the government for the most part, like Andrew. How'd you get so lucky? Mia knew she would get some cryptic response, but felt like pushing her luck. Not all boys. There were a couple guys in town whose parents kept them. Most didn't, though. I think home-raised boys are less than 3% of the population or something like that, Carter said. My dad was raised like Andrew. Part of me thinks that's why he's so eager to help the kid. He thinks he's a young rod. I'm pretty sure your father worships the ground you walk on. Mia was surprised by the male jealousy. And I feel the same about him. We're all we've got, Carter said. Or we were until now. He moved his hand lower and linked it with Mia's, then pulled himself over so he was on top of her. He went in for a deep kiss, which she was glad to return. If she had known kissing would be so nice, she would have run years ago. 
Chapter 56 The most important day in an American home is the wedding anniversary. This day is marked in a number of ways, but always comes with elegant gifts. A wife can expect jewels, fine fabrics, and an array of other presents showcasing her husband's love. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia lay in bed. It was pitch black in her room. She had forgotten to ask for a watch and wasn't sure whether it was the middle of the night or the middle of the morning. It was hard to sleep. Her thoughts were too focused on Carter's kisses. Unable to guess what time it was, Mia decided she needed to find out. She switched on her lantern and pushed open her door. The rest of the basement was in total darkness. Andrew's door was closed. She made her way to the bar and pulled open the laptop. It came to life and showed the time as 3.07 a.m. She laughed to herself. Carter made her feel so alert and happy. It might as well have been midday. She was about to close the lid and head to bed when a notification caught her eye. A little exclamation point sat on top of the internet icon. Mia double-clicked it and the web shot up. It took her straight to Sam's spot. The Guatemalan way had responded. Mia opened the message. Glad to catch your interest. Travel to our little corner of paradise is easiest through Mexico. Lots of people get stung going by sea. Too many jellyfish. Our neighbors, the relaxation, are a false front. Don't vacation there. Some people say TGW was a hoax just to create TR. Americans are always winners, and we are happy to have them. Some Americans were so tired, they came down to Guatemala to relax. They have gone to sleep by now, but they had some great bedtime stories. Please let me know if you have any more questions. We'd love to have you join us. S. Mia read the response several times. Guatemala was a country on the other side of Mexico? The Great War was a hoax just to create the registry? Was it planned to get the men out of the country, to keep them safe? Mia wanted to know more. She typed her response. S. I would love to hear those bedtime stories. When I get to Guatemala, how can I find you? M. Mia's heart raced in her chest. She'd actually made contact with a legitimate source. Between Carter and S., there was no way she was sleeping tonight. It appeared S wasn't faring any better. There was already a response. M. We will find you. It is sandy, airy, fun, and excellent down here. Don't forget to pack your swim trunks. S. Mia wasted no time responding. She'd always thought Mexico would be the end of the line, but it sounded like Guatemala was a safe haven. She decided to take it a step farther. S. I will need a bikini. M. Mia took a deep breath and awaited a response. It didn't take long. M. You can borrow one of mine. I have plenty. S. S was a girl. She was on the internet. This news made Mia so happy she could have cried. There was life out there. There were people who knew the truth about the world. Mia's story would have a happy ending. S. I'd like to hear how you amassed your collection. I'd like to hear everything about your adventures. I am a travel buff. M. Mia had no patience. S. was taking her time responding to the last question. Mia imagined a grand story, full of ups and downs. She wanted to take it all in. Finally, the response came. M. From one travel buff to another, all in due time. Wouldn't want to bore you before you get here. Please just ask me any questions about travel to the Guatemalan way. Everything else will be explained when you arrive. S. Mia felt her heart sink. Her new friend didn't want to communicate anymore. Mia reread their conversation. It wasn't very cryptic. She guessed anyone could figure out what it meant. Mia focused on the positives of the conversation. There was somewhere to go now. There was somewhere to learn. She took pleasure in that fact. She was reaching her hand out to close the lid 
when a new notification popped up. M. I've been enjoying the Guatemalan way for four years. It took me almost three to get down here. Best decision of my life. One of the best things we do down here is relax. I think I'm going to go do that now. S. A smile worked its way up to Mia's face. She wasn't alone. She was going to have a life. A real one. She closed the screen and walked back to her bedroom. She lay down and her mind raced with thoughts of Carter and of S. Chapter 57 Loss of life is a casualty of war. If you are strong enough, you will have no fear of losing yours. The Boy's Guide to Service the southwest area had never been a blip on Grant's radar. He sulked to himself at the thought of traveling there, back to the heat and dust. Attention, gentlemen, Grant said. The team stopped to listen to their leader. After going over the four towns, we have it narrowed to two. She's in either Gila Bend or Grady. Are you going to send someone to the others just in case? Leonard asked. He was getting more and more on Grant's nerves. No, it wouldn't make sense to travel there. She wants to cross the border and she'll get closer to it. That's why my money is on Gila, but Grady is close enough not to ignore. Now, as I was saying, we have it narrowed down to these two places and we'll split in half, monitoring the towns. Agent Ross and I will be in Gila with half the team, while Rex and Agent Leonard will take the other half of you to Grady. Grant gave Agent Ross a wink. The young agent was having a hard time concealing his happiness over his placement. When you get there, set up a station. Half of you see if you can find anyone from the train. We have pictures of those who entered that car, but we never saw get off. These are small, closed towns. People know one another. Grant hoped this could be wrapped up soon. Don't be too upfront. I don't want our presence known. We need the surprise advantage, or they'll just run again. Be discreet. What if someone picked them up there, but they're in another town? This just seems illogical to me, Leonard said. Yes, because it's better to assume they are being helped by desert nomads. Please leave the strategy to me. I'm just saying. Listen to me, you moron, Grant said. If I wanted the opinion of some washed-up has-been, I'd ask for it. You know nothing, you understand nothing. So keep your mouth shut and do what I say, or else you'll end up going into retirement. The room fell quiet with Grant's little blow-up. He assumed they understood what type of retirement he was referring to, and pulled his lips into a slight smile. Leonard gave him a smug look. Grant scanned the members of his team and recognized that the vast majority were siding with Leonard. Grant needed complete control and realized he needed to give in a little. He missed the days when Leonard was an obedient old man. Check the surrounding towns. Fifty, no, seventy-five mile radius. Grant nodded at Leonard. For those who aren't in the field, start doing background checks on people in the area. Look for someone or something that stands out. Why would a stranger risk his life to help someone? It's for a darn good reason. We find the reason, we find her. The men seemed to nod their heads in agreement, glancing around at each other. Please be at your destinations within 24 hours, rested and refreshed. Rex will give you your itineraries. With these final words, Grant turned and walked back to his room. He could hear Agent Ross trailing in his footsteps. Grant wondered if he was going soft. A few years ago, Leonard would have been through the window. Grant didn't need Agent Ross for anything at the moment and wished he would go away. We'll take my helicopter, but it's still a far hike. We're looking at about five hours or so. The men have about an 18-hour drive. We'll leave in a few hours. Please pack up your things, Grant said. He heard the agent's footsteps stop. Agent Ross was no longer at his heels. That was one of the traits he admired about the man. He took direction well. 
Or maybe he was just scared of a helicopter ride after the incident with Agent Jeffries. Grant let out a happy sigh over the memory of his earlier flight. Chapter 58 The husband's word is bond. He is older, has experienced the world, and knows how to avoid dangers and bad situations. His number one priority is always the safety of his wife. He is always right, and a wife appreciates his intelligence. The Registry Guide for Girls The hum of the air conditioner came to a stop at the same moment Mia's eyes flew open. She grabbed the wristwatch Carter had lent to her. 9.30. She assumed it was a.m. and flung her legs off the bed. She switched on her lantern and examined a couple of the bruises on her arms. Some were going down. She had only been here a week, but training with Carter had caused her so much damage. Mia was settling into a nice routine. Stretches and core training in the morning, reading in the afternoon, dinner, and then training with Carter, followed by some kisses. Each bruise showed her dedication, and she was proud to wear them. Even Andrew was in good spirits. Spending time with Rod meant a lot to him. Mia figured it was almost like having a father. She missed Andrew. They never spent any time together. She felt guilty over her time with Carter, like she was cheating on Andrew. She reminded herself he'd shot her down. She wasn't required to sit around and wait for him. Besides, he didn't own her. She had the right to have some fun with Carter. Her conversations with S never got longer than a few sentences. They didn't come every day, either. Mia always thought it was a special treat to receive contact. She didn't know anything personal about her new friend. But her faith was reinforced. She found out Guatemala was on the far side of Mexico. It had a tropical climate, and, according to the internet, it owed America everything for even existing. She took the lack of specifics she could find as a positive. Mia slid the door to her room open. She walked to the light switch and closed her eyes while the light flooded in. She waited a moment before opening them, giving herself time to adjust. She didn't bother to change out of her sleepwear. Two short plaid shorts with a baggy white tank top. It was comfy and perfect for her stretches. She reminded herself that rewearing clothes conserved water, too. I always wondered what you looked like when you woke up. Carter said. Mia jumped and turned, going into a fighting stance. Her heart was in her throat. Calm down, princess. It's just me. Carter raised his arms in the air. He was in baggy mesh shorts with a plain white t-shirt, not his normal work clothes. What are you doing here? Just hanging out in the dark? Mia relaxed her stance. Is it 9.30 p.m.? She was always scared of sleeping through the day. Having no priorities and no windows made it hard for her to grasp time. Carter started laughing. No, no, it's the morning. I just got down here, listened to see if you were up before I turned on the lights. Then you opened the door, almost scaring me. I thought I'd play hooky and stay home with you today. Count me out. Mia wasn't sure what hooky was, but it didn't sound like fun to her. It's just an expression, princess. I'm ditching work to hang out with you. Oh, Mia pressed her lips together. She found the term a little misleading. Well, I stretch and do the workouts you wrote down for me in the morning. Run in place for a while. I thought we could do another kind of workout. Carter bent down and kissed her forehead. She giggled in response. It's too early for kisses. It's never too early with you. He spun her around and let his arms rest on her hip bones while he clasped his hands in front of her. I've got an idea, Mia said. Since you're here during the day, what if we went upstairs? I could make you some real food. See the sun. I haven't seen the sun in over a week. Please, please, please. Mia felt like her eyes were going to fall out of her head with the pleading look on her face. Carter bit his lip. He was contemplating the idea, but Mia knew she had him. You can't tell anyone, ever, 
not Dad, not Andrew. I promise. Mia went up on her tiptoes. Give me a minute. Let me make sure the blinds are shut. I'll call for you when the coast is clear. She nodded, not listening. She wished the blinds would stay open so she could feel a warm glow on her skin. She hadn't realized how much she'd taken sunlight for granted. She told herself to cheer up, remembering there was nothing but sun in Guatemala. The door cracked open. The rest of your castle awaits, princess. From the top of the stairs, Carter bowed and held out his arm. Mia took the stairs two at a time. The blinds were thick and kept out almost all the light, but the little bit that made it through made Mia wrap her arms around herself and breathe it in. It was beautiful. She skipped over to the fridge and made a face at its contents. She was hoping to make some real food for them. You guys eat out a lot, huh? Dad can't cook, and I never learned, Carter said. I'm used to it anyway. She sifted through what little they had and decided on some French toast. Eggs, milk, and bread would do the job. She didn't think it was worth asking if they had any cinnamon. She set her ingredients on the countertop and was looking for a skillet when they heard the unmistakable sound of the garage door opening. Carter sprang from his seat. There wasn't enough time to make it to the basement door. It was right next to the entryway. Here, he opened one of the lower cabinets. Hide. It was easy to understand why the cabinet was empty. The fridge was bare, so it didn't make sense to have pots and pans when there was no food to cook. She scooted right in, and Carter closed the door with his knee. It bounced open a little, giving Mia a slight view. Hey, kiddo, Rod's voice was unmistakable. What are you doing with all that stuff? I was going to try to cook, make a little breakfast for Mia, surprise her. Carter sounded honest. How do you know what you're doing, though? Rod asked. Mia told me once, talking about some kind of egg bread. I guessed it couldn't be hard to figure out. Thought I'd use the computer. She's not awake yet, so I have some time. Rod walked around the counter, and Mia got a clear view of his legs. I don't want to see you get your hopes up about this. I think Andrew has some strong feelings for her. They've been through a lot, and I don't think it's a good idea for you to go chasing after her. Relax. I don't want to battle either. We're friends. Oh, great, Mia thought. She wished she could chime in and tell Rod how wrong he was. She had made the same mistake, thinking Andrew might have feelings for her. There were none. She always felt ashamed when she thought back to St. Louis and his rejection. She also had an urge to pull Carter's leg hair for saying they were just friends. She wondered if this is what he did with all his friends. Okay, just be careful and back off a little, Rod said. Shoulder feeling any better? I just took some ice off. Carter said. I think it'll be fine by tomorrow. Good. We'll need you to finish the Robinson job, Rod said. I forgot my new boots. Any chance you'd run upstairs and grab them for me? My back is killing me, and I think they'll make all the difference. Sure, Carter said as he left the cabinet. Mia heard him running up the stairs. As soon as he was all the way up, Rod bent down. She froze not wanting him to see her. He pulled up a loose floorboard and took out a plastic bag. It was filled with some money and documents. He dropped some more money in the bag and replaced the board. He leaned against the counter, ending Mia's view. She realized Rod was getting things ready for their departure. She thought it was unusual that he was hiding this stuff. Here you go, Carter reappeared. Thanks. Feel better. Rest up that shoulder. Rod started toward the door. He stopped briefly to add a closing remark. And remember, don't get involved. Mia heard the door slam shut but didn't move. She wanted to wait for the garage door to close in case he ran back inside. Carter might get in big trouble for letting her upstairs. Her mind raced back to Rod's comments. What did he see that made him think Andrew was interested in her as more than a friend? And 
what had made Carter say they were just friends? She shook her head. Maybe it was for the best that Carter was just having fun, because even though she tried hard to deny it, Andrew never left her thoughts. Do you want to see my room? Carter asked. The morning had turned into a lazy afternoon, and Mia didn't want it to end. Sure, I've never been all the way upstairs. Carter swooped by and grabbed Mia's hand, swinging it back and forth as he led her up the steps. They were carpeted and felt nice on Mia's bare feet. At the top, there was a small landing with three doors, one on each wall. Straight across from the steps was the bathroom. It was large, with a deep, giant tub. Mia wondered why, since they were so concerned about water shortages, but not enough to ask. To the right is Dad's room, and here... Carter swung open the door. Here is me. There were dirty clothes all over the place. The bed was unmade, and a strange odor came from within. The wall was decorated with photos of Rod and Carter. Most were just taped to the wall without any frames. It was just as Mia had imagined. Carter flopped down on the bed. It looked soft as his body bounced up and down. Mia sat next to him, not wanting to lie down yet. There were papers scattered everywhere. She bent down and picked one up. It was a realistic drawing of a dog. That was Rufus. He died about a year ago. You're talented. Mia examined the detail in the ears and snout. You want to see some more? Mia nodded while Carter rolled over and produced a binder. Mia began flipping through the pages. There were lots of Rod, doing a whole different array of activities. Fishing, hiking, biking. It was obvious Rod and Carter were each other's lives. Random pictures of animals, monsters, and characters filled the rest of the pages, until Mia reached the back. For the last several pages, the same picture was drawn over and over again. It was of a beautiful woman. Mia ran her hand down the page. That's my mother, Carter said. Well, I think so at least. I based it off a photograph of her. He again rolled over. This time he reached into his nightstand and pulled out the picture. She was wearing the long navy blue dress Mia had worn her first day there. Her hair was long and strawberry blonde. Mia saw that her features were similar to her son's. She's beautiful. I never met her. Carter took the photo back. Did she die having you? Mia put her hand over her mouth. As soon as the question was out, she knew she'd gone too far. Over the past week, her fairy tale story of Rod and his wife had filled her heart and head. She'd begun to imagine all the different possibilities. No, Carter said. Her name was Rachel. I'm surprised they didn't give you an R name. Rod, Rachel, and Roger, Mia said. My name is Rod. Carter is my middle name, he reminded her. He didn't seem to lighten up. Mia got the impression he wanted to talk about his mother. Well, what happened? You want to know? Carter let out a big sigh. Mia nodded. My dad was 30 when they were married. He got her through the registry, of course, but it was different for him. He loved her. He won't talk about her much but I know he did. Real love, not ownership. Carter took a short breath. Mia could tell he was trying to talk, but couldn't form the words. Well, after they were together for a few years, she got pregnant with me. When I was born, my dad wanted to give me up, turn me over to the government like he was raised. They fought about it, but my dad didn't care. It was the right thing to do in his eyes. He didn't want to waste money feeding a boy. He just wanted to try for a girl right away. So when I was about a week old, my mother was sleeping, and he came in and took me. He was driving me to the nearest safe house to drop me off. I guess I didn't cry or anything. About halfway there, he had a change of heart. See, he wasn't a bad man. He couldn't do that to my mother or me. 
He'd spent a little bit of time with me, and he knew he loved me, too. When we got back, it was too late. My mom realized he'd taken me away. She wrote a note, and then she killed herself. All of Mia's romantic ideas came screeching to a halt. She regretted asking Carter for the story. It was sad, sadder than she'd expected. She didn't know how to respond, so instead she just leaned over and hugged him. He's a good man. He was going to keep me, Carter said. So don't pity me and don't blame him. He blames himself enough. That's why we help people like you. For my mother. Mia debated telling Carter about S. He'd just shared something personal. She decided it was her turn. Before she got the chance, though, the house filled with voices. Rod and Andrew were back. Mia looked at Carter with panic. She knew Andrew was going to make a beeline for the basement. It was always the first thing he did when he got home. She could already hear him opening the door and going down the stairs. She looked at Carter for a plan, but it looked like he had none. Rod, Mia's gone. She's not down there. I checked her room, the bathroom, my room. She's gone, Andrew said. Mia pushed off of Carter's bed and ran to the stairs. I'm here, I'm here, she said, still in her pajamas from the night before, wishing she had changed. She just came upstairs. I was showing her some drawings. I figured you two would be home soon, Carter said. He gave a nervous laugh. Rod looked disappointed and worried, while Andrew was wearing a look all too familiar, one of rage. He darted toward Carter. I gave up my life to protect her, and you care so little for her you risk her freedom, he said. Andrew, my life wasn't in jeopardy. It's almost dark out, Mia said. She tried to defend Carter. But it's not dark out yet. Andrew said, I don't know why I bothered putting any effort into this if you can't even follow the rules. What if someone saw you? What if someone thought it was weird the curtains were drawn during the day? Do you want that kind of attention? Mia stood silent, and Carter was speechless as well. Stay away from her, Andrew said. He looked at Carter before grabbing Mia's arm and pulling her toward the basement. Chapter 59 The main goal of the registry is to ensure the well-being of Americans. Without the system, improper, unfulfilling matches would be made. The Registry Guide for Girls Mumbled words were firing out of Andrew's mouth as he led her down the stairs. Mia didn't care what he had to say. As soon as they rounded the bottom step, Mia twisted her arm and pushed Andrew off of her. His mouth hung open as he turned back to face her. Don't grab me. I'm not your property. She walked away toward her room. You are going to ruin everything. Caution is important, Andrew said. That's the second time you've grabbed me like that. I warned you the first time. You're not my father, you're not my husband, and you don't own me. Mia could hear her voice rising. So stop acting like you do. I'm sick and tired of you mentioning how I ruined your life. I get the point. I'm sorry it happened. Move on. Mia could tell she was being a bit overdramatic. Andrew was having a difficult time forming his response. When I agreed to help you, you became my responsibility, he said. Nobody was going to see me. Mia felt like pulling her hair out. Are you mad I was upstairs or that I was upstairs with Carter? Andrew's lips tightened. Mia thought about Rod's comments. She didn't know why she'd bothered asking. She knew Andrew had no feelings for her. He'd made that clear in St. Louis. She wasn't surprised when his face turned cold. Who you choose to spend your time with has nothing to do with me. Making it over the border safely requires you not being caught. Please be more respectful in the future. If not for me, then for Rod. And there it was. Andrew was never going to let her see what was inside of him. He didn't want to kiss her like Carter did. He didn't want any affection. He'd had multiple chances to share his feelings. Mia didn't know whether he didn't have any for her or was just incapable of showing them. But either way, 
was unacceptable to her. Mimicking his blank face, Mia turned away and walked toward her room. The door was still open from Andrew's earlier search, and she walked in and began to slide it closed. Are you coming up for dinner? Andrew said. No, Mia said, seconds before the door closed. Chapter 60 Pain is your personal proof that you are fighting hard for your country. You should enjoy it and master it. War is difficult, but if you listen to your elders, hone your skills, and control your pain, you will not falter. The Boy's Guide to Service Andrew slammed the door to his room, sat on the bed, and put his head in his hands. He knew he'd gone too far. He never felt sorry for himself. He'd seen the near-starving creatures on his travels, remembered the young boys who fell ill and disappeared from the orphanage, had heard stories of boys who were kept secretly by their mothers, only to be tossed out by irate fathers as small children. They'd known love and suffered the devastation of its loss. At least Andrew was strong, alive, and without attachments that would make him weak. Still, being here with Carter, someone who had it better than anyone he'd ever met, was a nonstop annoyance. What the hell had Carter been thinking? Taking Mia upstairs was beyond idiotic. Andrew started to cool down. He remembered why he had come down in the first place. He stripped off his clothes and toweled off his sweat before stepping into a pair of jeans and a fresh white tank. He wished he had more pairs of shorts. It was so hot in this area. He reminded himself to get used to it. Where he was going, the Midwestern snow season didn't exist. He walked back into the basement and noticed Mia's door was pulled shut. He guessed she'd sealed herself in for the night. He walked up to her door and lifted his hand. He was ready to knock, but he couldn't think of what to say. Should he tell her he was sorry? Should he try to explain himself? He pictured her face, the hurt and anger obvious. Waves of guilt and shame washed over him at the thought that he'd caused her such pain. When he had gotten home and seen she wasn't in the basement, the worst feeling of his life had come over him. He felt like all the air had been sucked out of the room. He was so sure something had happened to her and it was his fault that he'd failed her. Now he realized that by grabbing her, he'd failed her in another way. He debated knocking and asking her up for dinner again, but wasn't sure how to phrase it. Instead, he lowered his hand and walked away. He hated how uncomfortable she made him. Facing Carter was going to be difficult. Andrew knew his temper would flare when he saw him. Carter was a spoiled, entitled jerk. He was a lot like Andrew's original impression of Mia. But she had changed, and Carter would have to as well if he was going to survive life on the run. Andrew swallowed and remembered he needed to change, too. Putting on the facade of a soldier was more difficult than he'd thought, and the lessons were so tedious. Stand up straight, make constant eye contact, answer questions without thinking. It was like memorizing someone else's life. He wondered if that was how Mia felt preparing for marriage. He shuddered at the thought. She had been trained to have no personality, but she'd proved them wrong. She was outgoing and strong, her own person. To Andrew's relief, when he went upstairs, Carter wasn't around. Rod was seated at the table alone with a drink in his hand. None of the food they'd picked up was present. Andrew became embarrassed. Rod had witnessed his blow-up at Mia and his son. Andrew doubted he appreciated that. Let's take a break from lessons tonight. Sit outside and have a talk, Rod said. He was walking over to the back door and sliding it open before he got a response. Andrew followed him outside. There was a large deck with a built-in table and benches. It was designed for parties. There was no grass anywhere, just the plain desert ground. The back of the neighbor's house behind them was visible, but too far away to notice any details. It wasn't as secluded as the farms, but at least there was some space. 
Andrew sat at the table with Rod, not looking forward to what was coming. He tried to make it a point to stay off people's radar. He never handled being yelled at or told what to do well. Andrew was sure he was seconds away from receiving a stern lecture. Rod reached into a small cooler and handed Andrew a soda. The talk Andrew dreaded never came. The two men sat in silence for a long time, just listening to the noises of the desert. At first, Andrew found the sounds of the bugs comforting, but as the blue sky deepened, they became maddening. He wished Rod would just get this over with. If it was his intention to create suspense, he was doing a great job. I didn't hurt her, Andrew said. If that's what you think, I would never hurt her. Rod didn't say anything, but kept staring into the distance. She never thinks of consequences. Everything is a game to her, and she lives in the moment. Being confined to a basement for a couple weeks is a lot better than a life in a cell. And not just her life, ours. It makes me think she doesn't care about us. Andrew glanced over at Rod, but again he gave no reaction. Andrew continued. I knew the moment she asked for my help I was going to help her, even before she blackmailed me. And in all truth, it wasn't blackmail. I could have taken her back and nothing would have happened to me. I've had several chances to walk away since, too, and passed those up. I am here by my own choice. Maybe I should tell her that. Rod sat in quiet agreement, or at least that's how Andrew interpreted his silence. Telling her anything is hard. Talking to her is hard. I can't say anything important. The words just don't come out. I end up doing something stupid or saying something mean. I don't understand. Andrew looked at a blank Rod. Will you please say something? Rod took a sip from his drink and cracked his neck before speaking. The way you grew up is the same way I did. Thinking of women as either off limits or inferior. And it's a hard adjustment when one comes into your life who you can and want to talk with, Rod said. But women aren't inferior. They are complex and treated poorly by everyone around them. You need to get that idea out of your head and realize she is a person and not property. I know that. Andrew felt Rod was talking to him like he was stupid. No, you don't. If you did, you could tell her things, talk to her, and above all, listen to what she has to say. Trust me, if you realize that too late, it will haunt you forever. Why does everyone think I'm interested in her that way? I'm not. My goal has always been to get a wife the traditional way. By purchasing one off the internet, Rod asked. He laughed at the ridiculousness of his question. That's not your goal. It never was, or you never would have helped her. It's okay to fall in love, and it's okay to see her as an equal. Just be who you are and not who you think you should be. Love? Andrew scoffed at the idea. What was there to love about her? She was nosy and controlling. But she was also smart, caring, and non-judgmental. She always did her best to make sure he was okay. She put herself out there, faced rejection, and continued on with life. She was beautiful and had a certain way of smiling with her entire face so that even her nostrils looked like they were happy. Andrew hadn't realized it, but thinking about her made a huge smile spread across his face. Then it hit him. He did love her. He was in love with her. I'm not one to get too touchy-feely. But if you decide you feel something about her, you need to let her know. Because I'm not getting involved or taking sides, but my son does not share the same hang-ups as you or me. He's been raised knowing how evil the system is, and that women are just people who deserve respect and understanding. That, and he's a natural chatterbox. No offense, but I'm not worried about Carter, Andrew said. He's not her type. Andrew couldn't picture Mia happy with someone who didn't take anything seriously, someone who did so little with his life. And how do you know what her type is? 
Andrew frowned. How did he know what her type was? Maybe she liked Carter's carefree attitude. Maybe she enjoyed how loud he was. He didn't know what to say, but his concerned face must have said enough. Her feelings can always change, but ones that are hurt change faster. After the way things were left tonight, I bet she's hurting pretty bad. Rod advised him. Do you know something? Are they together? Does Carter want to marry her? Rod about spat his drink out of his mouth. Andrew couldn't tell whether he was choking, laughing, or both. I don't think Carter is the marrying type, and you're all too young to head down that road. He says nothing's going on, but if you've got something to say to her, you should say it. Andrew nodded at Rod and leaned back into his chair. The sky was dark blue now. He assumed Mia was asleep, and he didn't want to wake her. Tomorrow would be a good time to tell her how he felt. He wouldn't back down. He would tell her everything. How sorry he was about St. Louis and Whitney, why he'd helped her in the first place, and why he still did. He'd even tell her about how happy he was to stay with her instead of going into service. He imagined her leaning over him again, their bodies so close and willing. This time, he would reach up to her, and he would place his hand on her lower back and guide her on top of him, eager to feel her touch in return. Chapter 61 Beauty is an American pastime. It is important for women to maintain their physical appearance. As a female ages, her beauty becomes more defined. A husband always appreciates the time and effort his wife spends on aesthetic upkeep. The Registry Guide for Girls Mia's hair had been growing longer each day. She loved having more to play with. She was sure it didn't look much different to anyone else but she could tell the difference when she teased it at the crown. Playing with her hair or makeup had always been one of Mia's favorite pastimes, but since Karina's visit, she'd tried to avoid her old habits at all costs. She was already out of books to read, though, and needed to keep herself busy. S hadn't sent a message today, making Mia's day extra dull. Mia admired her short baby pink eyelet dress and the light pink matching headband. Her makeup was a little on the heavy side, but soft and feminine like the dress. She was surprised this whole experience had made her embrace her inner girl. The bruises didn't send that message. She looked at one on her arm and wondered if it was from Andrew grabbing her last night. She folded her arms and leaned against the counter. She knew it was a training bruise, but she was still so angry at him. He had no right to grab her like that. Nobody did. Her anger flared when the front door opened. The boys were home from work. She heard Andrew's footfall on the stairs heading down to the basement. She slammed the bathroom door, hoping to avoid seeing him. He hadn't even apologized. No knock on her door, no note, no nothing. It was infuriating. It struck her that tonight was Andrew's shower night, and she should get out of the bathroom before he came knocking. She gathered her things and made a beeline to her room, not bothering to glance toward his. It was better this way, she thought. She returned the makeup and hairbrush to their spot and waited for the shower to start. Usually he was so fast and predictable with his schedule. Maybe her being in the bathroom had thrown him off. The spray of the water came on and Mia ran out of her room and jumped up the stairs, away from him. Carter was waiting at the top of the steps. He bent down and picked her up, placing a deep kiss on her lips as he spun her in a circle. She tried to push away from the lip lock, thinking about Rod's words yesterday. She doubted he would approve of this sight. I've missed you, Carter said, setting her back down. I wanted to come see you last night, but Dad was pretty ticked at me. I decided to lie low in my room. Where is Rod? Mia asked in a quiet voice, assuming he was upstairs. Monthly poker game. He hates it, but it gets him a lot of work and keeps people from questioning him as the weird older unmarried man with the son. That was one of the first impressions Mia had of Rod, so it was easy for her to understand. 
I've got a surprise for you. Carter walked over to the counter. Ta-da! He flourished his hands behind some plastic bags before reaching in and pulling out groceries. Real food? Mia was excited. You seem to love cooking so much, Carter said. And what the princess wants, the princess gets. Thank you. Mia ignored the nickname and wrapped her arms around Carter's waist in appreciation. You stink. Go get in the shower. He didn't try to defend himself or show any offense, just nodded in agreement and headed for the stairs. Mia was all alone in the kitchen and couldn't have been happier. She looked through the bags and pulled out the items. Some peppers, onions, ground beef, onion, salt, cheese, eggs, limes, noodles. She knew she could throw something together with these. Her mind flashed back to her mother teaching her how to cook. It was always important for a good wife to perform well in the kitchen, but being fantastic was even better. It was just another way to please a husband. They'd spent hours going over different combinations of flavors. Cooking had been one of the only lessons Mia enjoyed, and now she found a level of familiar comfort in the kitchen. She opened the fridge to put away the items she wouldn't need, while her brain started planning out future meals. As she closed the refrigerator door, Andrew appeared right behind it. Mia's heart jumped as she choked back a scream. Placing her hand over her chest, she breathed heavily. You scared me. I didn't mean to, he said. Do you want some help? She wondered if this was his idea of an olive branch. Here, she placed a tomato in his hand. Chop this up. He took the fruit and looked confused about what to do next. Mia pointed to the counter. She pulled open a couple drawers and found a chef's knife. She handed it over to Andrew. Be careful. They don't have a cutting board, so don't chop hard. She glanced at the sink and saw the pan she'd used for the French toast. This would have to work for browning the beef as well. What are you making? Andrew asked. We are making tacos. Mia started the stove. Shellless ones. I have something to say to you. The sound of Andrew's knife stopped. Mia wasn't sure she cared what he had to say. She was tired of trying to force emotion from him and getting nothing in return. He'd crossed a line last night. I'm sorry you're a person, he said. You're sorry I'm a person. Mia was surprised by his words. She turned to face him. I didn't mean it like that. Andrew was nervous about something. I mean, I am sorry. You are a person, and I should treat you that way. Thanks, Mia said. She went back to the meat. It was strange to get an apology out of Andrew for anything. She glanced over at him. He looked so anxious chopping the vegetables. He dropped the knife and rotated toward her. There are, um, some other things I'd like to say. A drop of sweat dripped down his forehead, though he was fresh from a shower and the air conditioning was on full blast. Are you feeling okay? You look like you're sick. She grabbed a dish towel from the sink, walked over, and handed it to him. No, no, I'm fine. He wiped the sweat away, taking a huge breath. Mia, I... So what's for dinner? Carter said as he barreled down the stairs. Oh, hey, Andrew, you helping the princess do the cooking? Carter pulled out a chair and plopped down at the table. He was grinning ear to ear, paying no attention to Andrew's current state. Mia didn't even think he'd bothered to look toward Andrew. His eyes were glued to her. What are you doing here? Andrew's voice was filled with annoyance. Well. I live here, Carter smiled back, still looking at Mia. And I'm awful at cards. I told Dad I'd rather hang with you, too. Mia shrugged her shoulders. Carter might have lied to Rod about whether something was going on with them, but he sure wasn't trying to keep it a secret from Andrew. She wasn't certain what was happening between the boys right now, but it wasn't good. She tossed an onion toward Carter. If you're going to eat, you're going to help. Your wish is my command, princess. 
The sound of Andrew's chopping was loud and constant. He was wailing away at the tomato. Mia let out a sigh of relief. She wondered what he wanted to say. He'd already apologized, and it did seem sincere. She couldn't think of what would make Andrew so nervous. He was usually so strong. Part of her longed to ask him what was bothering him and to provide him the comfort he obviously needed but his actions from the night before still weighed heavily on her heart. He wasn't her husband, and it wasn't her duty to comfort anyone. Chapter 62 While a wife will never impose the obligation of a party on her husband, he may ask her to perform hosting duties. She should look forward to them and be prepared to show off herself, her home, and her husband to whomever he wishes to welcome. The Registry Guide for Girls Dinner was awkward. Mia missed Rod, who seemed to serve as a better buffer between the two young men. Carter wouldn't stop rubbing his foot against hers under the table, and Andrew wouldn't stop trying to get Carter to leave. Mia didn't want Carter to go, and she didn't want to play foot games either. It's getting late. We should go to bed, Andrew said. It's not too late, and we took last night off from self-defense. Maybe we need a little more practice? Carter asked. Mia glanced toward Andrew, who grimaced. This entire situation was making her more and more uncomfortable, and she couldn't stop thinking about what Andrew planned to say. Well, Rod is playing cards. How about the three of us play a game? Mia hoped to keep everyone together. Do either of you know any? War. I'll go get my deck of cards, Carter said with a hint of smugness. Mia knew it was from the name of the game he'd chosen. No, she grabbed his arm and pulled him back down. I meant a board game. I saw some in the basement. Andrew, would you grab one? She looked at Andrew with sincerity. He didn't seem to take offense at her suggestion and made his way downstairs. She had to avoid any alone time with him, for tonight at least. She didn't want to hear about how they would never form a relationship, never have a strong bond. Her worries were interrupted when Carter placed his hand on her chin, tilting her head up for a quick kiss. Tonight, after you go to bed, I'm going to sneak down into your room. Mia felt like her eyes were going to bulge out of her head, she was enjoying the kisses, but that was as far as it went. There would be no sleepovers. Blink, princess. Just for a little bit. I miss our time alone. Carter gave his reassuring smile. I'm not about to go after anything you don't want. She felt the air enter her lungs again, but her mind kept going. If she wasn't ready to give up thoughts of Andrew... It wasn't fair to keep sneaking around behind his back. She cursed herself for thinking this way. She owed nothing to Andrew, and there was no reason she couldn't kiss Carter. But her heart still told her it was wrong. Carter, that's not a good idea, she said. Is it because of the old laugh machine down there? Carter asked. He doesn't have anything to do with you and me. Don't let him. I'm coming down. He gave her hand a quick kiss, but the sound of Andrew's footsteps made her rip it away. She shook her head no, as he nodded his yes, sticking his tongue out and kissing the air. Mia burst out laughing at his gesture. His eyes went soft, and he gave her a pleading smile, still nodding his head. She gave in and nodded hers in return. It was so comforting to have someone around who could make her laugh. After several hours of board games, Mia had to get some sleep. She wished Carter pleasant dreams and was greeted with a wink. The thought of having him in her room scared and thrilled her at the same time. It felt so foreign, so dangerous. She couldn't imagine what her parents would say if they knew. And that alone seemed like a reason to do it. She hopped into the bathroom to brush her teeth and Andrew was right behind her. Hey. I was hoping I could finish talking with you. He leaned next to the mirror, staring at Mia. 
His intense gaze sent shivers down her spine. With the distraction of Carter's whispered promises, Andrew's talk had nearly slipped her mind. Whatever you had to say, it's okay. I'm not mad at you, we're fine. More fights will happen before we leave, and as long as we're together, we'll get used to it. She continued brushing her teeth, but out of the corner of her eye, she could see the disappointment on his face. She stopped cleaning and spat. It was nice to get some reaction from him for once. Just when she was about to give him the go-ahead for the speech, his face changed. He was back to the standard cold-faced Andrew. He might as well be a robot. Yes, you're right, he said. Good night. He walked out of the bathroom with his back stick straight. Mia shook her head in disbelief. He had such a strange effect on her. She wanted to hug him and slap him at the same time. He was impossible. She washed her mouth out and walked back to her room, shifting her thoughts to her night visitor. Looking through her closet, she decided it was best to stay in the pink dress. She didn't want the pajamas to give him the wrong idea. This was going to be just some quick, wonderful, sweet, easy kisses. The lights clicked off. Andrew was ready for bed. She flipped on her lantern and sat up. Lying down would also give the wrong idea. She licked her lips in anticipation. She always had so much fun with Carter. And that was all it was. Easy fun. Touching her lips, she wondered what it would be like to kiss Andrew. She had a hard time believing it would be the same. Carter's kisses were soft and full of little giggles. She imagined kissing Andrew would be deep and passionate. Her thoughts were broken when she heard the door pop open. Carter walked in and closed the door behind him. Shh, Mia said, not wanting to draw attention. Hi, he said, and sat next to her. He rubbed her shoulder. She looked toward him and he gave his cunning look. An idea popped into Mia's brain. She reached over and flipped off the lantern, climbing on top of his lap in the process. Someone's aggressive tonight, Carter said. Mia held her finger over his lips, signaling that he should be silent. She ran her fingers through his hair and closed her eyes. Instead of Carter, she pictured herself with Andrew. The hair wasn't long and blonde. It was wavy and black. The body wasn't wide and muscular. It was tall and lean. She leaned in and kissed him hard and deep. She felt herself push him back onto the bed. Lost in her thoughts, Mia felt like this was her first real kiss. Chapter 63 You were born in the greatest country in the world. Your time in service will make sure we stay number one. The Boy's Guide to Service Agent Ross twiddled his thumbs against the table. Irritated, Grant shot him a stern look. Relax, you'll never get anywhere without patience. Grant turned back to the latest batch of files his research team had found for him. It turned out lots of oddballs lived in the southwest area. The latest faced across his desk was a man who'd had his daughters removed from his home by force after refusing to enroll them in the registry. It was revolting. Grant knew Agent Ross was worried they had nothing now, but Grant was certain she was in the area. Everything she had done so far followed logic, and it was logical for her to hide here. He enjoyed Agent Ross and didn't want to see him follow in Leonard's footsteps. You sure about not releasing the boy's photo still? This is a close-knit area, and with this many possible helpers, we would shut them off if we did a press release. I'm not sure there is a single decent American around who would do the right thing and turn her over to her husband. Grant tossed the file. We stick with the plan. You have your best agents out there flashing that boy's picture. Someone must have seen him. He's not in hiding. Well, if the community is so rotten and willing to protect the girl, what will make them turn him over? Agent Ross asked. 
Grant noticed there wasn't a single hint of sarcasm in his voice. Your agents and my men are informing the good people of Gila Bend that he's received a large inheritance, but in the grief of his father's passing, he ran away. We're just trying to find him before he enlists, and it's too late. They won't think it's strange he had a father? Agent Ross was bred from the same stock as the majority of American sons. Not in this area. We've already found 14 sons kept by their parents. I don't think there are that many in the whole Northeast area. Lucky boys, Ross said. Lucky? Grant raised an eyebrow. Boys raised like that don't grow into men. They never make it out of service alive. Their parents aren't saving them. They're sentencing them to die. Agent Ross shrugged and nodded in agreement. The phone went off with a loud shrill, stopping the conversation. Grant was glad for the break. Agent Ross. The quick greeting made Grant like his new friend a little bit more. He turned to the next file. Where at? The row house in Theba? How far are you? Ten minutes? Grant rose from his chair. He looked at his outfit, a brown polo and checked brown shorts with brown sandals. He would have liked a more fashionable look to greet his wife in, but it would have to do. He caught sight of a white cardigan hanging on a hook and grabbed it, just in case a desert chill set in. Feeling more presentable, he walked over toward the phone and ripped it out of Ross's hands. Good work, agents. This is Grant Marsden. I am proud of you boys. Now sit tight. Do not enter that house under any circumstances. Stay out of sight. Don't let them know you are there. Do you understand? Sir, that's against procedure. We have to go in and get her right away, the agent on the phone said. He was not familiar with Grant's procedures. Listen, if you set a foot in that house without me, I will make you suffer. Even if you get her, you will not be rewarded. You will be terminated. Grant didn't mean from their jobs. After a momentary silence, the agent gave a, Yes, sir. Grant tossed the phone back toward Agent Ross. Do you want me to pull up the car? We're about 30 minutes away, Agent Ross said. Car? No, don't be stupid. Grant was excited. Tonight was the night. He would have her, and she would pay. Chapter 64 Remember, you will enter service as a boy and leave as a man. You will be worthy of an identity, a new life that you can create for yourself. The Boy's Guide to Service Tell her. Andrew kept repeating the words over and over in his mind as he tried to sleep. Tell her everything. Why was it so difficult? He closed his eyes and her face was the only thing he saw. When she had first said hello to him, standing outside her father's office, his heart had almost stopped. And she still gave him the same feeling. He'd had enough. This was pure torture. She was just across the basement, tucked away. He wondered if she was thinking about him, too. He'd promised himself tonight was the night he'd come clean. He tried to tell himself he didn't have anything to fear, that he wasn't even risking rejection. She'd already made her feelings clear to him. But he knew it wasn't true. So much had happened since the bed in St. Louis. Even then, there was always the possibility she had just been curious about kissing, or she didn't know how to behave with a male so close to her. He was terrified. He'd made a life keeping himself bottled up, making it impossible for people to tell how he was feeling or what he was thinking. He knew that by telling her anything, he was betraying the code that had kept him safe all these years. So maybe it was okay if he waited another day. His body had just started to calm down when Rod's words echoed through his head. Feelings can always change. This flung him out of bed. He didn't want to be safe and alone. He would rather be at risk and with her. He fumbled in the darkness for his lantern and switched it on. He dressed in a pair of sweatpants and a fresh t-shirt. It didn't matter how he looked. He had to do this before he lost his nerve. 
the cold basement floor felt nice on his feet. The coolness spread up through his body, combating his racing heart. He stood in front of her door and breathed, readying himself for the knock. He reminded himself it was late and she might be asleep. He didn't want to wake her and debated walking back to his room. Maybe he would check. There was a chance she was still awake. He reached for the secret lever before he had a chance to change his mind, and the door popped open. He slid it back, not prepared for what, or who, awaited him. Him? Andrew watched in shock as Mia pulled away from Carter and sat up on her bed. She looked flustered in the lantern light. He noticed her hair was out of place, probably from Carter's hands running through it and he bit his lips to keep from screaming in pain. After several drawn-out seconds, he finally found the nerve to speak. You want him? Andrew's voice remained steady. At this point, Carter sat up too, and instead of showing offense at Andrew's comments, he wrapped his arm around Mia's shoulders. Andrew expected the gesture to fill him with rage, but it didn't. He felt only defeat as he watched her try to shrug Carter off with little success. Andrew, I didn't know how you felt, Mia started to say. Stop. I made a mistake. Andrew gulped. He wanted to tell her his error was spurning her advances and failing to act earlier. But his defenses were up again. I made a mistake in thinking that this could be something. But I am better off alone. You don't need my protection anymore. I need to go back to focusing on myself again. Thank you for showing me how wrong I was. Andrew didn't wait for a response. He walked as quickly as possible to his room, the only private sanctuary he'd ever known. It wasn't too late. Maybe Rod was wrong. He could get his life back on track. He just needed to find the nearest reporting station. Chapter 65 Life events can cause stress on the marriage. It is the wife's duty to ease any burden on her husband. He bears the stress so that she can live a relaxing life. The Registry Guide for Girls He'll settle down. Carter kissed Mia's shoulder blade. She ignored him and followed Andrew. She caught up with him right outside his room. I didn't know you felt this way. Remember, I tried to... Stop talking. Please, just stop. That's not fair. Well, that's an important lesson to learn. Lots of things aren't fair. Don't you think I've learned that by now? Andrew, you need to let me in. You keep yourself so private, it drives me crazy. I am here to help you. I want to help you. I am so sorry for the way things played out tonight, but it doesn't change anything between us. Please just tell me what you wanted to say. The lights flipped on. Carter must have run for the switch. Andrew looked up at her. She felt his heart breaking and hers doing the same. She wanted to wrap her arms around him and comfort him. But before she had the chance, he headed toward the stairs and disappeared. Mia's chest felt heavy. It always amazed her how Andrew could say such emotional things with such a flat voice. She wished he would yell. It would be easier to scream back at him. Carter leaned against the wall with his arms crossed. If she couldn't be mad at Andrew, at least she could be mad at someone. This is all your fault, she walked toward him. If you didn't have to push, act so available, this would have never happened. Calm down. Carter stepped forward and rubbed her arms. I love you. Mia found that hard to believe. Boys were just professing their feelings everywhere tonight. She was already dealing with Andrew. She couldn't add Carter to that list. I doubt that. Mia held her hand to her forehead. This was becoming too much. I love you, Mia Morrissey. And so does that guy who just walked up the stairs. You have a choice to make. He's gone. Probably on his way to a service station. We'll never see him again. Mia felt like she was losing her breath. She needed to focus on one issue at a time. And I barely know you. 
You don't know me. I know enough, and he'll be back. But I want you to remember this moment. Carter placed his hands on her shoulders. I didn't run away. I stayed right here. Mia stared into Carter's eyes. They were warm, not as intense as Andrew's glare. She began to lose her anger, but the image of Andrew's face as he stood in the doorway was all she could see. The hurt was so obvious, and it was her fault. The sound of the front door made Mia snap out of her trance. Nobody loves anyone down here. Don't forget it, Mia said. She wasn't prepared for this conversation. We have to go after him. She started toward the stairs, but Carter reached out and grabbed her hand, swinging her back around to face him. Andrew is a smart guy, and the nearest station is Miles. Just let him blow off some steam. The situation needs to sink in for him. You don't understand. He's my family. Mia moved away from Carter and ran to the stairs. Wait, you're too flustered. It might be dangerous for you up there alone in this condition. Let me. Carter was already on the steps, reaching the top door. Wait down here. Mia wanted to argue, but she took the opportunity to calm down. She walked back downstairs and sat on one of the bar stools. Of course, now Carter thought it wasn't safe for her upstairs. She would be happy to never see this basement again. Resting her head in her hand, she thought about the night's events. Andrew cared about her, but she'd been too busy with Carter to notice. Carter saying he loved her made Mia shake her head in disbelief. He was carefree and happy, but Mia realized these traits didn't make him incapable of love. It had just never occurred to her that he was serious about their situation. The sound of footsteps upstairs made Mia queasy. She heard two distinct sets and was glad Carter had brought Andrew back but she wasn't ready to face him. It did make her feel better that he hadn't made it to a service center. She wasn't ready to make any choices. Instead, she would tell both boys she needed a cooling off period. More noise was coming from upstairs. It sounded like the two were fighting. Muffled voices were being raised. She was happy she couldn't make out what they were saying. She didn't expect them to change into best friends right now, but had never thought violence would ensue. Smoothing down her cotton dress, she went to break up the fight. Before she made it to the stairs, the door was flung open and Carter's body came rolling down. He slumped like a rag doll on the bottom step. Chapter 66 There is never any fighting in a marriage. It is the wife's responsibility to ensure this. As long as she is compliant and helpful, there will be no reason for any discord. The Registry Guide for Girls There wasn't any time to think or focus. Mia went right toward Carter. She couldn't believe Andrew would be so violent. She knew he had some issues, but there was no reason to hurt Carter, not this badly. She bent down next to him and placed her head on his chest. There was too much death. She couldn't handle any more. Relief and tears poured out as she heard his strong heartbeat. Carter was alive. He looked up, and she realized he wasn't even unconscious. Hide, he said, while he tried to catch his breath. He was already hoisting himself up on his elbows. Mia hugged him. She would wring Andrew's neck. She could hear him coming to the basement door and prepared to give him a speech this time. She started to stand, but Carter gripped her arm. Hide! He pushed her so hard he almost threw her. I'm not scared of him. He'll never hurt me. You don't need to worry. Mia appreciated Carter's concern, but it was unnecessary. Carter was about to speak again, but it was pointless. Mia knew now what he was getting at. Two men started to descend the stairs, each in the standard issue black rag suit. We have confirmation on the girl one stated into a microphone that was attached to his lapel. Affirmative. Mia backed up into the basement. There was no way out. She would have to grab a weapon and try to make it past the agents. Before she moved her feet, a loud blast sounded. 
one of the agents had put a bullet hole in the ceiling. Both of them had their guns drawn. One pointed toward Mia, the other firmly at Carter. They were on the bottom steps, about to enter the basement. Relax, calm down. We have you now. You're safe. The agent focusing on her spoke in a soothing voice. Kill the boy, he instructed his partner. No! Mia lunged forward, only to see both of the rag agents flung against the wall, landing right next to Carter on either side of him. Andrew fell along with them, landing on top of Carter. He jumped up, secured a loose gun, and held it to the back of an agent's head. He reached for the other agent's firearm and handed it to Carter signaling for him to do the same. Carter slowly stood, his hands shaking. The familiar look of fury crossed Andrew's face, like he was in another world, unsure of his actions. Mia gasped. She didn't want to see any more death, no matter how necessary it was. Andrew heard her noise and came out of his trance. He turned the gun around and slammed the handle into the man's head rendering him unconscious, but leaving him alive. Instead of waiting for Carter to do the same, Andrew reached over and knocked out the second agent. We have to get out of here, he called back up. Carter started up the stairs. Andrew reached out his hand to Mia, guiding her over the two rag agents, following fast behind Carter. The group reached the first floor. White light from the outside flooded the dark room. Carter ran to the front door. Mia dropped Andrew's hand and went to the kitchen. She kicked up the loose floorboard with precision and grabbed all the contents of the secret spot. She wasn't sure what was there, but knew it could help. Carter and Andrew both had their newly acquired guns out. Andrew was prepared to shoot whoever was responsible for the white lights, while Carter looked uneasy about holding the weapon. Mia thought she could do more damage with it. When the brightness faded, a familiar whistle could be heard from the outside. It was no rag agent. It was Rod. The teens ran out and almost knocked him down. They screamed at him, heading toward his pickup truck. Mia was surprised it didn't take him long to figure out what was going on. She jumped in the bed with Andrew while Carter got into the cab. Rod peeled out of the driveway and Mia got knocked next to Andrew as he turned. She didn't move away from him. Instead, she sat in silence, taking a moment to grasp the recent events. I'm sorry, Andrew said over the wind flying past the truck. His eyes were a glimmer of hope. She didn't need to focus on anything else. Their plans were ruined. Mia didn't know what was coming next, but she didn't want to die with any regrets. She placed her hand on Andrew's cheek and leaned over him. She paused a brief moment. His mouth looked warm and welcoming. Their lips met and sparks flew through Mia's body. She felt his hand on the back of her neck, pulling her closer, kissing her harder and deeper. She returned his passion and wrapped her leg around his, intertwining their bodies. It felt like pure happiness. She pulled back and smiled at him. He didn't waste any time acknowledging her gesture. He immediately pulled her back in. She let her free hand press against his chest as she fell deeper into him, her whole body on fire. Chapter 67 Nothing is ever given to you. You need to learn how to take what is yours and protect it. Take your freedom through service and protect your liberty through war. The Boy's Guide to Service Grant's temper flared as he brought the helicopter down. The rag agent's car was parked right in front of the house, plain for anyone to see, and the front door was open, moving from the force of the propeller. He did not understand why people had such a hard time listening to him. He'd had a feeling about Gila Bend. He never should have split his team up. If they were all here, he wouldn't have had to rely on novices. He barked at Agent Ross to wait outside, and drew his gun, a favorite six-shooter pistol with hollow-point bullets. Grant knew the pain it could inflict was excruciating. He strolled through the open door. He was sure there was nothing he needed protecting from, 
so he let his gun hang at his side. Light came from a doorway toward the back of the house. He made his way over and peeked inside. Two rag agents were at the bottom of the steps, one unconscious or dead, the other holding his head in pain. Grant danced his way toward them. Did you see where they went? He asked with fake concern for the agent. They knocked us out, three of them, two boys and a girl. The agent winced in pain. Well, you didn't answer my question, and you didn't follow my instructions. We thought we could, the agent tried to say. Grant wasn't interested. He pulled his gun and gave two quick taps, shooting the unconscious agent in the head and chest. Again, did you see where they went? The agent's eyes widened as he shook his head no and started to stand up. Such a waste of bullets, using this gun to kill. Grant shot the struggling agent in the leg. He screamed and clutched it in pain. Grant was certain he'd shattered the shin bone. But I'm on a deadline. With that, Grant fired into the man's skull, killing him. Grant sighed, thinking that the men had brought this on themselves. This was what Grant had wanted to avoid. He had no desire for another chase. The game was over. If the agents had followed instructions, they would still be alive and Grant could have focused his anger on his wife and her helpers. He straightened his cardigan and turned to walk up the stairs. Doing the math in his head, he figured she couldn't be more than five minutes ahead of him, easy to catch with the chopper. The noise of the propellers soothed him. It was the best luxury. Hey, boss, Agent Ross said from the helicopter. It pleased Grant that he understood his role. There are tire skid marks heading south. Grant continued strolling toward his machine. He climbed into the front seat and put his headset back on. Well then? We have a girl to catch. He smiled at the thought of shooting her in the knee with one of his bullets. Chapter 68 Marriage is, and always will be, a relationship severed only by death. The Registry Guide for Girls I'm happy you came back, Mia shouted over the wind. The truck was moving so fast she wasn't certain he'd heard. Her head was nestled on his chest. She angled her face to look up at his. He was smiling softly. Mia wanted to tell him she couldn't imagine life without him, regardless of their relationship to each other. She wasn't sure what was going on, but as long as they were together, everything would be okay. But instead, she just waited for him to kiss her again. Right as he moved his mouth, a giant spotlight hit them. The wind was making so much noise Mia hadn't even noticed the helicopter trailing them. The light was blinding. Mia tried to shield her eyes with her arm, but it didn't help her vision. She couldn't even make out Andrew. The truck picked up speed. She guessed Rod was going close to a hundred miles per hour. Just as quickly as the light had come upon them, it was gone. Mia blinked trying to adjust her eyes to the dark again, and then realized why the light was gone. They both sat up, assessing the situation. The helicopter was flying low, right next to the car. She noticed the outline of the chopper moving closer to their vehicle. She grabbed Andrew and pulled him down, each of them on their back, as the helicopter slammed into the side of the truck. The propellers circled right above their eyes. It was trying to knock them off the road. Rod continued to increase his speed, but the chopper matched it and readied for another ram. The back of the truck was starting to fishtail. Mia knew Rod couldn't control the vehicle much longer and tried to brace herself for the crash. She pinned her body to the bed of the truck, hoping to stay inside. The final push came and the truck went spinning through the air. Mia wasn't sure what was up or down as they spun. Her eyes shut and the rolling continued. The truck hit the ground with each rotation. She continued to brace herself, making her arms and legs as taut as possible. The roll slowed and Mia relaxed her limbs. She looked up. Andrew was gone. The truck stopped right side up and Mia had managed to stay in the bed. 
An eerie silence covered the area as dust and sand filled the air. She jumped out. Her whole body hurt, but she didn't think anything was broken. Making her way toward the cab, she saw Carter slumped over the dashboard. Rod was nowhere around. She tried to pull open the door but couldn't. The accident had pinned it shut. But it had also knocked out the window. She reached in and shook Carter, trying to rouse him. All of a sudden, an intense pain filled her ears. The accident had left her momentarily deaf, probably from the echo created in the bed as she was rolling. Now her hearing was returning, painfully. She pushed her hands against her ears. When she pulled them back, blood stained her palms. Maybe she was worse than she thought. She turned her attention back toward her friend, who was still unconscious. She pressed her hand over his heart and noticed the beats. He was alive. Before she could do more, someone grabbed her from behind. Holding her hair tight in a fist, the person moved his mouth close to her ear. Her captor spoke, but Mia wasn't sure what was being said. She was pushed forward through the dust cloud. As they moved, her pain subsided, and her hearing returned. You should have been more careful. After all, I don't want you to kill yourself. Where's the fun in that? She recognized the evil tone. It was Grant. They were following another rag agent with his gun drawn, searching for Andrew or Rod. Don't worry. The cleanup crew will be on their way. We'll get them if they're not dead already, Grant said to his comrade before turning his attention to Mia. Oh, I missed you, dear. There was no sense of good or decency in him. Mia decided to struggle. She tried to make a run for it, but his grip on her hair tightened. He removed the gun he was digging into her back and waved it in front of her face. Mia wasn't scared. She wished he would shoot her and end this whole debacle. They were making their way to the helicopter. The headlights shone through the debris. Mia continued to attempt to escape Grant's grasp, but he held on tight. If you don't stop, I will knock you unconscious and carry you. Neither of us wants that now, do we? She looked back at him and stopped pulling. For the first time, she noticed his clothes. Between her cotton dress and his casual look, they seemed more like guests at a garden party than people involved in a life-or-death struggle. Except for the blood, dirt, and ash that decorated them, of course. Mia kept her face straight ahead. She tried to scan the ground for Andrew or Rod, but the dust burned her eyes. She felt hopeless. There would be no rescue. Then she remembered her training with Carter. It was her turn to save herself. She began to struggle again. Fine, if that's the way you want it. Grant raised his gun like a club, but Mia threw her body backward, ramming her elbow into his gut. The gun still came down, but missed her head. Pain exploded in her shoulder. She moved forward, out of Grant's grasp. She started to run, but was met with an unexpected force. She went face first into the ground, her chin smacking the desert floor. Grant gripped her shoulder and hoisted her up. Her vision went fuzzy as a finger pressed into the exact spot where his weapon had made contact. That wasn't a very nice trick, Grant said as he tightened his grip. Mia didn't think she could handle the pain in her shoulder. She felt her vision going dark. Suddenly, the rag agent leading the way dropped to the ground. Grant let go of her and held up his gun, ready to fire at whoever had taken his friend out. A glimmer of hope rushed through Mia. She heard the sound of a gun cocking, but the dust made it impossible to see. Then Andrew appeared. Now Grant and Andrew both had their guns drawn, pointing at each other. Mia knew she should use this opportunity to make a run for it, but she couldn't leave Andrew. So now I shoot you and you shoot me, Grant said. Well, that won't accomplish anything. He moved his gun out to his left side, reached out and interlocked his arm with Mia's. He pointed the gun directly at her. Put your gun down or I'll kill her. Mia knew that if she moved, he would fire. She was shocked he'd kept her alive this long. 
She looked at her love, the heartbreak that flooded his face. He was always so strong, for everyone around him. She knew she needed to find that strength herself now. Mia decided it was best that she run. She knew how this would play out, and it would end with Andrew dead if she didn't do something. It was her turn to sacrifice. She turned to run, welcoming Grant's bullets. Before she picked her foot up off the ground, she was knocked down again. Her body ached, but not any more than it had during her earlier fall. She had assumed a gun wound would hurt more. She ran her hands down her body, searching for the bullet hole. There was no extra pain. She lifted her head and noticed a new figure rising up. The figure began to look familiar. It was Carter. Before Grant could fire, Carter had sailed through the air and tackled him to the ground, and Mia in the process. Now Carter was repeatedly kicking Grant in the stomach. Grant curled up in a ball while Carter continued his assault. Mia had never been so happy to see someone in such pain. Andrew bent down to help her up, and as she reached for his hand, the rag agent came into view, crawling on his belly only inches away from her. He was bleeding from a head wound, but far from dead. His weapon was drawn and pointed up at Andrew. Mia saw he was seconds away from shooting her paramour. She pulled Andrew to the ground and in a moment of fury, grabbed a rock and swung as hard as she could, driving the stone into the agent's face. She could feel his blood spray back, but didn't care. She continued her assault over and over, slamming the rock into his skull. As she raised her arm for another blow, she felt a hand grasp her wrist and force her to drop the rock. It was Andrew. He looked directly into her eyes and didn't let go of her hand. There was a look on his face that she'd never seen on him before. He looked grateful. He bit his lip and started nodding his head. She placed her hands on his shoulders, and the two rose to their feet. She had just killed a man, and she had not been met with judgment or horror. There was no remorse for her actions. She had killed someone for love, and her love knew it too, and loved her in return. He started walking, and she realized his leg was injured. She wrapped his arm around her shoulders and tried to force some of his weight onto her. The helicopter, Andrew said. The wind from the propeller was overwhelming, but the two hobbled over toward the vehicle. Mia boosted Andrew into the front seat. You said you wanted to join the Air Force, she said over the sound of the propellers. He nodded, looking around at the buttons. I need to go look for Carter. Andrew pointed his finger toward the accident. The headlights from the helicopter made the area slightly more visible. A person was wandering out of the dust. Mia held her breath. As the figure inched closer, it was easy to see he was dragging something. She knew it was Carter, hauling his father. She ran to help them. Where's Grant? She asked over the propellers as she grabbed Rod's legs. I took care of him. We have to go now, Carter said over the roar, nodding his head toward the flashing lights visible in the distance. He jumped into the back of the helicopter and pulled his father inside. Rod let out a groan as Carter tried to move him to the seat. Mia glanced over Rod's body. He was in bad shape. His left leg looked like it was twisted all the way around. There were no doors on the chopper to close. Mia hoped he'd stay secure. She jumped up in the front seat next to Andrew, who handed her a headset. I'm not sure how to get this to lift up or land, but I think I can handle it in the air, he said over their radio. Before Mia could respond, a bullet whizzed by her head. Grant was straight in front of them with his gun drawn. He was bloody and looked like even more of a madman than usual. Mia and Andrew both ducked toward the middle of the cockpit shielding themselves from his subsequent attacks. But after a few seconds, no more came. Mia looked up. An angry Grant was throwing his gun. He was out of bullets. This did not stop his assault. He limped toward the side of the helicopter with rage burning in his eyes. Where's your gun? Mia yelled and started searching the floor of the chopper. I left it on the ground, Andrew replied. Do something! 
Mia noticed the small joystick device and pulled it back. The machine began to rise, but only a few feet before it hovered and bobbed. She braced herself for Grant's attack, but he walked right past her and focused on the passenger in the back. Carter. Grant jumped up and grabbed a hold of his leg. Carter started to slip out of his seat. The chopper wobbled but continued to rise at a slow pace. Mia twisted her body. She wanted to keep Carter in, but he didn't need her help. It looked like Rod had renewed energy. He was completely alert and had his arms wrapped securely around his son. Carter continued to kick furiously, trying to knock Grant off of him. Higher! Mia looked toward Andrew, who had taken over control of the joystick. Carter managed to pull his leg loose and smash his foot down on Grant's head, knocking him down to the ground. We need to leave! Mia gripped Andrew's hand and tried to jerk the controls back farther, but the chopper was still just five feet off the ground. I'm trying. I think we have too much weight, Andrew said. Grant jumped up again. The machine went lower as he reached for Carter. This time Carter was ready, and he kicked him back down. Again, the chopper hovered, unable to climb any higher. I love you, a voice came over the radio. Rod had managed to put a headset on. I don't know if you can hear me, but these two will tell you what I've said later. Live a good life. Never come back here. Grant was trying to jump up again, but Carter seemed out of reach as he looked toward his father. Take care of yourself. You'll be fine without me. It was always me that needed you. Rod placed his hand on his son's shoulder. You're the best of me. I think your mom is proud of both of us. I miss her so much. I think it's time we were reunited. It was obvious Carter didn't know what Rod was saying or about to do. His face was a mask of confusion. Mia glanced toward Andrew, who continued to try to pull the chopper into the air. Grant made one final swipe at Carter's legs. Carter kicked him down with ease, but the sirens were approaching the helicopter. I wish I was half the man you are. With that, Rod popped off his headset and rolled backward out of the helicopter. As soon as his body left, the chopper went flying up at least 25 feet. Mia reached back and stuck her arm out, blocking Carter, who was about to dive after his father. He screamed, but no sound could be heard. She grabbed his face and turned his chin toward hers, shaking her head no. The group had already climbed a hundred feet in the air. Carter had no choice but to stay in his seat. Tears stained his cheeks and his nose turned red. Mia signaled to Rod's headset, and Carter put it on. We have to go back for him, Carter's voice shook. Turn around. Neither Andrew nor Mia spoke. Now, turn this thing around. No, he wanted you to make it out, Andrew said. I am honoring his final wishes. Final wishes? He's not dead. He's lying on the ground about to get arrested. The desperation in Carter's voice was unnerving. He would want me to go and save him. He did everything for you. He loves you. Mia put her hand on Carter's knee. If you go back for him, his sacrifice will have been for nothing. He hasn't sacrificed anything yet. He pushed Mia's hand away. His breathing was sporadic and his eyes glassed over. As soon as this thing lands, I'm going back. It was too soon. Carter couldn't face the facts of the situation. Rod was in bad shape. There was no way Grant wouldn't take out his rage on him. Mia knew better than anyone what it was like to have someone sacrifice himself and tried to comfort Carter as best she could. Okay. Mia put her hand back on his knee. He continued to nod his head and look outside. She knew by the time they landed, Rod's death would have sunk in. Carter looked back at her and placed his hand on top of hers. Tears streamed down his face. She nodded at him before turning back around. Mia took a moment to catch her breath. The sun's effects became visible in the distance. It wouldn't make an appearance for several hours, 
but the east was light enough to let them know they were flying south. Adrenaline filled Mia's body as the craft soared through the air. The trio sat in silence for some time. Mia's worry about a missile or another helicopter chasing after them soon disappeared. She closed her eyes and focused on breathing. Images of Rod, Whitney, Karina, Lisa, Alex, and Frank danced before her eyes. She wished all of them were there with her now, but she knew they would never cross paths again, at least not in this lifetime. Look down, Andrew said over the radio. Mia leaned to the side and looked. It was the Rio Grande. She recognized the landmark from one of Carter's books. She'd made it. They'd made it. Relief filled her body and she felt her mind go blank. Mia was out of tears. She didn't know what to say or how to behave. She was free. But it came at a high cost. Karina, Whitney, and Rod had lost their lives. She had no clue what had become of Frank and Alex. Glancing at the other two, Mia saw how tired and drawn Andrew looked, and how devastated and lost her happy Carter appeared. Both of them were covered in dirt, blood, and tears. Everyone had sacrificed a great deal for this crossing. She couldn't sit and cry or weigh her mind down with the past. She was a woman now, and a free one at that. She needed to look toward her future. It was her responsibility to make sure her friends hadn't died for nothing. The sheltered girl, who had been groomed to care about only vanity and a life as nothing more than a wife, was gone. She was aware that it was only going to get tougher from here, and she needed to match whatever was coming next with more strength. She looked at Andrew. At least she wouldn't face it alone. This is Kate Rinders. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of The Registry by Shannon Stoker. This program was produced by Dion Audio Services. The director was Bob Dion. Executive producer... Karen Jakonski. Text copyright 2013 by Shannon Stoker. Production copyright 2013 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. <laughs>